Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our live stream uh, celebrating the official launch of BuckeyeHuddle.com. I am Tony Gerdeman here with Tom Orr and Kevin Noon. Tom, how's it going? Tony, I think it's probably super auspicious. Before we started, we share all their stuff off, and then really the first sound you heard was someone an email notification. So this is probably going to go great. I think that's my big takeaway so far. And especially now that you are buffering. Kevin, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well, and it was my email that went off there, but, you know, the day never sleeps, so I have to keep my email open. You never know what could come through in terms of notifications or whatnot, but really excited here on this uh, launch day for Buckeye Huddle. We've had the message board up for a while, and now now we can get people through the turnstiles. Yeah, if you go there now, you, um, you'll, you'll see the front page is all set. If you try to get to the message board, it's probably going to be asking you, hey, why don't you become a member? Uh, so that is uh, all going on right now. And we thought, you know what, let's let's do a live stream. Let's talk to the, the Buckeye fans out there. Let's uh, just talk some Ohio State football for as long as we can and as, um, as well informed as we can. And I know for some of you that's going to be more difficult, Tom, Kevin, more difficult than, than it will be for me. But we're going to manage. We're going to see how it goes. We don't have a lot of – much written down for what the show is going to be, which means we have plenty of time to answer questions and interact. Uh, how do you feel about the, how do you guys feel about the insult I just handed down to you? Is that okay, Tom? You good with that? Uh, it felt very familiar, typical. Um, you know, I guess, I guess that's comforting in a way. Kevin, what's it like being insulted by me for the first time ever? I just, I generally don't listen to you under the best of circumstances. So why would I listen to you insulting me? So it may be the first time you've ever insulted me because it it's just not. Doesn't, it does. I know, I know. I <laughs> my spies tell me. Um, they don't. I tell you. I literally tell you when I insult you. Um, but that's why we get along so well. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you guys uh, already in here. Uh, Nick, Sue, everybody saying hi. Uh, let's go. Good morning. All of that good stuff. I uh, I want first. I want to start off with. Uh, Ohio State put their team photo out, the 2022 team photo out yesterday. I went back and I posted, I quote tweeted that with the 1920, 1922 team photo. That team scored 24 points in Big Ten play, went one and four for the season. And uh, the the resident odds maker of the Ohio State sphere is Tyler Shoemaker on Twitter. And he said something about, you know, this team will score 24 points or more in, in, in several quarters. So I'm like, okay, set the over under how many quarters this year will the Buckeyes score 24 or more points. And I, I don't know if you guys have the schedule in front of you last year, they only, they, they did it five times and mm -hmm. they did it in the, the second quarter against Akron first quarter against Rutgers second quarter against Indiana Second quarter, Purdue. Second quarter, Michigan State. They had a bunch of others of 21, but they only did it five times last year. You would expect them to do it more times this year. Tyler set the, the over-under at six and a half. So, Tom, I'll let you go first. I don't know if you have the schedule in front of you, but six and a half quarters of 24 or more points. Six and, a, six and a half seems high. I mean, five last year, I, I mean, without having gone back and looked at historical numbers, I'd be interested to know how many times they did it in 2019. I, one thing that I think is kind of instructive here is they only did it once against Michigan State last year. You think of the Michigan State game as being one of the biggest point avalanches in Ohio State history, and they only did it once there. So you figure they probably get it once against Arkansas State, maybe once against Toledo, probably Rutgers. I mean, like five or six feels like a pretty good number here. I mean, how many How many times... I'm guessing this is information you don't have, but this is information that I would like to have before I make this kind of uh, make a an official prediction here. How many times have they done it in multiple quarters in one game in the last ten years? Say, because it feels like the answer is probably not super high outside of like the Florida A and M game or the Bowling Green game or something. You know, games where they're putting seventy points up. I don't. You know, when they're when they put up sixty three, how often are they putting up twenty four points in multiple quarters? Well, interestingly, the Maryland game where they scored 66, they didn't do it once. 
Really? So like 21, huh. 21, you know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm probably leaning to the under. But what happens if they score in the second half, if they need to do it in the second half one year, one year which the, they didn't do it last year? I mean, that, that's kind of like a, a free space if they do it. Kevin, what are you thinking? I'm thinking the under because 24 is just a lot of points to be able to score. And if the defense is better – does Ohio State? I mean, Ohio State doesn't have to sit there and keep the foot on the accelerator in the second halves of some games where it was having to kind of keep pushing to just try and make sure that there was a good enough margin between the two teams. So, I think we're we're looking at less quarters for things to happen. Um, you know, obviously Arkansas State just seems to be a game that that could happen. You know, potentially against Toledo that could happen, but. You know, everybody's going to say Rutgers and Maryland potentially, but you know, right there. We, you know, we're only sitting at four, and you know, I think that there could be another breakthrough game. I mean, there could be two more breakthrough games where they do that, and we're still sitting at six, so six and a half. You know, you're saying that in more than half of your regular season games, you're going to have a 24 point quarter. That just that just seems to be a lot to me, and that's not me saying anything about this offense being any less explosive, but I think if the defense is even 25 percent better, there's just, I mean. Yeah, the goal is to go out there and to score points. It's not to get out there and be like, yeah, we're good. But then again, the departing quarterback and C.J. Stroud after this season, some other pieces, they're going to need to get some reps for some younger guys. I just think that we we will see more vanilla offense in second halves than we did before, and that just kind of limits the opportunities. Yeah, even in a shootout like Utah in the Rose Bowl, they still didn't do 24 points. It's It's a lot to ask a team to score four times in a single quarter, and oftentimes you need help doing that. I, I know Tyler was looking at like um, one and a half for Arkansas State, one and a half for Toledo, and you're, you're adding it up that way. I'm, you know, if they can do it two times against somebody, that might, that kind of changes mm-hmm. things. But I'm with you. I'm probably going with you guys. I'm going to go the under on that as well. The, um, looking at the first question that we have here from Jay Moore, what are you looking for early in the Notre Notre Dame game to tell you about the D Tom? I think honestly, the biggest thing I'm going to be interested in is not something I can necessarily see early in that game. It's okay. Notre Dame comes out and they do whatever they're doing in their off. You know, they've got their scripted yada, yada, yada for the first drive. And then Jim Knowles has to figure that out. And then, you know, the second drive, they, you know, the second drive, third drive, whatever, once Jim Knowles has figured out what Notre Dame is doing and Notre Dame does, you know, goes to, okay, and now we're doing this. How long does it take for Jim Knowles to adjust to that? That like, I, th- I feel like the second quarter of that game is almost more interesting to me than anything I'm going to see in the first quarter. You know, if they shut Notre Dame down in the first quarter and then Notre Dame does something different and then starts putting up all sorts of points and Ohio State can't stop them. Well, that, you know, the first quarter is great, but it doesn't, you know, that, that means that maybe they haven't solved some of the issues that they've had last year that, uh, you know, that, that I, I think people are assuming they have solved at this point. So to me, look at the second quarter, look at the first drive of the third quarter, first, second drive of the third quarter. That's maybe what's going to be most interesting to me from the Ohio State defense perspective. Tyler Buckner, the Notre Dame starting quarterback, was their second leading rusher last year as a backup quarterback. So he's a guy that poses issues for a defense and He's one of these guys where Ohio State can stop the run or stop whatever for, you know, first and second down, and it's like third and 12, and he picks up a scramble. And one of these just really frustrating things that they have to deal with. But, Kevin, what are you looking for um, from the defense early on to tell you whether or not Ryan Day has made another mistake or he has finally figured out that they need defense? Well, I think one of the biggest things we noticed last year was that the defensive line was always about a half a second late getting to the quarterback. I want to see more pressure. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a case of where there needs to be seven sacks in the game to be like, all right, all right, we're good. Everything's right. But I think there needs to be more havoc. There needs to be more times to where the pocket collapses. I mean, sure, you know, Tyler Buckner is going to be somebody who's going to be able to get out there and scramble, whether or not it's going to be on on a design QB run or if it's going to be him running for his life. I think you have to sit there and realize he's going to kind of get his a couple of times in terms of some runs, but I'm going to feel a lot better if it's because 9 or 44 or 54 or 33 are out there on his tail 
and he has to sit there and tuck and run at that point and then gets cleaned up by you know the back seven at that point but i that's the big thing for me is i want to see more pressure and again pressure you know works in certain circumstances i mean you can't you know you can't throw the baby out for the bath or throw the throw the bath water out and the baby however the saying goes it's still too early in the morning for me i haven't had coffee don't yet. throw um, the baby in the bath water right exactly <laughs> just don't throw the baby or shake a baby neither of those are good um but you know the, the the point is is that when in that notre dame game let me let me see that pressure let me see that more aggressive defense. And then I think just as kind of a throwaway comment to nobody wants to be able to predict what we're going to see each defensive play from the stands or from the press box, mix it up, vary it up. I think that's important too. Yeah. Don't, don't know what's going to be coming. I think that's a good point, Tom. Uh, I was just going through some historical box scores to try and get an answer to our earlier question on the number of, you know, I was just kind of going through games where it was like, boy, Ohio State sure scored a lot of points in this game. You mentioned they scored 66 points without having multiple quarters of 24 points against Maryland last year. Uh, the 2016 Maryland game, 62 points, one quarter with 24. The 2016 uh, Nebraska game, 62 points, one quarter with 24. The 2016 Rutgers game, 58 points, one quarter with 24. The 2013 Penn State game, 63 points, one quarter with 28. So they you know, only once did they over 24. The Florida A&M game, 2013, they scored 76 points. They only had one quarter with 24. They uh, And then th this one shocked me, the 2016 Bowling Green game. Score by quarters, 21, 14, 21, 21. They scored 77 points and didn't score 24 and a quarter. I, I think I think if you look, boy, historically, just, I mean, just look going off of this, uh, it sounds like five games with, uh, or five quarters with 24 or more points last year might have been a real historical anomaly. Yeah, because you're not going to get any in the second half because you shut down the offense and once you do it in the first quarter, like it's just really hard to score eight times and a half, in, which is what you would need, unless you're going to go for two every time, which fantastic idea, but you've got to land it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting and, and much harder, much more difficult than, than I make it look on like, you know, NCAA football where it's you know, 28 points a quarter is a given, like you just got to go, you got to be relentless. You got to know what you're doing. Um, so I, we, we have about, I don't know, maybe 12 more hours of Notre Dame preview talk, like amongst us, 16 hours in the next couple of weeks. So we don't need to harp too much on Notre Dame. Uh, let's talk about th this question from Fred Jackson here. Uh, glad to see you guys back. Tom, will you guys travel with the team in and, in and out of town games? Because I love to see where you guys are going to eat. Uh, Tom, is that, uh, are we traveling? Yes, we are traveling. We have our home credential approval already. I know we already got our Maryland credential approval. And Tony, we got the Maryland credential approval, and I immediately texted you guys. Do you remember what I texted you? Yes, I can, the giant I, I, pretzel. I, I can almost taste the crab pretzel already. They have a giant crab pretzel that's like $28 or something ridiculous at the Maryland Stadium. But, uh, you know, we're only in Maryland every... Well, every four years at this point, but uh, hopefully every two years or so moving forward. And uh, yeah, that, don't don't worry. We are back back on the road and uh, planning to. Good news, we will probably eat occasionally while we're on the road. And uh, when we can eat, we can turn it into content. So we have, I don't think we have a name for the new uh, dining segment yet, but I'm sure we will have one. So that's uh, all very exciting news, I'm sure. Are you really looking forward to going to Maryland every other year? I mean, it's better than the 2020 thing where we were all set to go to Maryland and then uh, Maryland was like, mm, actually, we can't play football because of gestures vaguely towards 2020. Uh, congratulations, Kevin, on breaking the Guinness World Record for most emails received in an hour. That's that's a big news. I, I thought I thought the site launch. I it's, thought the site launch was going to be the biggest news of the day, but Kevin, that's that's huge. Well, Buddy, congratulations. and I've gotten two, two, two Twitter DMs as well. I mean, it's just it's it's. A country bear jamboree around here. <laughs> that explains all the farmers only emails. Um, Kevin, you've already put put you're stuck, you're putting a list together of where we're going to go on these these road trips, correct? I don't have Maryland put together yet. Um, I have mm. our place for Michigan State that I would like to go, but you know, I, I, this is not you know a, a newnocracy. I'm going to sit there and throw it out to the group. Uh, Penn State will probably have to just eat it like a sheets or something like that because that's just 
there's not a whole lot around State College. And, you know, I think we have to, I think game times are really going to dictate a lot of things too in terms of what our travel looks like. And then, you know, up in, uh, up for Evanston for, for Northwestern, you know, the big place to go is Mustard's Last Stand. I just read that in the last day or so that the, the owner, founder of that just recently passed away. That's very sad. Um, getting into that place on game day, you know, even though there might only be 14 people and a small dog in the stadium for most Northwestern games, Ohio State fans descend upon Evanston like rabid wolves. So, you know, it's hard to get into that place, but I'll make sure we're good. I'll make sure that there are uh, batteries charged in the GoPro and that we're ready for to be determined slash eats, whatever we, whatever we decide to call the show. You know, I think we should go back to Pequod's like we did the last time we were in Northwestern Mm -hmm. and shoot there because it's Kevin, like Kevin just swears by it's his favorite pizza place in Chicago. And then Tom and I can just tear it apart because it's, it's fine. It's okay. It's a little, it's a little burnt, which is like, it's not a bug. It's a feature of their pizza. And I'm like, I don't now if they wanted to be a sponsor, love the pizza, lovely people love the pizza. The, the place is not cramped at all. Like you've got plenty of elbow room. As long as you only have one elbow, there is plenty of room for you there. You sit yeah. there, you tell them I'm going to be there in three hours and it's fine you walk right in at that point it, yes it is a little bit small the original one right there like on the depaul campus uh, but it's 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 legit i love it i mean i know that people with chicago pizza first of all there are the people that call it casserole i mean i call those people jerks and then uh you know, and then there's the debate on what the best Chicago pizza is. There are the people who say Giordano's is. Those people are called tourists. And then, you know, you kind of dovetail from there. I recently got a follow on Twitter from Lou Malnati, so I ha- I can't say anything bad about Lou Malnati's now. We were just in Chicago, not the three of us, my family and I. Uh, we're just in Chicago a couple weeks ago and, uh, you know, finished a long day at uh, at the ice rink, which is the only thing that we do on family vacations at this point. And uh, it was like, what are we going to do? And Lou Malnati's came up as a pizza place that was somewhat close and everyone was all excited to try Chicago style pizza because my kids hadn't been in Chicago before. So we got Lou Malnati's. It was it was good. It was fine. I have I New York style is my preferred style. It remains my preferred style. But my kids both really liked to uh, relate to Lou Malnati. So, yeah, we could do that. The other place that uh, I went while we were there was a uh, sandwich place, a steak place called Rico Benny's on the south side, like just north of uh, Comiskey or whatever they're calling Comiskey now, that uh, a writer from USA Today said had the best steak, best sandwich in America, the breaded steak sandwich at Rico Benny's. Uh, he is a Mets person, so I've, I've known him for a number of years, podcaster and all that kind of stuff, and he was a he is a uh, somewhat of a sandwich, um, I don't know, sandwich expert, sandwich uh, aficionado, and uh, we went and we did that as well. That was it was pretty good. I don't know if it was the best sandwich I've ever had, but it was a, it was a pretty good sandwich. I thought mm, maybe we'll do maybe we'll do that when we're in Chicago as well. So uh, I think we need to turn the Northwestern trip into like a four day trip in order to fit in all these meals. I think that's what I'm hearing. Tom, the best sandwich you ever had was that Are You Hungry last year on the Rutgers campus. That was one of the sandwiches I've had, yes. It was not. It was not. Um, I, I'm looking forward to uh, to all of the road trips. Let me uh, address here. Oh, what do you got here, Kevin? Um, Yakov22, how about this deal? If Ohio State wins the title, you three commit to walking around your central Ohio mall of choice in crop top jerseys and 1980s Maurice Cheeks shorts. I mean, we're already doing that, so I mean, I guess all this would mean is, uh, you know, we're, we're, right. you know, th- then we we got to cover a national championship game. I mean, that seems like a presence. We're already we're our mall training off season, so yeah, just show up at Polaris on Tuesdays. I mean, you're there. We're there. Um, Gary K talking about Evan Pryor. Any word on the type of injury Evan Pryor suffered? Tor- is it a torn ACL? I think the, the season-ending knee injury pretty much tells you like it's it's an ACL. I don't know if that was confirmed or not but we discussed this on buckeye weekly yesterday about what ohio state will now do without evan Pryor because this is a guy they had plans for and they were going to use him in in different ways and and make him part of the offense so now that part of the offense is gone somebody else has to i guess maybe step in for what they're going to do with him but travion henderson can catch the ball travion henderson can do things like i think what they wanted him to be, they can they can handle with the other guys they have. I saw I even saw somebody mention maybe it was on uh, yeah, it was on the 
the Buckeye Huddle message board saying, you know, maybe, maybe in the passing realm of what they wanted to do with Evan Pryor, you could even involve Caleb Brown, the true freshman wide receiver who has a history of uh, running back and receiver in high school. So maybe there's something there, but Kevin, you didn't have a chance to share your thoughts with, uh, with us. You were behind the camera yesterday. What do you think the, the Buckeyes do now without Evan Pryor? They have three scholarship running backs. Is that enough? What do you think is going on behind the scenes? Do they need to move somebody to, to be that fourth guy? Um, I don't know if you need to move somebody. I mean, I, you know, we, heard the stats i mean i think maybe tony generated the stat or whatever about how many carries anybody outside of the top three gets in any given year um you know we certainly have seen years where ohio state has had to go down the depth chart at certain positions but um you know i'm not moving chip Trainum from linebacker i'm certainly not moving steel chambers i heard that name thrown out i think that was kind of tongue-in-cheek um you know i'm not doing that you know, they, they have some options. I mean, Xavier Johnson can move back from receiver to running back. Um, you know, out of their talented receiver class, they you know, they have guys that played running back. But, again, you know, it's just a case of you're probably not getting on the field as receiver. And if you're the number four running back, you're probably not getting on the field as running back. But, you know, we can sit there and go through and kind of work with you on the blocking schemes that are going to be a little bit different as a back versus a receiver. Um you know, I, I think that you need to make sure that you have uh, Maverick and Merlin in the uh, ready five just in case, uh, you know, somebody gets shot down over an un, un, uncharted, unnamed uh, body of water or whatever, and Iceman's in trouble. But uh, I don't think you need to sit there and, and sound claxons just yet. Um, but, it, you know, it is concerning when you sit there and you look at their, how thin they are now at running back, how thin they are under the best of circumstances at corner. Uh, you know, it's it's it shows how difficult it is kind of to maintain the 85 and just kind of everything that goes on there. It tells you that Demario McCall was born one year too early because <laughs> he could solve all of their problems at running back and cornerback this year. Yeah, he would. I mean, and, and uh, you know, I think would bring some additional personality to the team. I was going through photos when we were kind of putting stuff together and getting new photos watermarked for the site and all that kind of stuff. And I was going through my Rose Bowl photos and I forgot how many fun Demario McCall photos I had from just like one or two practices. Just here's Demario McCall just looking at the camera and flexing. Here's Demario McCall walking to practice holding up a bag of animal crackers. Here's Demario McCall like pointing at the camera. Here's like it's just so much personality. I'm going to miss Demario this year. You know, I don't know. I don't know how much of an impact he'll have on you know the loss of Demario will have on the field, but I will. Uh, I will definitely miss the uh, personality off the field, and uh, that's uh, yeah. You're right. You're right. I mean, he's he certainly would be you know in in the mix for uh, you know certainly part of those conversations uh, in terms of depth that uh, was one of those spots. And the number that Kevin was alluding to that I was talking we talked about yesterday, twenty seven point eight carries per season is what. The uh, what goes to the the fourth, fifth, sixth running back under Ryan Day. So the top three guys have the bulk of them, and then everybody behind them averages about twenty seven point eight total carries from the the running backs at four, five, and six, and, and what have you. Last year it was forty one with Evan Pryor and um, Marcus Crowley. I think some of that is also transfer portal related, where you're trying to keep guys happy, so you got you got to give them something. Not that you need to. Like one guy could have handled that or, or you get some other people in there. But I, I saw it was a Gary K saying that, uh, th that you just had up there, Kevin, about this is going to give Ryan day the uh, allow him to throw the ball more because you know, he likes to throw the ball. So this will force him to, or allow him to throw the ball more, which Gary's not maybe a huge fan of. But if you're talking about Evan Pryor as a guy that they were looking to throw the ball to, to me, I could spin this like, well, now they're going to have to run the ball more. With uh, and, and again, we're talking maybe I don't know 20 plays total in terms of what was going to be a, a pass to Evan Pryor or something like that. So I think they end up actually running the ball more, and, and it's just going to be a tiny fraction of, of an adjustment one way or the other because you know they, they try to be balanced and they consider all of these RPOs as as part of the running game because it, it, can, it can be a run, it can be a pass. It just really depends on what the defense is going to do that determines how much they're throwing, how much they're they're running. But I think this can be spun as, well, now, now you got to give 
Mayan Williams the ball more. And I don't think that's a bad thing for this offense. Um, I saw Sue asked in the uh, comments whether Demario McCall was with an NFL team. He had gotten a tryout invitation with the Bears and then didn't uh, didn't end up getting signed out of that. Uh, my quick Googling has shown that he is uh, currently with the Ohio Force uh, of the uh, National... Hang on. Uh, sorry, Major League Football. So um, that's not quite the NFL. I don't know if that's a semi-pro league or, or what, but uh, that is he's with the Ohio Force of Major League Football. So... Plan your uh, plan your fall uh, Saturdays or Sundays or whatever days uh, accordingly. Definitely, um, there's there's a lot of planning to go on. There's a lot of football to be watching, and sometimes like it's all out there. You just got to find it. And sometimes that's a stream. Sometimes that's a, a a rogue website. Sometimes it's just somebody's you know what Facebook or something like that. But if if you're looking for football, like you see the the college football Reddit like during the off season, they're showing college football from like Norway. And it's like, well, here's the Japanese the championships, and it's it's pretty crazy. And we know Demario has a history of streaming things live, so you know maybe you can find it on his social media. Absolutely, it's just me, Tim seventy nine, saying maybe expecting more three and outs and turnovers by the defense. I, I think that's one of the things that they are hoping to get from this. It's a more aggressive defense, and trying if you're trying to if you're confusing. They're trying to confuse the quarterback. If you end up confusing the quarterback, that should lead to some more interceptions. I was looking at sack numbers because that's one of the ways a simpleton's – I'll speak for myself. This is one of the ways me, simpleton, judges a pass rush and and a defense. And so last year, and just speaking of of defensive ends, at Oklahoma State last year, the Oklahoma State defensive ends had 26 and a half sacks. And that's that's, – I'm – going to assume that's more than the Ohio State defensive ends. The, the 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 year before that they had 12. And the year before that they had five and a half. And that was that, that was Jim Knowles' second year at Oklahoma State. The first year he was there they had 22. That was up from 12 the year before when he wasn't there. So I'm wondering I guess I could look up real quick to see how many sacks the Ohio State defensive ends had last year. But all of these different areas where they should improve I, I you know, I, if you improve in all of them, you're kind of taking away from some stats. Like if, if you have more more sacks than than maybe the the I, there's just there's only so many stats to go around to improve on everything. I think is what I'm trying to say. And so third downs, uh, three and outs. I was looking for a measurement of that, and you know I can't find any like three and out stats. Time. I don't know if you have any in your advanced stats, but turnovers. I if you're going three and out. You're forcing fewer turnovers. That's one of those things where there's a give and take um, because there's fewer possessions. But, uh, Kevin, I am expecting a a marked difference defensively. But also I think they're going to give up some some big plays because it's an aggressive defense. So that's kind of what happens when you have the two. Yeah, I mean, it's – I think that you know you you could have some bend don't break situation where you you might have a couple big plays get popped on you or whatever and still have a good scoring defense, and you know I, I think there's a good situation of where, yeah you, you're going to get beat on a play because you're not going to be you're you're going to play the ball you're not going to let the ball play you kind of to use a little bit of a of a of a baseball saying right there I mean you're going to be aggressive and you're going to try and. And, and get to it or whatever and, and and the other the other team has you know helmets and jerseys and scholarships and athletes and everything too so you know undoubtedly especially against you know your your b you know b b plus a minus type of teams they're going to you know they're going to get some things there but so i think that the first time that somebody breaks a big play you know if if michael mayer for notre dame gets you know finds a seam and, and has a big play i you know I, here we go again. Oh my God! You know, head coach of the defense, head coach. Of, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta make a change. I mean, you know, I think you know you, you need to look and see how things play out. And I truly believe that they're definitely on the right path. You know, watching the practice that we got to see, saw a lot of Cade Stover getting open down the field, making plays, and that does not bode well for the matchup against uh, the Notre Dame tight end. I was uh, doing. The Ohio State preview on the um, the Ohio State 
chan or the Big Ten channel on on Sirius, and it was with Ben Hartsock, a former Ohio State tight end. And I was telling him like, man, you, you should see it. They're throwing to the tight ends in practice all the time. You'd love it. They're throwing deep. He's like, yeah, that's what they do in practice. They never do it during a game. <laughs> but that's yes, we, we, yes, always in practice, never in a game. But when you see a defense that has trouble covering the tight end, and now your first game out is against arguably the top tight end in the nation, I think it's a concern. Normally I'm like, well, if, if the only – if the biggest threat is the tight end, how many threats really are there? But if the defense's biggest weakness is covering the tight end, now it's it's a strength versus weakness thing, and it, it kind of doubles up the, the trouble there, Tom. It does, and before we go into this, I'll just uh, Ohio State's defensive events had 14 sacks last year, yes. so that's uh, that's that's where they ended up. So you said 22 and a half for Oklahoma State, so uh, you know that would be a significant 26 and a half. 26, oh, 26 and, and a half. half. Sorry, yes, so uh, almost double. That's uh, that's pretty impressive. I, I, I think I'm I, I'm with your typical thinking on this more than your concern on this, where if Michael Mayer is the leading receiver for Notre Dame. I don't think that's a big problem. I mean, you're you're not going to have a tight end is not going to put up Jackson Smith and Jigman numbers. You're not you're not going to have 15 catches for 300 yards. You're not going to have 15 catches for 200 yards. Tight ends typically are going to be a lot of you know move the chains, all that kind of stuff. But with the Ohio State offense being what it is, if Notre Dame's leading receiver is a tight end, I don't think Notre Dame is going to have a very good time of, uh, you know, you, you're going to have to be able to, if they can't, you know, they've got to run the ball. They've got to have, you know, hit some big plays in the passing game. If, if a tight end is your leading receiver, it's like, that's great. He might put up a really impressive individual statistical game, but that's also a really good way to score exactly 17 to 21 points. And I don't think 17 to 21 points is going to score, you know, is going to do it against this Ohio State team a whole lot this year. So, you know, the closer we get to that Notre Dame game, the more I kind of think, like, I think there might be an overall talent issue that Notre Dame has that, you know, the, you you have seen Notre Dame against Ohio State caliber teams in recent in the recent past, and it has all looked exactly the same. They play Alabama in the, uh, the Rose Bowl in the Cotton Bowl a couple of years ago, and, you know, it was one of those games that was just like, you know, they started the game, and it was like, oh, Notre Dame has no chance because they don't have the athletes to stay up with Ohio State, or with Alabama. You've seen Notre Dame get, who else has Notre Dame lost to in the playoff? Did they lose to, uh, they, they lost they lost another playoff game at one point. Then they, they got crushed by Alabama in the national championship game 10 years ago. It's just like, all of those games, there is a reason that Notre Dame, constantly, you know, has, has not won a major bowl game in close to 30 years now. And it's just, they don't have the skill talent. They've got line play. That's great. They just, they can't keep up with like the really top level teams. We even saw them, you know, you saw them against, you know, the Jim Knowles defense with far less talent last year at Oklahoma state. And they lost that game too. And so now, you know, new starting quarterback, all that kind of stuff. I just, uh, I, I think you know, there, there are a couple really, really good helmet games the first couple weeks where it's Ohio State, Notre Dame, and it's Alabama, Texas. And it's like, I think everyone's all excited about this stuff. And like, I think you might have a couple three touchdown kind of games uh, in both of those. Clemson in 2018, 31 to three. That's it. Playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and losing Avery Davis, their third leading receiver from last year, doesn't help. And so that's uh, going to be another issue that they will have to deal with um, Nick Stamen, Keon Keeley, a five-star defensive end, currently committed to Notre Dame as he headed to OSU or Alabama. We believe that Alex Gleitman will be stopping by later this afternoon at some point um, to discuss this. I know, I, I believe he said that he thinks it's down to OSU and Alabama right now and is expecting a, a, a flip of some sort. Uh, he's uh, scheduled to be at the Notre Dame uh, game Notre Dame Ohio State game on an official visit, so that will um, you know we'll we'll see how that goes. Chances that he flips, I mean, at this point it seems like it's a given he's going to flip somewhere, uh, based on what what Alex is is hearing. Um, don't want to speak for him. Maybe the, the news has changed, and he'll let us know later on today on where things stand there. Uh, the comment here from Chris, don't really want to get into rumors, but did the Cam Bab rumor turn out to be bogus or are we waiting on word from uh, anybody? I'm waiting on word from Ohio State basically on that. They're not confirming anything right now. So 
I know people are going to be asking about it. We don't really want to get into that at this point, but Ohio State has said nothing on that. Uh, Patty McGilla, very uh, good to see you all back in stable ground. Excited to have you all together and talk all things Buckeyes. Yes, stable ground, BuckeyeHuddle.com. You go there now. The site is live. It is going. Um, I, speaking for myself, am very happy to be back doing this and having a site and having just being able to. It's it's so so dumb to people listening. Like, but just to be able to put stuff in there, like to write and put it in there and then see the product come out. Um, you know, and Kevin, you've been going like crazy putting stuff uh, in the in the system. And uh, what's it like? For you kevin to have the site launched now yeah i mean it's really exciting i mean i'm here with you know all of my friends and tom and you know it's uh sorry i, just, I would have taken the shot at tony but he said that it was only the first time he'd ever made fun of me so um you know it, it, it it's great to be you know to be you know here with you know people that i've that i've either worked with for a long time in terms of mark Givler, you know, a short time, but known for a long time with Tom and Tony. And, you know, I've had the chance to work with Ross and Alex and everything else. And it's just, I mean, it's just, it's great. I mean, and, you know, while having the message board is, is fantastic. And, you know, we had that up for a little bit in terms of like a soft launch, you know, as we're launching today and getting the, all this, all the switches flipped on and all the, all the, all, all the gears turning in the machine. I mean, it's, 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 it's really exciting. And, you know, the best thing for everybody, we got 157 on the line right now. I know, I know everybody out there knows a couple more Buckeye fans, you know, tell them to get on board. I mean, it, it, that's going to be the best thing right there. I mean, we're going to have the best information. We're going to have the best community. Uh, you know, we're going to obviously have the best podcasts. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting. Tom. And the most humble hosts, absolutely. Uh, the uh, I mean, we were just talking about some uh, defensive line recruiting. Alex Gleitman, uh, now that the site is live, Alex Gleitman has the new uh, weekly edition of his ADEC column up, including uh, some really good information on a couple of defensive line recruits who are announcing this month. One he thinks is more likely to end up at Ohio State than the other, so you can find that on the uh, board at uh, on the huddle board at uh, BuckeyeHuddle.com, but you got to be a member, so... Uh, I will say what I said on the uh, on the morning show today. You know, if you go back and listen to the last eight months or so of morning shows, I'm not telling you, hey, you got to subscribe to this site. Hey, you got to subscribe to the site. It's an incredible site. You got to get. I, I'm not going to tell you to do something that I don't believe in. So uh, now I'm going to tell you, you got to subscribe to the site. We got a really great team. We've got a lot of uh, a lot of great people. We've got you know Mark and Alex doing recruiting. We've got Tony, Kevin, and I doing team coverage. We've got three got three guys doing X's and O's. You know Ross Fulton, but we got Ross, uh, Justin Whitlatch as well. We got Devin as well. I mean, we, this is we we are going to have pretty much every angle of this covered uh, in a way that I don't think I've really seen before. So, and it's uh, you know this is also a pretty big team as well. So, going to have a lot of coverage, a lot of uh, you know you, you guys. I think a lot of people have seen the podcast, but don't necessarily you know haven't necessarily been members of the site before. Uh, it is uh, it is definitely worth giving it giving it a shot. Uh, we uh, I, I always say it is the price of a lousy chain store pizza, not Pequod's, like much cheaper, We're much worse pizza than that. And uh, you know, so skip the skip the crappy pizza and uh, join a cool Ohio State community. Uh, try it for a month. That first month will include the Notre Dame game, and uh, I think the next next one or two after that, and uh, the lead up to the season. So there should be a lot of stuff to be excited about, a lot of good content. So uh, yes, BuckeyeHuddle.com, and also. While you're here, hit the thumbs up button on this video, and uh, all your comments as well will help us uh, continue to reach a new uh, and growing audience. And if you are not subscribed to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, I'm out of words. Good. That'll do it for the show. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, a comment here from Battlestar on the message board. Now that you're all wildly popular and successful media stars, will one of you still be forced to sleep on the cot of shame on road trips? Yes. Yes. Um, based on our picks in the Bold Predictions podcast every Wednesday, the loser of the previous week will have to sleep on the couch, which is you, the, the problem with this. And I'm sure everybody has stayed in a hotel. You just never know what you're going to run into. Like you can you see some pictures, but you never really know until you get there on how bad the situation is going to be like in these couches. 
they have arms. These arms aren't half arms, half pillows. You know, like these are just pieces of wood with some carpet, you know, stapled onto them. It's, it makes, it really makes me want to fight for the, the, the bold predictions more, but I just, it's just so exhausting dealing with Tom, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but, you know, we have to try to do it, and it's it's a, it's a burden. But um, it's it's, a, it's I hate it. But at this point, I'm locked in. I can't do anything about it. Tom Tom needs this. He wants this. It's the only way for him to feel good about himself. Uh, he can't, he can't uh, derive joy from his family, his work. It's just this one little thing, and it's it's, it's pitiful. But whatever it takes to to give him some joy in his life. Um, looking through these, uh, a bunch of uh, welcomes, and, and thank you all for that. Thank um, you for that, Sue. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> no, come Sue on, says, Sue. be better at be better at bold predictions, Tony. Which is, I mean, it's good advice. She's a doctor. I would, I would listen. Kevin, strike that from the record. For being a doctor, she should say that I shouldn't have to do the cotta chain <laughs> since I had back surgery in two thousand one. And you guys <laughs> don't, why... get, you guys don't let me get into the bold prediction piece because hey. I am. See, here's the thing: if, if we open it up to three people, that increases the odds of not being on the couch. I'll just. It takes yeah, I was going to say I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll just put it right so, on the board. Be careful what you ask for. You might just get it, and then um, which would be terribly fun, and we would all be uh, appreciative of that. Um, looking through some of these, uh, Jim Graham. If they give up 30 points to Toledo, it's going to be a long season. Not necessarily. It could be 62 to nothing at the half, and then Toledo scores, you know, 30 points in the second half. And then you you could be worried about the future of the Ohio State defense because it's all of the young guys giving up the points. No, Kevin does not get a pass, Sue. Yes. All right. Well, I, yes. I, I I just saw – put that last one up, Kevin. What was that? I also, when I booked the hotels for the season, I made sure – I mean, like two of them – we're actually going to have uh, the sleeper sofa and two beds, like one or two of them. I think we're going to have to roll the name cot in there. I mean, uh, but everything I've looked, so we're there. But the problem is there's just not a residence in in every college town. That's that's terrible. Uh, Gary Kay, I think the loser should also give up something else as well. Like if Tony loses, then he needs to give up ketchup for the trip. No. <laughs> Next question. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, if, if we go, if we go to a wing place, you expect me to eat my chicken tenders with what honey mustard? Are you crazy? It's not going to happen. They expect me to eat my boneless wings with blue cheese? No. Uh, barbecue? No. Of course not. Um, gosh, we got all of these questions here. Um, I, I like the one from Tim. Who's the best bowler? That's I don't know. We've never gone bowling before before it's, the three it's of not us. me it's I, not me okay well then i guess it's me I, and i'm not a particularly good bowler and i feel like i bowl like once or twice a year maybe i think the last time i went bowling was at a hockey tournament in like january i think i ended up in the high 100s like the 160 to 180 range maybe i mean wow, I, i'm, I'm good i i am not a fantastic bowler it's it's like and i'll have a bad game and i'll bowl of 120 or something like that it's just you know do i do i throw nine you know on the good ones do i get a nine or do i uh do i get a strike i'm very good at being consistent like i i will have you know sixes and sevens and whatever and then sometimes it, it goes two inches to the left or right and it's like oh that was a strike and then sometimes it goes two inches to the left or right it's like oh that was a four so i mean that you know in the 100 range but it sounds like there's not a lot of competition so maybe we should do that for the cot of shame let's 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 start a bowling league for the cot of shame who says no uh, I, I say no. I think the last time I bowled, I, I assume it has to have been sooner than this, but the last time I can remember bowling was the year like Ricky Williams went crazy on Texas A&M and I think Texas beat Texas A&M in a game that they, they were supposed to. It was like 2000, 1998 or something like that. I think, yeah, 1999 maybe. So, yes, if you have not gone bowling since if, – if you were concerned about Y2K the last time you went bowling, <laughs> then, uh, yeah, I think I'm liking my chances. I, I do remember keeping score on paper because I did not want to lose record of this. Um, I, for some reason, I'm thinking like in, in the 120s, although I feel like I maybe have done like a 145. I do have a bowling story, though. Back my – I took bowling class. We, me, and the, me and my roommate took 
a bowling class at Ohio State. It was for a, I think it's a one thirty class on a Friday. And the reason we took it is because after class, you can just stay at the bowling alley on campus and drink. So it's like, this would start start our weekend. But we kept oversleeping the class from the night before. So we, we had to drop bowling because we couldn't make it to the one thirty class on time. One thirty class. That we signed up just so we could start drinking earlier on a Friday. Uh, see, the the great thing is you don't have to go to class to start drinking early on a Friday when you're in college. Like, you could just not go to... You, you didn't actually need to, to have the credit hours there to... But you got to get your electives in some way, right? <laughs> and this was a good excuse. Uh, and, like, the first day... maybe Honestly, learning how to keep score on bowling, maybe that's probably why I, I dropped class. I'm like, this is... I did... <laughs> I, I only took one math class at, at Ohio State, and it was stats, and the rest I took was, like, logic and, and philosophy. I, I should chalk up that bowling class to my second math class because um, it, it was difficult. Now I have a bowling game on my phone. I've learned. I've matured. I can do it. Um, but you should, yeah, see, you, should, you should see if you can get a refund for the logic class, too, because... Kevin, are you a bowler? I'm not a bowler. I did go to pins up at Easton, though, which is like that duck pin bowling. And I was pretty good at that once I kind of figured out uh, what I was doing and started really chucking the ball down the lane. I uh, went there with my wife, my sister, and her uh, her kids and still managed only to come in third place. Surprisingly enough, my sister is a tremendous uh, duck pin bowler. I did not know that uh, you know, uh, so she finally was able to beat me at something. I'm 10 years older than her. But, uh, no, the last time I went bowling, like traditional bowling, was probably about five or six years ago. And I may have broken like 110. So we're doing it for money then. Okay, good. All right. So we knew, knew uh, yeah, Huddle huddle Hits the Alleys coming this fall only on uh, YouTube, the UT Buckeye Huddle YouTube channel. Can't huddle wait. Lanes. Huddle lands, yes. yes. <laughs> um, let's see what what else we got here. Um, Carl uh, S. Sagasser, Carl, Carl Sagasser, twenty five, twenty five. Follow the twenty nineteen LSU playbook and have the D peaking at the end of the year. You don't think about the LSU defense of twenty nineteen. I think maybe you can follow the twenty nineteen OSU defense and have them peaking by the end of the year. The twenty fourteen OSU defense and have them peaking by the end of the year. And really, every defense should be peaking by the end of the year. But I don't think you can ha expect this defense to be firing on all cylinders right away against Notre Dame. I don't know that – I'm wondering if they are going to be a little conservative. Do you wait for Tyler Buckner to come to you? Or do you try to get him – go get him, which might kind of lead into what he likes to do, which is scramble and get out of the pocket and make plays? Or are you just worried about, about like – um Confusing him in the back end, containing him, and then you know, maybe you send somebody, but you know, you've know you got to be able to cover all of these guys for as long as it takes. But I don't – I think this defense, Larry Johnson said it this week, where you you have this rejuvenation or you, you see like you're getting into something new and, and there's some energy there like you did in 2019 – not the same energy I'm guessing in 2020 when it's it's regressive and and it's just like I, I wonder how many of those guys knew like they were screwed in 2020 and 2021 and it's like well we can't do anything about it now but this one as as we said yesterday on Buckeye Weekly Larry Johnson saying that Jim Knowles teaches the coverage and the rush better than anybody he's ever seen it so I, I do think you'll see some evidence of that right away obviously because they've picked it up quickly. I just don't know that um, you know the product that you see in September, Kevin, is going to be uh, quite a bit. I think quite a bit different than the product you see in January. Yeah, I mean, remember it took it took Jim Knowles three years to turn around the Oklahoma State defense. I mean, it wasn't a case of where he came in and he was the uh, the defense whisperer and like suddenly everything worked. I mean. He's coming into Ohio State where he's going to have a, you know, he's dealing with a different caliber of athlete. That's not taking anything away from the guys that he was coaching at Oklahoma State, you know, but, you know, real's real. And, I mean, he brought one guy with him, Tanner McAllister, 
So what you see week one versus the end of the year are going to be, I mean, could be just wholesale differences. I mean, plus two, let's remember when we look at, we talk so much about offense and installing offense and, you know, game one, you've got this and it's not until game seven that you, you've installed everything or game nine. So, you know, why would it be any different on the defensive side of the ball? Plus two, you know, we'll, you know, I don't want to speak anything into existence, but you might have different people out there game you know game 10 just because of the rigors of the season and everything else it's a tough season and and things happen whether or not you know it's a case of where you leave the lineup because of whatever or somebody you know comes in and 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 usurps you so uh yeah i don't think it's a case of where you're going to sit there and and look at the notre dame game and say well that's what we're going to see against penn state that's what we're going to see against that team up north it's 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 a work in progress that goes along with what I, what Larry Johnson told me when I asked him, um, how many star- how many starters do you have? And his answer basically was, it depends on the game because they have a, a bunch. It's just they they are going to be able to um, dictate. I I'd say I say dictate, but maybe be be dictated by the offense. But then also everything they have, they can adjust to that offense and they can find ways to to best attack them. So I think Tom, there's. The, the the variability is, is of this defense allows them to um, just kind of suffocate a little bit. That's that's the plan. I'm I'm still you know, obviously we have to wait and see. But on a scale of one to ten, like how sure are you that this is going to be a top fifteen defense? Top fifth <clears throat> top fifteen is not that much better than they were last year in a lot of metrics. I think SP plus had them like 20th and they were, you know, 40th and uh, FEI, I think, but you know, you're, you're not, that's not that big of a lift to get them to, to 15th or so. So 15th, I'd say about a nine out of 10. I mean, top 10 is probably more like a seven and a half and top five is like a five out of 10, maybe something like that. I mean, it's, you've got the pieces, you've got the talent, you've got the depth for the most part. You know, I think there's, there's areas of concern there and linebackers, a little bit of a question. It feels like they've got two guys there, but you know, you haven't seen it until you haven't seen it, you know, until you see it. Corner is a little bit of a concern in terms of depth right now and health with a number of those guys. And it doesn't sound like it's anything serious, but you just, you're running out of guys who are like 100% ready to go full healthy scholarship corners. Like that becomes a problem at some point. So, you know, there are, there are questions, but it feels like just the talent they have and, you know, the way the schedule sets up, you're not going to have, you know, they don't have any like high flying aerial assaults on the schedule in the first month of the season, first month and a half of the season. You, you really not, not until you get to Iowa. No, I'm kidding, kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you go a ways into the season. You really aren't that many great mm-hmm. passing attacks in the Big Ten this year, honestly. And, you know, you're getting Wisconsin and Iowa across division. So, like, no, there's really no one in the first month of the season that has, you know, Toledo should be a pretty good team for a MAC team, but that's a MAC team. So, okay. Notre Dame's big questions are at quarterback and running back for the most, or quarterback and, and wide receiver for the most part. So, okay, that's not really, there's just, there's not a team that's really designed to attack them in terms of like an explosive passing attack this year. So I just, I feel like, I feel like a top, I may, I maybe I'm going to bump all of those numbers up by like one. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm a six out of 10 in terms of them being a top five defense this year and like a seven and a half or an eight out of 10 in terms of them being a top 10 defense. Because when you look at the schedule, the like the most explosive offenses are probably maybe Michigan State and Maryland. I mean, like Michigan by J- Jim Harbaugh's own design isn't necessarily an explosive offense, uh, but like I, I'm in terms of who's going to light them up. Like, yeah, Sean Clifford has been at Penn State forever, but is he going to is he still is he still going to be the starter eight weeks into the season? You know. Um, are, are they finally going to want to move away from him at Penn State? And, you know, obviously Northwestern has no offense. Iowa is what it is. Rutgers will be better, but, you know, Wisconsin, can Graham Mertz get a passing game going there, or is it just going to be the running game, Braylon Allen all day? Um, just, you know, Michigan's 
schedule, their non-conference schedule is terrible, and their overall schedule is pretty easy, so you would expect them to have like a 10-win season. Looking at the offenses that Ohio State plays, Jim Knowles wants a top-10 defense. It's almost like if, if you don't have a top-10 defense, you might have some explaining to do. Now, it, what metric are you using? Because just even in like total defense is, is a, a shaky metric. But like yards per play, Ohio State was 43rd in the nation last year. That has to be – they have to be much better this year. Yeah, I, I think unquestionably, and I don't think you're going to get much argument from anyone in the comments either. And this is this is really three out of four years, three out of the last four years, the Ohio State defense has had substantial issues. And, you know, not been like worst defense in the country kind of issues, but if you have your offenses, you know, number one or number two or number three in the country – that should be enough to get you into the college football playoff and probably win a semifinal game at least. And, you know, if you lose to Alabama in the championship game, you lose to Alabama in the championship game, and, you know, you have had you have had a very good season anyway. But they've had, you know, they had the offense to win the national championship last year, and the defense let them down. 2020, they had the offense to win the national championship, and you get to the national championship game, and, you know, you had all sorts of, ex, you know, external COVID stuff going on as well, which definitely impacted that, but... The defense let him down. 2018, you had the offense for the most part. The offense had, you know, the offense wasn't great at Purdue, for example, but, uh, you know, they, the defense let him down again, you know, in, in some of those spots. So it, it's really been the defense that has really failed them three out of the last four years. And if the defense is just okay, you know, if the defense is just pretty good, the defense does not have to be Georgia from last year. The defense does not have to be the defensive equivalent of the LSU offense from the 2019. They just have to be pretty good, very, you know, solid, uh, you know, above average for a team of, you know, their station in the sport. That's all they need. They don't need to be perfect. They will not shut down, shut out everyone this year, and that's okay. They just need to be, you know, they just need to be good enough to, you know, be able to not have Alabama or whoever they're playing in the, uh, in the postseason, be able to like run away and hide from them, even if they do have a good defense. Kevin, I saw um, you got the comment up there from NCC one four one, as they have officially upgraded. It looks like the the site is live. The membership uh, capabilities are now live. So if you want to go check that out or open up two screens, now here, get to the shop. You just sign up for an annual. We are live, so let's rock. Yeah, I've been talking with Mark on text, and he's like, "Yeah, I, yeah." I was like, "Let me know the second that we that everything's there because we have a lot of people that are that are anxious to get on board. Great supporters out there. We can't do it without you guys. Thank you so much for everything. We would just be talking to ourselves if it wasn't for you guys. We've had about 155, 160, 165 on the line so far here on a kind of an impromptu. I mean, we'd always planned on doing the show, but." didn't come out too early and talk about it. We're going to be here for several more hours. You know, we may tag in a couple of people. Uh, there may be some, you know, there may, there may have to be a couple breaks for people to go and refill their water cups. It's a lot of, it's a lot of talking there, but you guys are awesome. We love you all. I mean, even you too, Yakov, you're all, you're all great. You know, we <laughs> consider you all part of our family and we just, we love you. I saw a comment up there that you just had up there from Jordan Kapler saying that the Undertaker had visited the te the Texas football team, and somebody asked him if uh, he was going to bring uh, Texas back from the dead. I am wondering if I've always considered Texas like a, a soft program. Mac Brown turned him into a soft program. I'm thinking maybe it was a visit like 15 years ago, from like leaping Lanny Poffo, and and he read them some poems from his frisbees, and then threw frisbees to his team like he used to do in the 80s. Uh, if, if there was, if, if you want to have a wrestler come and talk to your team, like you get, you get stone cold, you get the rock, the rock played at Miami, but obviously why would you want to have any association with, with Miami, but the undertaker, he is a big Texas fan, um, despite all of the struggles at Texas. So good for him for trying to, uh, try to bring them back to life. I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, you know, I hear, I hear Quinn Ewers is struggling, which is a surprise to me. I, I was you know, there was so much hope that he was going to come in last year and, and, and push Ohio State quarterbacks for a job. And now he, Tom, don't roll your eyes. Hmm? What? No, I was looking at the ceiling for something unrelated. Oh, is unrelated. that right? Is that right? Unrelated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Is> that, mm -hmm. <laughs> something Sorry. unrelated. Um, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, obviously, Texas as everybody is, just because it's, 
College football is better when funny stuff is happening to Texas. I don't care what anybody says. You know, it's interesting. You talked about Texas getting soft under Mac Brown. I I think there's a misperception about what Texas football is and isn't. I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. outside of out, you know, you go through Mac Brown's kind of early to mid Texas tenure, and that's when you know from uh, 2001 to 2009. They were a 10-win team every single year, 11, 11, 10, 11, 13, 10, 10, 12, 13. You know, they won the national championship one year. They got to the national championship another year. They beat Ohio State at the Fiesta Bowl another year. After that, they have one 10-win season, and that was the year they went to the uh, Sugar Bowl and uh, beat, uh, who'd they beat? We were at the Rose Bowl that day, and I remember walking out, and Texas had just beaten an SEC team in the Sugar Bowl, and now I'm blanking on who it was. But Georgia, they beat Georgia. They were ten and four that year. That's we're the only back. ten. That's the only ten win season they've had since two thousand nine, and it, they were ten and four. Before that stretch, you know, it took a while for for uh, Mac Brown to get them kind of ramped up. But before that, it was John Makovic, and John Makovic had the one ten game season where they were ten two and one, uh, lost the Sugar Bowl in nineteen ninety five. They, um, you know, they, they won the Big 12 in 1996 in that shocking upset on the, against uh, Nebraska, that uh, fourth and one pass to the tight end. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, you know, John Makovic, six wins, five wins, eight wins, ten wins, eight, eight wins, four wins, and he's fired. Before that, David McWilliams, seven, mm-hmm. four, five, ten. They lost the Cotton Bowl in 1990 to, that was the the, uh, funniest bowl game in the history of college football when Miami ran up about 17 miles of penalties and beat Texas like 46 to 3. And that was the high watermark of the David McWilliams era. And before that, it's Fred Akers. And Fred Akers had a uh, 1983, 11 and 0, they go to the Cotton Bowl and lose. After that, seven wins, eight wins, five wins. We're 39 years ago. Outside of that one stretch with with Mac Brown, everyone you know talks about Texas as if Texas is just perpetually on the verge of greatness. It's like based on what exactly is Texas on the verge of greatness? Because they have been a sleeping giant for about thirty of the last forty years, and I mean, sure, maybe you know, maybe this is you know NIL is what what gets them over the hump, and oh, you know now finally now they have some splashy skill talent. Okay, great, and well, all the problems are solved. Uh, I don't, I, I don't think that the move to the SEC is going to go great for them. Is I think my my big takeaway on Texas football. Yeah, they're like a Missouri senior. I, I think Texas went from bad to entitled, and under like under Mac Brown, they, they they started out bad, then they went, they became entitled, and they've been that the entire time. Since so they've been that ever since, and it's just it's. It's weird. You you need one generational player. You get him, and then you become like, oh, this is what we've always been. This is who we are, and it, it, it's not. Kevin, I've got one for you from El Sue Sabo, uh, sack leader this year. JT Sawyer, Zach, like I'm, I don't know who I who I think is going to lead in sacks this year. That's why I'm going to ask Kevin, and <laughs> then I'll probably ask Tom, and then I'll probably say no. I disagree with you both, and then go to the next question. I think I would probably fare better with the the old time namey game or whatever of, of doing that than being Kevin, able to. Kevin just said Kevin just did the podcast equivalent of just saying Candyman three times. That was that was <laughs> don't do that. No 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 no. Do not. Nope. Um, you know. And here's the thing: I, I, I'm not going to list off six names and then say, "Well, I said it." I mean, because I, I listed off six names. I'm going to say Zach Harrison. I'm going to say this is the year that he put it all together. I think with the new Jim Knowles system, without having some of the contain responsibilities, with him being able to go out there, pin his ear, ears back, and just go after him. And you know, this is a contract year. This is you know really a contract year to do everything. I and I think that you know just based on his longevity in the program and everything else that he's going to probably get a couple more snaps than some of the other guys. So that's going to be more opportunity. So I'm going to say Zach Harrison. How many, like what, what, what number leads the team? The highest number, duh. Well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> well, then how do you measure yourself by height? By height. Uh, <laughs> uh Nine and a half. You're incorrect, Tom. 
Interesting. Uh, I think the answer is going to be a defensive end who is in his second year. And there are two possible answers here to me. And, you know, you look at the results from Oklahoma State and you think the answer is going to be Jack Sawyer. I just, I look at, and I think that's I think that's a perfectly viable answer. And if that was Tony's answer, I would not be able to ridicule him nearly as much as usual. I think, though, I'm going with JT Tuimolo out. I just, it just feels like this might be the uh you know the the crazy year where where he really really breaks out and i'm going to say 10 and a half sacks for jt tuimolo wow that's that's a lot um that's significant that's pretty bold uh, looking at what the, oh, the strong oh, right, everyone you heard it you heard it everyone you heard it all right so when i say it later on a bold prediction right show no i it's it's bold for just a regular prediction. It's not bold for a bold prediction. Like that's just this is a standard prediction. A standard prediction and fairly bold, but not a bold prediction. Not even close. I I think a lot of people are just saying, you know, it's Jack Sawyer. You know, because it's, you know, he's he's the, he's supposed to be the guy. I don't have a great answer and the, the strong side defensive end last year at Oklahoma State, I think it was Tyler Lacey had like three sacks, but these are different these are not they may play the same position, like he and JT Tuimolo may play the same position, but they are not the same guy. So it's really difficult to try to um, match those or assume that they will be matched. the The weak side defensive end position, you know, sometimes it's Jack Sawyer as that Jack. Other times it may be like Zach Harrison as not a Jack. It's I guess the Zach, perhaps, if you will, the Zach, Zach attack, attack. <laughs> the Jinx. Zach and Jack. <laughs> All right, perfect. Now you guys can shut up until I say your names. Anyway, um, this is the best show ever. The <laughs> I, you said Zach Harrison, you got Jack Sawyer, no uh, JT Tuimolo. I'm I'm wondering like, do I come in here and I go like, no, it's going to be Steel Chambers, or I'll tell you what, it's going to be Court Williams, completely out of the blue, where you know he gets a couple of games with like two and a half sacks, sending him on blitzes, and he leads the team with seven and a half because everybody else has six and a half, like. You got like five guys with six and a half sacks, and here comes Court Williams with seven and a half to lead the team. Because I don't know, like there's there's some talented pass rushers, but what if they're taking sacks from each other? Or a lot of times, if the pass rush is really good, quarterbacks are trying to get the ball out of their hands as quickly as possible, which eliminates the the the, the pressure and knocks those sack numbers down. And if you are also playing against a defense that is moving around, you almost want to – do you want to get rid of the ball quicker? Like you want to have – you you know where you want to go with it just so you don't have to deal with all of these moving parts. So maybe that plays into a lack of sacks as well. But then as it's just me, Tim, 79 points out, Oklahoma State led this, the nation in sacks last year. So clearly they're doing something right. And I say all of that to say – yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know who's going to lead the team. Like obviously, no, none of us do, and I don't have a great pick. I will say because Jack Sawyer is the obvious answer, so I don't think it's going to happen. That's why I'm staying away from that one. Uh, I'll tell you what would be a great story, Tyler Friday. That would be good. That would be a, a nice way for him to go out. But anyway, next question. Um, I'm not gonna. It's 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 too soon to say. Uh, ask me in November. That's when I can give you a, a, a better answer. The closer we are, the, you know, make fun of that all you want, Tom. You've got like astronomers watching asteroids from far away. About you know, are they going to hit, hit Earth? And they're like, well, I'm going to need more information. And nobody ridicules them. The real question is: Is the asteroid going to hit a quarterback? That's the real question here. Knock him down. That's no. It's going to be a second, a half a second late, and, mm. and the, the ball is going to get away. Um, this one from Yakov22. If OSU is playing in Dublin, Ireland, I like they added Ireland in there because, um, you know, here in Columbus, that's a different question. If OSU is playing in Dublin, Ireland, would Buckeye Huddle be there to cover it? Yes. Um, yeah. Yep. I Well, pending passports and, you know, being able to leave the country and things of that nature. But the intention would be to to get there. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know if Frontier goes, you know, over water or uh, any, it, <laughs> I believe, I believe Ryan. Barge at that point. 
I believe Ryanair is the uh, frontier of uh, the European continent. So yes, you will have to pay extra for armrests and uh, you know bathroom access and that kind of stuff. But uh, we'll get there eventually. No, I was going to look actually. Drive to JFK, and then you know, and then you you can hop across the pond. Not too bad if you. I mean, if you're you're going out of JFK. I mean, honestly, it would probably going west to go east. I mean, out of O'Hare wouldn't be that bad either it's just you know trying to fly out of columbus or whatever would probably be seven stops yeah, you know, I, don't, I, I don't think you can get i don't think they have direct flights to dublin from columbus but you can you know having having done the columbus to uh new york drive more than a few times like i would be okay if with flying that first leg that would that would be okay with me yeah i'm looking here one stop i don't know where the, where the stop is if it's in like dc or new york or something like that it's actually not that much more expensive than flights to Arizona right now, if if you can if you can imagine. So, um, and then you 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 go over to to Europe, or, and I think everybody just stays in hostels while they're there. So, no, you, I mean, that's no different than what we do anyway. Your hostel is what it is. Well, I mean, you know these these Irish people, you know, um, but you, I would was- love. European vacation, you just sit there and you try to go and stay with long lost relatives who aren't your relatives and don't don't speak the language. You know, I think I've only ever watched European vacation maybe about a half hour of because I don't consider it canon. Um, the the kids in that family change a lot more often than the kids in my family. Like the you know the actual human being changes a lot more often, which you know makes me wonder if the if it really is. As non-fictional as they as they purport it to be. Ooh, look, Big mm-hmm. Ben, Parliament. I can't get left. I would love to like go to Ireland and and you know cover the game and f- for the first three days just be checking out different pubs. Like this pub was built in 1642, and you know this one was built in 1738. I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to the new place. <laughs> it's just me. Tim says go to London and take a train, which. Um, I mean, I've never been to Ireland, but my impression is that it's uh, there's water between that and uh, the rest of the UK, which I don't think you can. I don't think there's a bridge over the uh, Irish Sea. So, uh, is there a tunnel? He, he didn't say you're going to get to Ireland. He just said go to London and take a train. <laughs> and and I, I wanted to get to Jay's comment asking if Tony is on the Do Not Fly list. I punched that one up and got there. Uh, Tony doesn't like to fly that much. If I'm, you know, letting in on a little secret, there. It's not. I mean, the thing is, is you know, flying sucks. I mean, it it does. I mean, it beats driving or whatever. But uh, it's, you know, it's not the greatest experience. It's not what it used to be. You know, t- Tony wants to be back there in the smoking section. <laughs> uh, I was I was pulled aside, going to the going coming back from I think the 2006 game against Florida out in Arizona. Because uh, there was, I don't know, like fertilizer or something. I'm like, well, I was golfing the day before. And they're like, yeah, that always comes up. It's like, well, like if if you know, like I'm in Arizona, like and there's some golfing in Arizona. And you, these swabs that they're using on people are always going to be pinging for some sort of fertilizer. Um, I don't know, maybe tweak it or, you know, whatever. Like I'm, I, I made it home safely eventually, but it's just weird to be pulled aside and um, swabbed. But I'm, but you get used to it. I'm, I'm told you get used to it. So, uh, so there you go. Um, LJT, try to subscribe. It doesn't like. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm mm. gonna have him reach out to Mark. Yeah, yes, I'm I, sure everybody's. I, I would assume most people are using the same email as they were. Yeah, you, we have. I'm just looking at the board now. There are plenty of new, plenty of people who are signed up with their, uh, you know, their new annual membership. So yes, it is, it is working. If it's not working, uh, email uh, mgivler at gmail dot com. There you go. Case Simon feeling bad for Justin Fields in Chicago. So so am I, as a Bears fan. Um, now I now I understand how the Washington Commanders fans were feeling about Terry McLaurin. Like before the contract, while they're trying to extend him on the contract, they're like, "We just want him to be happy. We just want him to be safe. We just want him to have his money where, wherever it is." Um, because the the franchise that you're with can be such a mess, and the Bears are a mess. But you know maybe they'll you know. Get somebody good in the draft next year. Maybe a receiver. Maybe a receiver from Ohio State. Who's to say? Um, I have to say. Go go draft Jackson Smith at Jigba. Anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, Jordan Kepler, I know this is an OSU show, but what do you guys want to see out of Nebraska this year with new quarterback 
and uh, Mark Whipple, uh, offensive coordinator. It's a do or die year for Scott Frost. Mark Whipple, we know, was at Pitt last yeah. year. Pat Narduzzi loved him a year ago. <laughs> now does not love him any longer and blames all of his problems uh, on Mark Whipple. Whipple. It's like if that's if those are problems for Pitt last year, Pitt should be that unfortunate every year. And Pat Narduzzi would eventually be a ten million dollar a year head coach. And so, I like having Whipple at Nebraska now. How much control is Scott Frost giving over? Um, how well does this offense marry to Casey Thompson, the quarterback, the transfer from Texas? But Tom, you and I were talking about this after recording Buckeye Weekly yesterday. This is the biggest week zero game in the history of college football that has ever involved uh, two Big Ten teams. It is a monster game for Scott Frost because I think he, you know, they were a pretty good team. Their their net uh, points scored last year uh, in Big Ten play was zero. They scored exactly as many points as they gave up. And they finished one and eight in the conference. Like it's it is it is like almost mathematically impossible to do that. They won, uh, they beat Northwestern fifty six to seven, I think, and then lost all their other games by like a single score, and lost to Ohio State by nine. So, you know, they were, you know, people have called them the best three win team in the history of college football, and it's like, boy, that is the most backhanded of backhanded compliments. But also, it's probably true. They probably deserve to win six or seven games, and if. You win six or seven games, you make a bowl game last year. Well, then the week one game against Northwestern isn't quite as must win. The problem is last year they played a a week zero game, sorry, against Northwestern. The problem is last year they played a week zero game at Illinois and lost in an incredibly stupid fashion against a not particularly good Illinois team. And that kind of set the tone for the whole season. They have to win that Northwestern game. And then the real tricky thing is then you have to get on an airplane then you have to fly home. The next week, the next Saturday, they play North Dakota at home. So you've got all the body clock stuff going on from you know, being over in Ireland and adjusting your whole sleep schedule and all that kind of stuff. Like You can sort of get yourself there for the first game and plan ahead a little bit. But you come home, you know, it's, it's a relatively late, I think it's a Saturday night kind of game uh, in Ireland time. So you're, are you flying back home on Sunday? Are you flying home Saturday night into Sunday, whatever? You're probably not, you know, back on Nebraska time until Wednesday, Thursday that week, maybe. And then you've got to play North Dakota, who is not North Dakota State, just regular old North Dakota, which, you know, North Dakota, North Dakota State, South Dakota, South Dakota State, those are all pretty good FCS teams. Those are all FCS teams you should not schedule. And so then you've got a body clock game against a North Dakota team that's pretty good that your fans aren't going to give a crap about, that your team, it's going to be very hard to get the team to get excited about. That just, Scott Frost better be 2-0 after that North Dakota game. I think there's a real non-zero chance that Scott Frost is not 2-0 after those first two games. And if Scott Frost is not 2-0 after those first two games, like that is probably, probably the end of Scott Frost at Nebraska if you lose one of those games. Because you, I think they can make a bowl game this year. They could win six, seven, eight games this year. But you got to be two and zero, and if you're not two and zero after those first two weeks, you got a big problem. I uh, about a month or so ago, I went through and picked all of the Big Ten games. I have Northwestern going three and nine, and zero and nine in Big Ten play. To, to, to give you an idea, I have Nebraska winning the Big Ten West, which concerns me terribly because I I am projecting competence, and then basing this off of their schedule. Because they, you open it with the Northwestern game, they should win that. They should beat North North Dakota. Game three is Georgia Southern. Then game four is a home game against Oklahoma. Where are you? Where Where is the program at that point? Where is the offense? Where is the defense? I think Oklahoma will probably be a slight favorite, but they almost beat Oklahoma last year in Norman. Then they have a bye week. Then they have Indiana at home. They should win that. Then they're at Rutgers on a Friday. That's, I mean, I, I picked Rutgers in this game just because, but but that's a game that they could win. And they at that point, you know, anything becomes possible. The next week they're at Purdue. Purdue is, I mean, that's, Purdue should win that, but are you saying Nebraska can't? I'm not saying that. And then it's um, an open week. And then it's Illinois at home, Minnesota at home. Then they're at Michigan. Then they have Wisconsin at home. 
then they finish the season at Iowa. So they finish those last four games are are all toss ups, but I think the only one that they definitely lose is probably Michigan. But at this point, where is Michigan? So I had them finishing nine and three, and it feels it feels aggressive now that I, I really look at it. Especially I have them winning at Iowa, just as a what the heck type of thing on a Friday. Um, but it's it's not um, it's not the most difficult schedule, but it gets bad at the end. And if things if the the wheels have already fallen off by the by the time they get to the last four or five games, shoot, they may lose to Illinois at home, and just everything goes to hell. That's about as friendly as a cross division schedule as you're going to get. You don't have Ohio State, you don't have Penn State, you don't have Michigan State. I mean, you're if you're getting Rutgers cross division and Indiana cross division, that's yeah, you're going to lose to Michigan, but those are two pretty friendly cross division games. You should be three and one in the in your non conference because Georgia Southern has a new head coach that is. Uh, Tony, do, do, who knows who Georgia Southern's new head coach is? It is a name that you will know, but you will not associate him with Georgia Southern. Uh, Clay Helton? Clay Helton. Former USC coach Clay Helton is uh, Georgia Southern's new head coach. So, you know, they're, they're kind of starting over there. You've got the new thing at Oklahoma with Brent Venables where they're kind of starting over. If you're, It feels like he has to be 3-1 and one coming out of the non-conference. He no could be 4-0. Oh, sorry. Three, three and one coming out of the, uh, yeah, three and one, including that Northwestern game. Sorry. Coming out of that non-conference schedule. You could be four and oh, you could beat Oklahoma. That's not out of the realm of possibility. There's, there's probably like five games on the schedule that I would say are like toss up or worse. Oklahoma, uh, Purdue, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa. So, you know, you should you should go no worse than six and one in the other ones, and hopefully you go seven and zero, oh, and then, you know, and then it's just a matter of can North can Nebraska win close games? Tony, Tony, what could possibly go wrong? Nebraska in close games? I I don't. I mean, what what are the odds they don't win close games? I can't I can't see it happening. Well, there's just there's no 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 evidence of of any of that out there. Uh, Kevin from uh, from Zach Miller, what do you uh, what what do you think of the first AP poll? Of course, Ohio State number two in that poll, Alabama number one. 54 first-place votes. Ohio State has six first-place votes. Georgia, three first-place votes at third. Texas, no first-place votes, unlike the coaches poll when they had one first-place votes, one first-place vote. Anything in that AP poll stand out to you? Like I, I see Clemson at number four. That's kind of surprising to me, but that's that's how quickly I move past Clemson. Like uh, we, We're done with them. We, we, we've they're no longer a thing until they get their quarterback situation settled. But anything stand out to you here in this poll? Well, not only does Texas not have a first place vote, Texas isn't in the top 25, they're 27. So that's, you know, just shows the wild swing in terms of the coaches poll where I, I guess uh, uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman said that he believed that it was, um, the UTSA head coach that voted Texas number one, and lo and behold, the writers don't even have them in the top 25. Uh, you have Penn State that's outside of the top 25, which, you know, based on where they are right now, doesn't completely, you know, surprise me. Uh, Arkansas being 19 is something that, uh, you know, that's a polarizing team there. I think that they've gone in and they've done a good job of kind of turning some things around, but are they really a top 20 team? Um, you know, I understand SEC, SEC, it means more, it means more. But, you know, I don't know where you go through this little stretch where you have Arkansas 19, Kentucky 20, and Ole Miss 21. And Ole Miss is going to be breaking in a new quarterback and some other things there. I know more about Ole Miss than I care to, being married to somebody who went to Ole Miss. So we talk about them, and I have to try and stay up to date. Um, I was kind of surprised – Two, that Ohio State only had six first place votes. I understand, you know, Bama, 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 but I, you know, I thought that Ohio State might have a couple few more. I know that uh, a good friend of ours, Dave Briggs from the Toledo Blade, he voted Ohio State one. So that's one. That's one of the six right there. That Arkansas Cincinnati Week One game is huge for both of those programs to show that. Keep us in mind. You know, we're not we're not irrelevant. Because losing to 
either one of those teams is not great for a program that wants to be considered a top 10 program or whatever. And beating one of those te- two teams is a nice pro- propellant into, say, the top 15 or something like that. So that's that's a big, uh, that maybe under the radar type of game in week one, uh, as we are all just going to be talking about Notre Dame nonstop, uh, starting at about 8 a.m. That, that morning, I think. But Tom, anything from this poll? I know you love the AP poll. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I saw Sue's comment about, you know, how big a difference there is between Ohio State and Bama in terms of first place votes. I think what's more maybe instructive to me is that I think there was one person, there was a Kansas State voter who had Ohio State fourth and everyone else has Ohio State in the top three. And it just, this is a season where it feels like the consensus is there's Alabama and Ohio State and then there's a gap. And then there's, you know, whatever mix of Georgia and Clemson and Notre Dame and Texas A&M and, you know, Utah and all those teams, you know, there's a gap between after those top two. And virtually all of the votes for Ohio State were one or two. And, I mean, it, it's the preseason poll. I, I find it absolutely impossible to get worked up over the preseason poll. I find it pretty difficult to get worked up over, like, the Week 11 poll because it really kind of doesn't matter uh, at this point in the sport. So I, I think Ohio State is kind of where they need to be. And, you know, now, now you know, Nick Saban has to worry about his team getting complacent and, and you know, the rat poison and from all of the, you know, because if, if Alabama was number two, believe me, Alabama football players would know. And, you know, the nine votes that didn't go to Alabama, boy, that is some disrespect. And they're probably hearing about that right now, too. So, but, you know, Ohio State is, Ohio State is where they need to be right now, which is, in a place where if they go 11 and 1 or 12 and 0 in the regular season and win the Big 10 championship they're going to be in the playoff and that's that's all you need right now and and that they're they're there right now and they would be there regardless of whether they were in the AT, AP top 25 really I like this question from NCC 141 do you think Evan Pryor's injury quote unquote helps with avoiding a potential portal entry if they struggled with getting uh, the, the RB3 their desired touches I think that's a pretty interesting point because at this point Evan Pryor is expecting nothing before he was being talked up and his role was being uh, built up and we've seen that kind of get become underwhelming we mentioned DeMario McCall uh, and how many years did he have a role that never materialized and that can be defeating now it wasn't for him he didn't go anywhere he stuck around forever would still be here if he could but I think that's an interesting point where Evan Pryor coming in thinking, I don't know what he's thinking, seven touches a game. And if he only ends up with like three touches a game, well, now you feel I'm, I've been lied to. I I showed something in what I was able to do. I'm not able to show enough based on the touches that you've given me. I need to go somewhere else. And I know like we don't talk about transfers here, but I think, Kevin, this uh, – certainly keeps Evan Pryor around for next year, even though you had to sacrifice this year to make sure that it happens. Yeah. I mean, you don't like the cost of, you know, losing a season like that and having to go through the injury and, you know, rehab is going to be significant. It's just not like, okay, doctor's going to fix it and I'm going to be fine. I mean, he's going to go through some challenges, but, but I, I do agree that it does, it, I, I was in C, uh, C-141's point that it does, you know, put a little bit of distance in terms of where everything stands at that point. I mean, with, uh, you know, Chop near the end of his career, Trevion Henderson will be going into year three at that point. Uh, you know, he's going to have to sit there and battle with Dallin Hayden, who's going to, uh, you know, Dallin Hayden's going to be getting those number three touches at that point. Um, but, you know, I think that you very well could have gotten out of this year and it would have been a case of, you know, and again, we don't, we don't associate names to transfers or whatever, but somebody maybe at the bottom of the line would be looking, Hmm, you know, Mark Fletcher's coming in. Maybe, you know, maybe Ohio state takes a second running back in this class. Uh, am I going to get my opportunity because the portal is very real. I mean, so uh, I think there is something to this. I mean, again, you don't like seeing it at the cost that it is, but uh, you know, it, it happened. It's real. So, you know, you got to look at it that way. Yeah. A uh, question from Yakov 22. Will the OSU Notre Dame game be the most watched game this season? Regular season. I'm guessing. So it's going to be prime time. 
It's going to be the start of the season. Everybody's going to be ramped up and, and ready to go. Both teams are undefeated at this point. I don't think Alabama and Georgia, do they do they play at some point this year where that would be like the other game that could could yeah. rival it? Um, and and I'm, I'm pulling up the uh, Saturday night schedule for that night to see what else is on because that's the – that's the real challenge is what else is on against those games. Uh, Memphis, Mississippi State, Utah, Florida on at 6 o'clock. I mean, it's interesting to not get that kind of mention. Utah State at Alabama. Yeah, I mean, it it might be because there's just there's not a lot else going on that night. Because where you where you get those games is when, you know, this is the reason that Big Noon, uh, Big Noon kickoff has been such a hit, a hit for uh, Fox. It's because... Everything else going on in that time slot is crap. So everyone who wants to watch a good football game is watching the Fox game. There really is everyone else. All the other networks have kind of punted that uh, that evening slot, which kind of tells you what they think is probably going to happen there. I, I you know, there's a real possibility that Ohio State Michigan is, uh, you know, ends up being the number one game. That is very frequently the number one game. If Ohio State, you know, I think Michigan's probably going to have a very shiny record this year. I think Ohio State should have a pretty good record this year. I think there might be some narrative uh, interest going into that game. Uh, you know, storylines that people might be thinking about, talking about. You're going to have the, you know, late season national championship push. And there's not generally, you know, there's other rivalry games that Saturday at noon, but everyone kind of knows, like, you sort of steer clear of the Ohio State-Michigan timetable. So, I'm going to guess that both Ohio State, Michigan, and Notre Dame, Ohio State are both top five most watched games in the uh, in the nation this you know regular season. I'm going to say Ohio State, Michigan finishes just ahead, but I think it'll be you know they're both going to be right up there. Yeah, and that's dependent upon records as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we know, Michigan looking at a 11 and 0 start to the season very likely. If they don't, then they're underperforming. And, uh, you know, once again, they've been overrated. Yakov22 again, would you like to see Big Ten games streamed on Apple and or Amazon? We are still waiting on this Big Ten contract to come out. I am, I'm fine with streaming a Friday night game or something like that because it, I'm, I'm accustomed to, you know, all of the different streams that, that are out there. I know a lot of people have, would not be able to access those games. I don't think there's ever been any concern from school presidents or ADs about locking people out because look at ticket prices. They don't need Gene Smith doesn't need 105,000 people in the stadium. He needs 101 at a higher ticket price Then you know, it's not about selling everybody. It's not making it available to everybody. It's about making it available to enough people at the highest price. And once you get there, then you're happy. And so, yeah, I, I expect this to happen. I know there's been a, a report, I think jo- John Aran saying that it's looking like Notre Dame will stay independent because they're maybe able to get about $60 million a year from Notre Dame or from NBC to uh, to stay independent. They were looking for 75. Getting 50 or 60 is still going to leave them, you know, 40 to 50 million under the Big Ten average. But when you look at the number of sports that each of these schools uh, sponsor and support. Ohio State supports 35 varsity sports, so they need all that money. Notre Dame supports 20. So they can make do with less money because they can put as much towards football as maybe Ohio State is. Like Clemson puts more of their ACC, ACC money towards football than Ohio State does to their football program because they have like Clemson has 19 sports. Ohio State has nearly double that. Michigan has 27. Penn State has 29. Michigan State has 21. Alabama has 15 sports. So, like, there, the, it's the allocation of these funds I, will allow you to do as much with less because Clemson doesn't have hockey. They don't have women's hockey. You know, they don't have all of these different things that a lot of the Big Ten schools do. USC and UCLA, by the way. Both support uh, 21 sports. Kevin, they're going to have to get some hockey teams. Yeah, exactly. Um, the thing is, is that you know the Big Ten will always have Notre Dame hockey for now, unless you know suddenly the ACC puts uh, puts a 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're if you're really looking to put their feet to the fire, you know, take away their hockey. I mean, I mean, what are they going to do? Go back to the CCHA? I mean, is that even still in existence at this point? So, um, yes, I, I think, think so. I mean, I think, I think so. so. Um, but you know, it's it, it'll 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 be interesting. And I, you know, just kind of as the dovetail here with FW Buckeyes' uh, question about uh, Peacock maybe being part of the NBC deal. And the, obviously the Apple, Amazon, you think it will require every big team to appear once like BTN now? Um, I don't think that you're sitting there necessarily paying out all of this money to um, put them on your streaming services. I understand, you know, I go back to when ESPN2 launched and they put Duke UNC basketball, men's basketball on there. And I remember that we did not get ESPN2 on our cable system on campus. And... We all had to go and find somewhere to go watch that game. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit different than, you know, the streaming situation of where, you know, even if you take a, even if you kind of take a bottom game and you just say, okay, we're going to put Ohio State Rutgers on streaming. I just don't know if, if that's a good allocation of what you're spending your money for to put them there. I mean, I could see something in terms of where, over the course of maybe so many years, you're going to have to make an appearance there, but not not yearly. I, I I just think that that's I think that's just a bad precedent. I want to answer this question with a question, which is how much are they paying? Because there's probably a number where yes, Ohio State will have to appear on Amazon or Apple or whatever the streaming arm is. Notre Dame, I think at NBC, you know, has the potential to. I think Peacock was potentially part of the deal as well, mm-hmm. so. You know, maybe Peacock ends up being the only streaming piece of this deal. That again, it's it's not a hundred percent finalized yet, but I would suspect you are going to have an Ohio State game on Peacock at some point. They have, you know, Notre Dame. Notre Dame is their their bread and butter right now. They Notre Dame is playing UNLV on Peacock this year. Notre Dame played Toledo on Peacock last year. I think that was last year. They they you know this is this is the product they're going to sell. They're trying to sell week one of the Big Ten Network history in 2007, what was the game that the Big Ten Network put on? Appalachian State at Michigan. 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 You have you have a big brand on there because then everyone gets upset when they can't watch the big brand beat up on that poor, terrible FCS team, and they call their cable operator and say, listen, I want to watch Michigan win this game by 40 points. And then the cable company caves, and everyone gets at least part of what they want there. So... That's a, uh, you know, that, that I think is kind of still the business model. You use, you use the customer to, you know, you can, you can sit in a board meeting, in a board meeting in, in their uh, business, a boardroom and, you know, b- pound your fist on the table about how you're a fool if you don't put our, you know, you don't put our channel on your cable streaming thing or, you know, how people are idiots if they don't, uh, they don't pay you the five bucks a month to subscribe to, you know, Peacock. But guess what? If, if you have a bunch of angry people from Ohio uh, who can't watch the Buckeyes? Well, then you're going to have a bunch of uh, bunch of signups from Ohio to uh, to the Peacock sub service. Well, I'll say also, this, a little bit of good. a difference though between getting Charter or Xfinity or whatever to pick up a another channel, and you know they're probably not going to do a price correction right at that moment, versus getting somebody who might not even have a smart TV. And I'm I mean, okay, yes, you can go out and get a Roku stick for. 30 bucks or something like that. But, you know, I, I, my mom doesn't even get internet at her house. My mom just does not care about any of that stuff. So she's probably not the right person. Well, let's get rid of this comment here of uh, somebody trying to spam our chat. Um, you know, so there's... Uh, Sorry, that was that was me. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. But, you know, they're, go- they're going to be some people that are just, you know, for whatever reason... You know, it may not be as simple as a thirty-dollar Roku stick to be able to get it, and they're probably the people that are not going to be the ones going out saying, "Well, we'll just go to B Dubs. Well, we'll just go to the Corner Bar or something like that." So, I, why I, I absolutely agree with Tom's points. It, I mean, it's it's you know, it's apples and pears as opposed to apples and apples, and I think I'm just looking because we got to remember. Once this new contract goes into effect, you're no longer on ABC. You're no longer on ESPN, ESPN2, ESPNU. So that those games are going to have to go somewhere. And Peacock will be some of that. Uh, I, I don't know how much, but obviously 
FS2 probably becomes more into play, perhaps. And, I, and I'm just trying to look through here to see how many Big Ten games are on the the Disney networks here the first week. And honestly, I'm not seeing a ton, which, you know, FS1 has games. Um, it's it's pretty surprising, actually, that, the, that they're already kind of moving away. You know, ABC obviously has the Notre Dame game. Uh, for Ohio State, but I'm, I'm I haven't done the logistics on where all these games are going to go. And you've got three time slots, you know, noon, three thirty, and the, the 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 prime time, and that gets shrunk down in November to two time slots for all of these games, and no no ESPN next year. I wonder, do you have to uh, get rid of that no night game November rule? Especially since NBC wants night games. I mean, the the USC and UCLA are still a couple of years away, so like that that's an easy fix. Right now, you need a hard fix. Yeah, that's an interesting question, and they may have to do that because I it, you're right. I feel like the answer there is just USC and UCLA are playing home games in November, and those games are the evening slots, and that's you know because the the objection is it's cold, you get the weather, you get the winds, no one wants to go sit in the games, all that kind of stuff. It, that is an interesting question because I don't, you know, someone is paying for the TV revenue. So you know, for that TV window, they are not paying to split the time with, you know, with, uh, you know, another network. I think NBC has the primetime window and CBS has the mid-afternoon 3.30 window. NBC is not going to want to have a Big Ten game on at the same time as CBS if they're paying $300 million a year or whatever it is for the rights. So it feels like that is a rule that will probably get to at least bent for the short term until there is a longer uh, a longer term fix in place with UCLA USC being able to uh being able to uh you know sort of fill that fill that void and you know the other question is at some point does there become a uh you know hashtag Pac12 after dark edition in the Big 10 where you know you've got uh, it's not necessarily a great game but uh, Rutgers goes out to UCLA and they have a, a 10 o'clock kickoff and then you're filling another broadcast window Kevin Win- Kevin uh, Warren talked a bunch about broadcast windows uh, during the uh, Big Ten media days I have a feeling you're going to have you know those are not going to be great games but it's going to be you know the the new equivalent of the uh, wash you know game at Washington State that only the sickos are up watching that's going to be you know, oh man, Maryland is playing at USC at 10 o'clock and uh, can't wait to see, you know, can't wait to see what craziness ensues. Yeah, I wonder, because I'm I'm in on that 1030. I just wonder if it you it takes more than just two West Coast teams programs to make that happen. Like if you need a Washington and an Oregon and how quickly do they move? If Notre Dame's saying no at this point, we don't know that they are, but John Arand uh, reporting that they, they're leaning towards staying independent. But Kevin Warren said they're really like no hurry to expand without Notre Dame kind of alluding to that. I wonder if, if you've got an answer on Notre Dame and you think it's a solid answer, it's like, well, no reason not to move now, right? Like no reason not to to leave U, USC and UCLA on an island at this point. They can Everybody can just join in. But are you getting essentially uh, $100 million in revenue from each of those programs you know, or, or like how much of a, of a hit are you taking by adding those guys? And that's all of the, the, the math that goes into figuring in who can come in next. Uh, Lisa Sims comment here. I don't think Notre Dame should be in the playoffs without being part of a conference. And I agree. They think they're so big. They don't need to. And it's, it's interesting to me that they are still so tied into this, this, image of independence you know well we can go we we play all across the country the big 10 kevin i'm not sure if you're aware of this in a couple of years we'll stretch from the 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 border of new york city to to los angeles and up to the border of canada in minneapolis down to i don't know um the ohio river i mean that's pretty much all the america that I, you really need to be interested in, basically. Yeah, I heard that it is going to be a national conference, and you know, I, I, everybody who's watch watches this show or watches my shows has heard me talk about 
the 1940s radio deal of where that you know Notre Dame was the only game in town and that's what you'd get on the radio and because of that you know the national brand but you know you can if with with streaming and everything else ESPN3 or whatever you can find pretty much about every every game of consequence in division 1 FCS I mean move, moving on down so there's no there's no well, if you go there, you, good luck. You're going to get to see three of your games on television. So, I, you know, the, it's the economics that just don't make sense to me. I mean, one, I don't know how NBC is going to pay Notre Dame $60 million. You know, the reported numbers out there is kind of standalone to maintain its independence when Notre Dame could come into the Big Ten and potentially make, you know, $100 million depending on how the, the shares work and everything else. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of shocked that, that they would pay up on that Notre Dame, you know, on that Notre Dame standalone contract. So, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I get it. I mean, it, 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 it's it's a it's a great gig if you can get it and have this independence and be able to write your own ticket. But to get to Lisa's point about about college football playoff, uh, you know, inclusion, I do think that conference membership should be important. But that's not the way it's written in the current iteration. And if we see expansion. I you know I don't know if I'm going to see us uh, see them say well now we're going to change it because you know Notre Dame is going to be like well we were already in it before what what's what's changed? Well, and the other thing is the SEC doesn't want Notre Dame going to the Big Ten, so the SEC is not going to make that a a rule. I mean, this is the Big Ten can't just unilaterally change the rules for the college football playoff eligibility which is one of the reasons you haven't seen any changes in the college football playoff format recently, even though there was lots of reports that it was going to change. They couldn't agree. They couldn't agree on that from Notre Dame's perspective. If they have playoff access and they're getting a reasonable amount of money, I mean, Tony just went through, you know, the number of sports that Notre Dame supports and they can, they, you know, $60 million is enough to support their football team. It's also four times as much as they're making under their current contract. They're, I think at $15 million a year under their current contract. So, if you you know have a four hundred percent four hundred percent of what you're making before, like well you're probably doing okay, and the limitations that Notre Dame has uh, right now in terms of football are probably not financial limitations as much as other stuff. Believe me, you talk, ask, ask anyone affiliated with Notre Dame, they will tell you it's all academics. Every bit of it is academics. There's some other stuff going on there too, but you know I don't I, I think they are going to be have enough money and enough playoff access that they don't have to make a change. And, you know, the independence tradition there, I think, is very important, especially to, like, older pieces of the fan base. And, I mean, eventually the older pieces of the fan base won't be there anymore, and maybe things change a little bit then. But, you know, how, how long is the Big Ten TV contract? I don't think I've actually seen a term for, you know, this is six years or eight years or, or what. I think they're talking seven. Seven, yeah. So, you know... This this may be Notre Dame has enough with their sixty million dollar deal with Notre Dame, with NBC and their current playoff access structure, that may be enough to keep them independent for now for that seven years, and then by the time that next TV deal comes up, then maybe you know, then you've had a chance for some of the financial you know the financial gaps to grow a little bit more between the the haves and the have nots, and maybe it's a different conversation at that point. The other thing is if. Notre Dame joins the Big Ten, the price on this deal goes up. Like both, like everybody has to pay more. Now, right now, if it's three hundred fifty million to the Big Ten and sixty to Notre Dame, that, that's that's four hundred ten million, and, and you have Notre Dame. Say Notre Dame goes to the Big Ten and you still have to pay four hundred ten million, but now you no longer have Notre Dame. Like NBC is, you know, may want to pay up to keep NBC or to keep Notre Dame all by themselves. Whereas, like, if Notre Dame joins the ten, is are the, is that three hundred fifty million? Like, how much more is everybody paying at that point? Is it three hundred eighty million? And if so, do you want to pay just an extra thirty million to get Notre Dame all by yourself? And so, there, there's there's reasons for NBC to to pay up there. Kevin, I'm gonna give you a name. No, you no. asked. I'm going to give you a name of an old, for, maybe old, maybe not, a former Buckeye. You have to give me a year in which he played within three years, either way. The name. Colbert Edward, Candyman. <laughs> Edward F. Claggett. 
Well, Edward, uh, you know, Edward is kind of one of those timeless names that it's, you know, it's not like Filbert that you can kind of, you know, at least get it within decades. So, and, you know, it's not a case of where, you know, oh, well, you know, Clagett sounds like Clampett, sounds like, you know, the Beverly Hillbillies or whatever. Um, I'm going to say... 1947. 1904. You were very close. So he played from he played in 04, 06, and 07. You have failed. Tom, I hope you were not looking at your phone trying to pull up the historical rosters. I was not. <laughs> Trust me, I was not. Your name, Walter N. Claflin. Walter N. Claflin. See... Claggett feels so much older to me than Claflin. Claflin could be... I, I knew someone in high school whose last name was Claflin, so this could literally be like 1995. So it was not Walter. Uh, boy. So this is... I'm going to say 1923. Walter played from 1906 to 1908. I, I'm sorry. Uh, they were right next to each other in the alphabetical list here. Uh, and so both, both of you guys... Uh, Terrible job, terrible job. Um, oh, I just now now I'm just seeing Robert W. Butts, and I wish I would have seen that one before, but I missed it. Uh, 1960, by the way, it's 60 Bob. to 62 for Bob, Bob Butts. Bob Butts. Yeah. Summer of Love, 1962. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, uh, Gary K. I'm old school. I'm an old school football fan, and I want this year's team to have a tougher mentality on the line of scrimmage. Smash mouth on both sides, being able to get stops and getting the tough yards. And yeah, that's what everybody wants to see. The interior of both lines of scrimmage, the focus has been there. It sounds like there have been many bouts and the defensive line is holding their own. And is, is that a bad thing? Is that, is that a bad statement about the offensive line? That's, that's the fun of camp. You never really know. But I guess if it's if it's stalemate after stalemate, your offensive line isn't winning. And if your offensive line wins too much, now your defensive line is terrible. But I think the thing that I keep going back to, uh, Tom, is these guys have been hearing how soft they were. Both sides of the ball have been told how soft they were uh, for eight months now, and well, maybe even since uh, the November since since November since that Michigan game, they've been hearing about it. And maybe since that Oregon game, they've been hearing about it. So 11 months now, they've been told how soft they were. They weren't able really to do anything about it for uh, three months last year during the season. But they've spent the offseason focused on this new defense, defensive line doing some different things than they've done in the past. They have really set out to change this mentality and change the the opinions of others. Not that the opinions matter, but I, I think you'll be seeing some new opinions. Yeah, I, th I think you know you, you always talk guys talk in the program about shutting out the noise outside the program. So they're trying to they're trying not to hear that. But also, I, I'm guessing that people inside the building notice some of the same things that you noticed watching those games, and that has unquestionably been a a focus for them uh, during this off season. And you know that has been a focus for them during off season weight training. That's been a focus for them during camp. I feel like we've seen more physical play you know there was there last year there was a real talk about limiting you know number of exposures as it was the terminology that we've heard them use in the past and you know that you're trying to limit the number of hits people have the number of times people are taken to the ground that was a real point of emphasis for them you know in you know going into last season and we haven't heard a lot of talk about that i think they're still mindful of that but you're, you know, as you're sort of figuring out how to balance all of these different things, maybe some of the sliders are a little bit less on the limiting exposure side of things and a little bit more on the making sure guys are prepared for the season. Because you got to remember, you, you had that last year where there was all the talk about limiting exposures and not taking guys to the ground and doing all these drills that, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to actually tackle to teach someone to tackle and all that kind of stuff. But then the year before that, you had all the COVID stuff, which meant there was a lot less, you know, pre, you know, summer workouts and spring, you know, you didn't have spring ball except for a couple practices. And there was very limited contact because everyone's supposed to be spacing out. And so you don't have, you know, linemen blocking each other and all that kind of stuff during a lot of these practices. Even up to, you know, up to the prep, up to and including the prep for the national championship game, 
they had, I think, one full contact practice between the Sugar Bowl and the National Championship game, which is one of the reasons the National Championship game probably went the way it did. So, you know, you've had a couple years now where they have not been going quite as hard during practices in terms of physicality. I think the fact that that's maybe sort of changing a little bit this year, I think that's something that is probably going to be something you notice on the field this fall. Kevin, let's attack this Jay Patel question here. Uh, he's got to jump off at 12 for a Zoom. Which Buckeye rookies are you most excited about in the NFL? Who are you watching, Kevin? Um, I, you know, I really want to watch Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. I know that I'm, I'm kind of taking the top two guys right there, but you know, receiver is uh, one of these positions that it's really easy to kind of measure success. I mean, none of us are going to be able to watch the game and be like, oh, that was some excellent blocking throughout. But, but you know, with what I've heard coming out of Jets camp with, with Wilson – and certainly some of the tape that I've seen of Olave in New Orleans, I think those are the two guys that I'm most excited to watch. Yeah, those are the guys um, just to see how they develop and the the immediate impact that they make with, with their respective quarterbacks. Tom, you're not necessarily an NFL guy. <laughs> anybody I, anybody out there that you're looking at? I mean, th- those are kind of the two names because you had – I've. I saw have seen a lot of Chris Olave content coming out of the Saint uh, the New Orleans Saints social media account, and they just can't believe how how prepared Chris Olave is and how game ready he is. And it's like, yeah, man, have you did you not watch college football the last four years? It's kind of been that way for a while. And uh, with Garrett Wilson, I was very excited to see on uh, Tuesday night Garrett Wilson uh, retweeted a tweet about the New York Mets. So now that he's in New York, Garrett Wilson may be uh, maybe becoming a Mets fan. So. Uh, you know, that, that I think is definitely the big storyline to watch with him. Yes. Garrett Wilson now standing online somewhere waiting to get in. Saw Jeremy Rucker score a touchdown in one of the, uh, Jets practices or preseason games. So he's another one to, to watch there as well. Uh, Omar Austin, how much Hayden do we see with the loss of Evan Pryor? Um, Dallin Hayden has been doing pretty well in camp from all accounts, had a good scrimmage, was had a couple of long runs. But at this point, do you, you, you don't need him, but do you use him to keep the other guys fresh and healthy? And how soon do you go to him? Because he's a guy that well, first of all, he has to be able to hold on to the ball. He has to show that he's ready. He has to be game ready. You're not just going to put him out there if he's not game ready. So it could just be Mayan Williams and Travion Henderson for a while. But everything that we've heard, everything that uh, we've seen from Dallin Hayden himself, this guy's a professional. Like he's He comes from a running back family. His brother Chase has played in college for a few years. His dad, Aaron, was a college running back then in the NFL for a couple of years. So he, he speaks like – a professional football player, almost like he, this is just part of the process towards getting to his ultimate goal. So he's a focused guy. I would expect him to be fairly ready pretty quickly. And this is a guy who didn't come in in the spring, but I don't know that we'll see him at all in game one against Notre Dame. I think game two is where you start to see him. And and I don't know how much more you would see him than uh, last year. You know, there are they're like 40, 42 carries between Evan Pryor and Marcus Crowley. And then they're, they're the top three with Master Teague and, and, and Travion Henderson in my way. So it was a different top three than normal. But, I mean, are we thinking 50, 60, like 70 carries this year, Tom? Like, I don't, I don't know what to think. That sounds high when you say it. But mm-hmm. at the same time, he, you're not going to see him week one. I don't think I would expect to see Dallin Hayden with any kind of meaningful time on the field against Notre Dame. But I, I think they're going to have to give him those number three reps right now because you got to know what you have. You got to know, you know, what is can he hold up? Can he hang? Can he hang onto the football like you said? Can he handle all the blitz pickup and all the you know all that kind of responsibility? Because if you can't handle your blitz pickup, that's how you get a quarterback killed. And they don't want to get a quarterback killed because they don't have a ton of depth at quarterback this year either. So. You've got to be able to trust guys to do all that stuff. So you're going to see he's going to get more reps in the next couple of weeks just because of that. you got to know what you have. And then, you know, the second half of that Arkansas State game, I'm sure they're not going to want to have Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams taking a bunch of unnecessary hits if it's 56-3. to So you're going to see Dallin Hayden at that point. And if he can't, you know, if he can't do it, 
we've talked about other people. We've talked about Xavier Johnson potentially moving back to to running back from wide receiver. If Dallin Hayden, you know, just isn't ready, and it's a true freshman, he wasn't here for the spring, so it would not be outrageous for him to not be completely ready to go. Maybe you do see a Xavier Johnson. Maybe we've talked about Caleb Brown potentially moving over from, uh, you know, running back or wide receiver to running back, at least sort of temporarily to help things out. I think they would probably prefer to have it be someone like Xavier Johnson. You got other, got, uh, you know, Saunders, you got Caffey, you got other walk on running backs on the team. You need someone who can just kind of like do the minimum. Just make sure you're not going to get your quarterback killed. Hang on to the football. Don't make the second half, you know, if it's 56-3, don't be turning the ball over and making it, you know, just get the game over, get out the door. That's your goal as a uh, as a second half running back in those kind of games. I suggest just throw the ball a lot more with Kyle McCord and Devin Brown in the second half. Just do it that way. Just And then, a, like, hey, we would have loved to have run the ball and run off the clock. We don't have any running backs. This is what we had to do. This, this is how we have to survive. We're Ohio State. We have to do what we can. We can't – we can't be uh, as fortunate as everybody, like uh, Wisconsin and Illinois, to have eight running backs. Okay, Ryan Day very famously wanting to hang a hundred points on Arkansas State this year. We'll find <laughs> out if it happens. Don't want none, won't be none. Kevin from Derek Powell, my score prediction for Ohio State versus Notre Dame is fifty-two to fourteen. Ohio State wins. Your thoughts? That's a pretty big. Score gap there, 52-14. I mean, obviously, I think there's a lot of belief that Ohio State's going to be able to put up a lot of points on anybody. Um, you know, Notre Dame has certainly seen some injuries in uh, the receiving core. Uh, you know, a little bit of an unknown with Tyler Buckner at quarterback. Um, you know, they're having to kind of do some replacing in terms of at running back. I mean, how is you know how is Notre Dame going to score. Obviously, Michael Mayer is a tremendous player, top twenty, uh, you know, player in college football type. Um, you know, I my non-binding score at this point is forty-five twenty. All right, I'm I'm going to be conservative at this point, and then I think as we get closer to the game, I will become more brazen. But like the number that keeps coming into my head is like 34 20, but then I remember no, no field goals. So I'm thinking like 35 20. Uh, and this is a conservative on the Ohio State offense's part. And I don't know that we should be conservative, but Notre Dame does have defensive players too. So I'm, I, I if, if you look back and, and study, study the season openers, the Ohio state offense takes some time to, to really get rolling. And then the leaves questions like, Oh no, all of the hype that we were, we heard in, in, in fall camp is completely false, but eventually then, Oh, I guess they are scoring 48 points a game. So they must be pretty good. I'm saying non-binding at this point in 35, 20, but 35 might be too many. I don't know. I, I don't know enough about this Notre Dame defense just yet. I in my head it's like 38 17 you know in that kind of three touchdowns kind of range and you know 52 14 you say it and it sounds completely outrageous and then it's like there's a way it happens if Ohio State gets up I mean what are we talking about what what are Notre Dame's concerns on offense quarterback they've got Tyler Buckner and he's okay but it's not a proven deal there yet and you don't have the wide receivers really that you would want to have to match up with Ohio State and try and go you know, shot for shot with Ohio State. So if you're in a spot where you're sort of leaning on the areas of your team where there's a little less certainty, where, you know, you're you're putting you're putting a, uh, you know, a, a running team in a position where they've got to, you know, sort of stretch themselves a little bit. That's where you get mistakes. That's where you get turnovers. That's where you get quick three and outs. You get the ball back. You get a couple turnovers in short fields, all of a sudden it doesn't take that much to get from 38 to 52. It's just a couple extra scores. So you get a couple turnovers. There's a way that Ohio State just annihilates them. I don't. I definitely don't think that's the most likely outcome here. I think I'm, I'm you know, more in that 30-something to high teens, low 20s kind of range is what I'm expecting. But... You could you could see them get run off the field, and and you know there might be a little bit of uh, 
you know, an urge to change the narrative around this team, perhaps. And, you know, that th- they've heard they've heard that they're soft for so long and they lost to Michigan and, uh, you know, they lost their big non-conference game last year. Oh, boy, you know, is Ohio State a little bit of a paper tiger and was Ryan Day born on third and, all, and just... You could you could see them just kind of, you know, if the if the pe- if they really keep the pedal down, it could be, you know, fifty two fourteen is not out of the realm of possibility. By the way, thirty uh, something to high teens. Also, the synopsis of Dazed and Confused. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I like this one from Adam Baker. Jackson Smith and Jigba more in the backfield on third downs with Evan Pryor out. While I don't expect him to run the ball. We did see him in the backfield against Utah, and they've borrowed some stuff from Alabama that they did with Devontae Smith where um, you just move the guy all around and he's a complete pain, and sometimes the middle linebacker ends up on him, and now you, boom, you've got a first down, and oh, there he goes, another 30 yards down the field. So I I am interested interested to see how much more of that they do this year and just moving him around, finding matchups. And as they're doing all of this, then they just throw the ball down the field to like Emeka Buka, Julian Fleming, and Marvin Harrison, and it's like, hope you enjoyed all of the 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 show while we were going for the dough. Uh, Kevin, do you think we see him more in the backfield this year, or, or like, I don't think he's going to carry the ball, but you know, what do you think? Yeah, I'm sitting here kind of doing multiple things at once. Uh, That's why I went to you. I'm trying to like get, lock you in and, and with with, you. With, the, with the launch of the site, trying to trying to sort a couple things out there. Um, I can you know, go to Tom. Yeah, although he to, looks busy now too. <laughs> go, go, go to Tom while I and I'll listen, and then I'll just say no, just to disagree with him. Sorry, I was looking at my phones with something related to the launch of the site. Sorry, Is my, my brain just my brain lost. just filters you out. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. That's would you like to that. repeat the question? <laughs> wow. Um, no. Would we'll you like go to, on. Would you no. like to answer the question yourself, and then I can tell you if you're wrong? See, the problem is I already did. Mm. That tells you how, how little you were listening. But yes, <laughs> BuckeyeHuddle.com, BuckeyeHuddle.com, now live. You can go there. You can register. You can become a, a paying member and uh, and enjoy all of the fruits of our labor. Graham Devine, do you think the Wisconsin game will be a night game? I will be shocked if it isn't, but that is also up to Wisconsin and Ohio State because that's four weeks into the season. It should be the night game, but it, 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 there's, there's a couple of other games that aren't as big but could become bigger than that one based on the wins and losses but i am expecting that one to be a night game that one as uh tv decides is that gonna be like a 12 day prior kevin is that right like 12 days and then then it's like, like it's six like days 12 and six or the other way this that, won't be a six day i don't think this will be I a 12 day either no so i would expect in, in like a couple of two like two weeks before kickoff for that one to be named a night game. Uh, let's see here. Yes, Nick Stamen. Do you really see more than ten defensive linemen playing in meaningful snaps? I think ten is the number, um, and we can go through because you get you've got five defensive ends that are going to play, and that's Zach Harrison, Tyler Friday, Javante Jean Baptiste, Jack Sawyer, and JT Tuiamolo. Those five are going to play just like they did last year. Expect the sophomores to to get more reps than they did last year. Defensive tackle, you've got three nose tackles with Jerron Cage and Ty Hamilton and Mike Hall. You've got two three techs that are going to play and Tyleek Williams and Teron Vincent. The third one might be like Jaden McKenzie, Hero Canoe. Like I don't I don't see them getting in there yet. Larry Johnson on two days ago, whatever today is, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday. I forget which day it was. Monday, maybe. Tuesday, maybe. doesn't matter. Said that on a, when he, on a lucky day, they'll be able to play 12. I think most days it's going to be 10, and then depending if it's a blowout, 12, 13, 14. But the, the 10, ga- 10 guys I just I laid out there for you, I think those guys will play every game. And it just depends on, you know, there will be some games where Javante Jean-Baptiste maybe has like 11 reps and some days where he has like 25. But, uh, Tom, if, if you are able to speak now, it's it's 10 for me. That's that's the baseline. And I think I don't know that it's ever going to go lower than that. I think those 10 play every single game barring injuries. I, I think you're right there. I think that's a that's a good number because you, you've got a very solid two deep across there. That gets you to eight. 
Mike Hall is, uh, you know, the third string nose. If you ask, uh, if you ask Kevin Wilson and definitely not the third string, if you ask, uh, if you ask Larry Johnson, they've been taught, you know, they're talking about running three guys at Jack. They're talking about, I mean, there's just, there's enough depth there and there's enough young talent there that with guys like Caden Curry, that you're not going to keep those guys off the field. If Hero Canoe is ready, you're going to play him at least four games. If Caden Curry is ready, you're going to play him at least four games. And and that's where you go maybe from higher than 10 to, you know, 12 or so. Because you might, you know, you might, if you're looking at Caden Curry as someone who's not going to be a five-year guy, there's no real sense in redshirting him. So, yeah, I I, I think 10 is a very reasonable uh, thing to do on the, you know, expectation for that defensive line. Because they that's something that, you know, you go back to Nick Bosa. There were plenty of games where Nick Bosa was playing 30 snaps. And it's like, why would you ever take Nick Bosa off the field? Well, because you keep him fresh. You keep him fresh for the game. You keep him fresh for the season. You keep him healthy. And that that has kind of been a Larry Johnson thing for a long time. And they have the depth there to do it this year. So I don't see any reason why they wouldn't do it this year. Yeah. Uh, question from David Whalen. Please elaborate on confidence in the Ohio State offense, given the 27 and 28 points against Oregon and Michigan last year. It's a new year. Uh, players are older, except for the receivers. Um, you know that that first game against Oregon, they just failed on some fourth downs. Brand new quarterback playing his first game, throwing his first passes ever. I think that's a wash. Um, so I, I I wouldn't expect anything. I don't take that Oregon game into this year, as you guys <laughs> read just a, a tremendous comment there. Um, but I, I do think there there are some I don't want to say concerns, but they are going to have to run the ball against tough defenses. Uh, they should be able to as well as anybody else. I mean, it's never going to be easy to run the ball against good defenses, but I think this is a, an offense that is going to score in the 40s again. It's going to be 45, 46 points a game, like it was last season. And sometimes you run up against a defense that. You know, picks the right plays, like just like as a, as they say, M go blog. It's like rock paper scissors of you guessed right this time. Sometimes defenses guess right. Sometimes defensive lines win. Now this is an offensive line at Ohio State. Maybe more uh, should be more adept at running between the tackles. They've had some issues so far in camp, but again, is that the defensive line? Is that or is that the offensive line? Um, I think if your concerns are. The Oregon of last year, like that game is like it's a different team. If your concern is the Michigan defense, it's a different defense this year. So I, I think um, find new concerns. <laughs> Basically, like find other areas. Why? Why did? Why? Why Nebraska? Like why the struggles? Why rushing for ninety yards against Nebraska last year? Why did that happen? Um, because like, that shouldn't happen. So I, I think mm-hmm. there there are some concerns there, uh, but not major. Uh, let's let me read this in my mind before I read it out loud. You don't remember writing it. <laughs> this is from uh, obviously Tony Gerdeman's burner account. Tom, how hard is it knowing that Tony has to carry every show that you both do together? Well, I mean, sometimes I do the morning show and then I have to kind of drive the show there. So, I mean, I guess I guess the question is how are we defining carrying the show? Is it you know when we do the morning you know we do the bold prediction shows, is Tony's just constant harping and complaining? Is that carrying the show? I mean it's just it's filling the you know it's filling the audio space I guess with just just constant high pitched whine I I suppose I don't know if I would consider that carrying the show. So we may have an issue with sort of defining terms here is is what I'm thinking. One one. Uh bicker i will have is that i don't just carry the shows that you and i are on i also carry the shows that the three of us are on so like let's let's get that part correct as well as kevin does something else entirely other than this show uh working on who knows what making dinner plans um I making lunch plans I uh, wish. Hey, if somebody would like to dump to 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 jump off one of you want to jump off for lunch or or whatever <laughs> Feel free. I know I could have typed that in our private chat, but I'm trying to remain focused and do one thing at a time here. Kevin, why don't you go ahead and dip us to a two two shot, and we'll uh, we'll I'll I'll can I'll carry Tony, 
uh, we'll, and I'll go through. I'll go through the starred comments, and uh, we'll. I was going to say, I, I'll be back in five minutes. I'm just working on something, and then I'll be right back. All right, All right. sounds good. As long as you provide absolutely no detail on what you're working on, that's that's perfect. Let's just move now, on with the show. Here's the problem, Tom. You have not been listening, so I have. A, I have. You're not even going to know which questions we've already addressed because you've not been paying attention to the show. <laughs> Uh, that's arguably true, but also I will work from the, uh, oh, he starred all the ones and they have, we've gone through all the starred ones, Kevin noon. And then he Kevin leaves this me. comment up there. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I have been working on other things. All right. So the, uh, you know, Lisa Sims, the re <laughs> says the recent Ohio state lost both games last year because the defense was horrible last season. And, you know, I think the two questions, the two games they lost, the Oregon game and the, the Michigan game, to go back to the question from earlier, yes, they had 27 and 28 points. There were some extenuating circumstances, and I'll start saying this and everyone goes, stop making excuses, but here are the extenuating circumstances. Number one, C.J. Stroud had a semi-serious shoulder injury that, that Oregon game, and they were not able to run the ball in the Oregon game. And they, so then you're relying on C.J. Stroud, and C.J. Stroud, is, remember C.J. Stroud constantly doing the chicken wing thing with his arm? It was to the point where he sat out a game a couple weeks later against Acre to, to rest it. And then he looked like a completely different quarterback at the end of the year. So you're not getting, you know, 11th of September 2021 C.J. Stroud this year. You're getting another year of experience Heisman finalist C.J. Stroud. So that's, that's, I think, one piece of it. They had all sorts of guys who were sick the week of the Michigan game. You know, it's a little like the... Um, a little like the uh, week Ezekiel Elliott had the leg injury the week of the Michigan State game, and then it's like, well, why did Ezekiel Elliott only get 11 carries and, uh, you know, look terrible on, you know, they couldn't, well, there were a lot of guys sick, and it was snowing, and it was windy, and when you were a pass-based offense, because they weren't able to run the ball particularly well last year, when you were a pass-based offense, well, snow, wind, guys being sick, all of that stuff will, will work against you now set aside all that stuff that you want to call excuses or not. The fact that they were, you know, to Lisa's point, the defense, the defense was an issue in both of those because the defense is not getting off the field and the defense is not setting the offense up with short fields. And the defense is, you know, the offense is standing on the sideline watching and they're fall, you know, the, you're giving up touchdowns, you're falling behind. If the defense is getting you off the field and getting the ball at mid feet, you know, getting the ball where they, you know, they get the ball in the 25 and they punt it to you and you start your drive on your own 45, well, it makes it a lot easier to score than if you're getting the ball deep in your own end. So th there was a lot of stuff that went into both of those losses last year and not all, you know, the, we haven't talked about the offensive line yet and we probably need to talk about the offensive line because the, the injury of the offensive line last year was an issue. The four tackles line up and a first time starter at center you had some issues in the interior of that offensive line. I think it's going to be better this year. We've, you know, we've sort of talked about a couple times and hinted around the fact that the interior of the offensive line is not having a great time in practice, but you're also going up against good defensive tackles. So we're really not going to know for sure is that, wow, this is an incredible Ohio State defensive line, or wow, this is a really, you know, this is a, there are issues on the Ohio State offensive line. You're really not going to know that until that Notre Dame game kicks off. If they're running the ball up the middle against Notre Dame, well, that's probably a good sign for both the offense and the defense at that point. But, I, you know, I think there's enough reasons for optimism that I would not view the, you know, the games that were kind of capped in the high 20s last year for Ohio State as any kind of a ceiling for this year's team. Yeah, and another thing to keep in mind about that interior of the Ohio State defensive line, Jerron Cage is a sixth-year guy. Jerron Vincent is a fifth-year guy. These are like mid 20 year olds basically like 22 23 these guys have been around for a long time they're experienced at this point they're just bigger and stronger than some of the young guys and, and donovan jackson is still just a sophomore and i think he's going to be fine matt jones he's a fifth year guy as well been around for a long time but still getting into the groove of being an everyday guy and performing every day like an everyday guy because that was that was a criticism of his and for the past couple of years he doesn't do it consistently enough and that's he said that that's not a criticism from outside that's criticism from the coaches and that's something that they would tell the media as well to to let you know how open they are with letting him know like you've got to do it every single play you, you there are no loafs nothing like that like you've got to can't take any snaps off so that so that's something that 
he is working on. And then Luke Whipler, this is his second year. I expect him to be one of the best in the Big Ten, should be one of the best in the nation. But it's it's a lot easier for a defensive line to gel than it is for an offensive mm-hmm. line to gel. So this is part of that gelling process. And as you know, Tom, if you stick a, a spoon in that jello before it has set, what are you eating? Kool-Aid. <laughs> you are eating Kool-Aid, the 2022 Ohio State football story. Man, this is going to be the best season highlight video ever. Uh, speaking of the best things ever, uh, we should probably remind people, hey, why, why are these two idiots talking for two hours and 20 minutes and counting right now? Well, friends, it is the launch of BuckeyeHuddle.com today, our brand new website. Uh, please go check it out. We uh, have had sort of the just the board piece of it live for a couple weeks, just to sort of let, you know, give us a place to do stuff and uh, give us a place to hang out with you guys and uh, share some of, you know, you kind of get a, an idea what you're getting as a member of the site. You know, Alex Gleitman's ADEC column, Mark Givler's uh, Skull Session column, the insight and analysis and the X's and O's from Ross Fulton and Devin Radcliffe and Justin Willatch, Tony's coverage, my coverage, Kevin's coverage of the team, all that stuff. It's all at BuckeyeHuddle.com right now. This site is live right now. We have, uh, I, when I got distracted earlier, I was looking at a text that was like, oh boy, we're picking up members pretty quickly. That's pretty good. So uh, it is, a, I think, a thing that people have been waiting for for quite a while and uh, people are pretty excited about and we're pretty excited about. So uh, you should go check that out. And, you know, if you have not been a member of a pay site before, one of the things is, uh, you know, I mean, the community, you see the community here in the comments of these shows it, you get that same kind of community piece at uh, in the on the on the board at uh, Buckeye Huddle. Lots of people who have uh, known each other, been talking to each other about football for quite a while. It is the price of a lousy chain store pizza every month, so it is really not you know it, it's really not that much money, and you get you will get a lot of uh, a lot of insight, a lot of knowledge out of it, a lot of uh, you know hey if you work in an office like might mm, kill some time on uh, you know say, a Wednesday afternoon to uh, be hanging out and uh, talking Ohio State football on the board. Maybe during learn lunch something. only. During lunch, lo- absolutely. All the time. All the time. Uh, yeah, it's, it is, uh, I think, if you haven't done it before, we have a month-to-month option. Give it a try. Uh, see if you like it. And that first month is going to include the uh, all the rest of fall camp, the lead-up to the Notre Dame game, the all the coverage after the Notre Dame game, uh, this next week against Arkansas State. So there's there's a lot of stuff that you will get to try in that month. And if you don't like it, it's fine. It's not for it's, if it's not for you, that's not for you. But uh, definitely worth worth a try. Give it a try today at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Tony. Yeah, to- one of the things I always like is when something gets like news is, is broken or discussed, or somebody writes something up on the board that everybody just loves and and you have comments like, well, I just paid for my subscription. Like that, that was, that was worth the cost of my subscription right there. And that happens all the time. And and then it's just like, well, just remember that. Like <laughs> if, if, if we go a couple of days without something that is not worth your sub- subscription, we've already banked it. Like, <laughs> you know, like the content has already been banked, but no, um, it, it's, it, it we're like like we are here with you we are there on the board as well not right now because we're here <laughs> um which is i don't know if there, there's is it is, the, is it foolish to be doing a live stream on youtube while the site has been launched and and you know we're trying to be in two places at once i am not i am with the, you not you the, tom you this is the advantage of having a site with like eight staff members is we can all be doing this. And then there's other people doing stuff on the board. And, you know, I mean, this is, I think one thing that uh, if you have been watching these shows, we get a lot of recruiting questions on here. And, you know, I mean, we follow recruiting. We, you know, that's not what we really do. We, we know what's going on. But the reason we know what's going on is because we work with incredibly smart and plugged in people like Mark Givler and Alex Gleitman who tell us, here's what's going on. And we go, hmm, okay, yes. And then when you ask us a question, we can go, yes. I will knowledgeably tell you a thing that I definitely learned on my own and not through talking to anyone else. And, you know, same thing with the scheme stuff. When we talk, when you're asking us scheme questions, it's like, yes, well, good news. I have a smart football friend. His name is Ross Fulton. And he tells me, he tells me the words to say out of my mouth. And then, uh, and then I know, and then I'm smart. And guess what? You can have a smart football friend too. And you can have a friend that is uh, plugged in with recruiting and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's the advantage of a community like that is 
you know, Tony, Kevin, and I have a pretty good sense for what's going on with the current team. And then you've got the recruiting people and you've got the scheme people. And, you know, it ends up being a, a pretty uh, good and well-rounded community. And you end up being a much more informed and smarter Ohio State football fan. And going into a season when uh, it's probably going to be a pretty good Ohio State season, I think, is uh, not a not an outrageous statement. Uh, probably probably a good time to be uh, a little more interested and involved. It feels, feels like a season you're going to want to uh, be as plugged in as you can. I would like Ross to be my smart football friend, but he does not return my texts. So if you could... <laughs> If I could send you a text that you could forward to him, mm -hmm. is that something we could do? I don't think the issue is that he's not getting the text, if that's what you're thinking, if that's what you're implying there. I, don't, I, don't, I feel like he would have responded if, if he was. But I, mm. I don't want to speak for him, you know, but whatever. If you say he's friendly, I, I guess I'll take your word for it. Um, kind of standoffish to me, personally. <laughs> uh, but... Um, how about this one from David Potts? Speaking of things, speaking of changing the subject, David Potts wants to know: Any of you guys feel superstitious about night games? I don't know if I feel superstitious about night games, but as someone who ends up uh, being at the stadium until like three in the morning for night games, I don't particularly care for night games. I don't know if that counts as superstitious or not. The not superstitious, but concern of night games on the road of being locked in the stadium—that is a legit concern. <laughs> You know, like the iron gates, the, the iron fence all around, and Lucas Oil is, is uh, has some. There's like only one or two ways to get out, and sometimes those are not available. But I don't know if you're if you do this long enough, you will have been locked in a stadium at some point, and you, these night games were there until you guys know all hours, and you, you it's. It is a concern, definitely. That is the superstition there. You know what I? You know what we should start doing is like, um, like taping open some latches or something as we go into a stadium, so that that latch will still be open. Like we can we can force it open on the way out, or like I don't know, bringing a, a large coat that we can throw over a, a the barbed wire of some sort of fence that we have to climb over. But yeah, that is. Not, I have no superstitions about night games. I do have a concern about being locked in, and it's 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 a legit concern because it gets cold at night. Once you walk out the door, sometimes you can't get back in. You can't go out, and then it's like not till next morning when somebody finds you. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember you're talking, and I'm thinking I, I know I remember being we weren't actually like locked in the stadium that we couldn't get out, but there was at least a couple in the last like five six years where we've been walking around in circles and trying to find uh, an exit. I know we had uh, photographers we were with in 2018, I think for the TCU game who I think walked in circles and couldn't find the exit from oh, Jerry God. world. <laughs> the most memorable trip in the history of college football media. Yes. Uh, it's, it is, it is a real, uh, a real adventure. Cause when you come in, it's like well-marked media entrance and you, you, you come in and there's signs and there's people there waiting to check you in and all that kind of stuff. And then you're walking out and it's like, all of these doors are closed with well, nothing. There's no signs. I don't know where, you know, and, there, and and it's not like media parking lot this way. There's no signage. You're just kind of, and you know, stadiums we go to every two years or every six years in the case of some big 10 West stadiums or stadiums we've never been to in the case of some non-conference stadiums. Yeah. You can have, you can have, and it's generally like you're completely fried at the end of a 12 or 13 hour work day your brain is completely shot. Sometimes you get to drive to like Altoona, Pennsylvania after that, and you're already dreading that. And it's like, uh, which side of the stadium did we come in? Because when we got here, I was so excited to finally be here that I wasn't really paying attention. And like, where did we park the car? And you're just kind of driving around, you know, walking around honking, the, trying to honk the uh, honk the horn with the uh, remote remote clicker for the car. So anyway, so yeah, night games are terrible. They should play a bunch of noon kickoffs. I know, I know you guys all hate them, but for us, noon kickoffs. The other concern is the night games at Purdue, not just losing, but getting out of the stadium before the shuttle stops going to the parking lot that is like a mile away. And by shuttle, I mean golf cart, golf cart. So that, that is also a, a, a bit of a superstition, if you will. But that was the only thing that went wrong that night. So other than that, it was a fine trip. What a, what a, what a fantastic trip. Yes. Uh, Sue, uh, do you think we can get the O-line fixed before Notre Dame or is it going to be a longer term problem? How do we fix it? I don't, 
I don't think it's a problem or something that needs to be fixed. I think it's just something that will get better as it goes on, like like the offense did last year, like the defense – well, not the defense. Like the defense will this year and good defenses do. I think it's just a matter of gelling and, and you try to get that done in camp. But as they say, um, you know, the, the, the improvement from game one to game two. And, yes, I bet they will look a lot better from game one to, to game two going from the Notre Dame defense to the Arkansas State defense – but I, you know, they don't need to be the best they're going to be at Notre Dame against Notre Dame. They better not be the best they're going to be against Notre Dame. They need to be the best they're going to be each successive week. And and you don't want to top out in game one. Uh, and, to, and keep in mind, like you can lose this game, and either team either team can lose this game, and they're still going to be in the playoff fun as long as they do everything else they're going to have to do. But I think the offensive line will be good enough. And really, even if they're not able to run the ball, as long as they're keeping C.J. Stroud upright, that's going to be seventy percent of the battle won right there. Yeah, they they don't have to be perfect. I think with having a better defense this year, you don't have to be nearly as perfect on offense as you did before. And you know, you've got the, the passing game should be, I think, more consistent throughout the season. It was pretty pretty darn good at the end of the season when it wasn't snowing sideways, but. You should be. It should be pretty solid, I think, throughout the course of the year this year. So, you know, it, it's a concern. We've talked before about Ohio State kind of having, having rich person problems, where it's like, yeah, the wine fridge on my yacht is running a couple degrees warm. It's like, I mean, I guess that's a problem, but it's not. It's, it's not like it's not like I can't make the rent this month kind of problems. Like, you know, programs have different kind of problems. Ohio State and UMass have different kinds of problems right now, and and. You know, there is no one there. If you go on any Alabama forum right now, I'm sure there are all sorts of Alabama people telling you why Alabama is doomed to lose four games this fall because of whatever. Uh, you know, the the, the third string uh, strong safety has a hangnail and they're doomed. I mean, it's just you you spend a lot of times thinking about your team, and therefore you nitpick your team a lot more than you nitpick other teams. And you can't, you know, it's kind of like, well, I mean, yes, they don't have any scholarship quarterbacks, but I'm like, they'll figure it out. You kind of like hand wave other people's problems away. There is a reason Ohio State is number two in the polls and kind of considered the only team that's sort of in that Alabama tier right now. So, yeah, it does. There, there are issues. They are not a finished product right now. You're never the same team week 12 that you are week one. And, you know, usually that means you've gotten substantially better, which is the sign of a good season. But, I mean, look at, like, the 2014 Ohio State team. The uh, I've told this story on the podcast before, but I took my daughter to the Indiana game in 2014. And that was the week before the Michigan game. And uh, when we walked out of the stadium, she was, like, three or four at that point. And uh, she, you know, she was, and it was cold and it was an icy day. And so we left in the middle of the third quarter. And as we walked out in the third quarter, Ohio State was losing to Indiana, like, 21 to 20. And I got to tell you, as I was walking out of that stadium, I did not think, you know what this team's about to do in like six weeks? National championship. Absolutely. This is this is where this season is going. This team that is losing to Indiana right now. You develop over the course of the season. If you get better, that's when you have the really good memorable seasons. If you don't develop, that's when you have, you know, last last year's team kind of plateaued in some ways. And, you know, the issues that they had, they didn't overcome. And then you have a season that you know, is only a Rose Bowl championship season. Like, you know, that, that that's what constitutes failure for Ohio State right now as well. They won the Rose Bowl, but, um, and so that's, uh, you know, it, it, that is sort of the spectrum of Ohio State seasons at this point. Like, do they just win the Rose Bowl or do they win the national championship? And it feels like the problems that they're, we're talking about right now and the scale of the problems we're talking about right now are probably more on the, uh, you know, the, the up upside of that spectrum than the lower side. Uh, real quick, I will uh, remind everyone, please uh, hit that thumbs up button if you're watching right now, and uh, also hit that bell, get notified every time we post a new video. This will probably not be the last time we go live uh, during the course of the fall. We have some uh, big stuff planned for this. Those 13-hour game days that we were talking about working, uh, there's probably going to be some uh, live pregame shows, live postgame shows, that kind of stuff. So uh, make sure you're subscribed to this uh, this channel. Hit that bell, get notified. Thumbs up on uh, all these videos that you're watching. That just all helps us reach reach new people as we uh, work to rebuild our audience on YouTube. How you doing, Tom? I'm good. I'm uh, two and a half hours in, and it's like, I was trying to remember, we did a show after the Rose Bowl in our hotel by LAX. Three hours? 
I was trying to remember how long it was, and yeah, I felt like it was three hours, and I couldn't remember if it was three or three and a half or something like that, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're two and a half hours in, and it's like, boy, it feels like we just, you know, if you told me we're an hour and a half in, I wouldn't, uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have uh, thought, like, that doesn't sound right. I'm starting to get a sore throat myself. It might just be all the water. <laughs> um, I might have to switch to, like, chocolate milk or something like that, you know, to, to help me out. Um, but yeah, do, doing all right, doing all right. Uh, thank you, thank you for asking. By the way, Tom, thank you for asking how I am doing. I don't recall. Uh, mm. uh, obviously, Tony Gurdam's birder count says maybe Tom should buy Tony lunch. Well, we're not together today, so I can't really do that. So I, I, mean, I guess you could DoorDash something, but yeah. You know. eh. What's your account? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's Tom, see. you're I'm leading just, the show now, all right? So go. Uh, yes, I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling through. Uh, I'm scrolling through some Wait, of the. Uh... What, one other thing. Um, remember, like 15 minutes ago, when Kevin was like, "I'll be back in five minutes." Mm-hmm. Do we all remember that? Does everybody mm-hmm. remember that? That was that was Eastern. That was he was on Central Time. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> I'm almost done. I'm almost. <laughs> what do you th- do? You think Kevin's just been sitting there and just watching us the whole time, just like, man, these guys are so fun to watch when I don't have to so talk. This is, this good. is best. This is good. Agreed. The show is better when you're not here, Tony. I'll why would you say that? Good. That's not cool. Come on, man. That's not cool. I also like you. You're telling people to, uh, if you're watching this, you know, hit the thumbs up. Mm-hmm. No. What do you mean mm-hmm. if? Well, I yes, I mean yeah, I mean well, I don't want to assume. I, there, there have been times when I've been busy doing other things, so maybe they're not. Maybe they're busy doing other things. I don't know. But you're, you're, you're streaming, so like you are mm-hmm. part of it, and yes, you are not listening, or you are not watching. I, I'm a little concerned about the tone of the comments here, Roger Smith. Tom, you should buy Tony lunch because you're such a nice guy. JWL11. I, think, I do think it's alarming that Tom hasn't bought lunch for Tony yet today. I'm feeling a little, I'm a little, feeling a little ganged up on here. I don't know. I do like uh, Steve Buckles. Uh, it's not superstitious; it's semi-stitious. <laughs> there you go. Yes, uh, yeah. At least the Simpsons says um, sounds like you guys are going to be busy Labor Day weekend. It's a night game if you don't get done till uh, three or four in the morning. Yes, and I have something I need to be at in Columbus at ten a.m. on sun- Sunday. So we should be. Uh, I should be in uh, great physical condition at that point. So that'll be fun. Um, um, yes. <laughs> this from obviously Tony Gerdeman's burner account. Wow, Tony has so many insightful takes. Tom is obviously an elite company. He should feel honored. Um, I don't want to speak for you, Tom. Mm-hmm. Do you feel honored? Mm, I mean, is honor and ob- are honor and obligation the same thing? I mean, it feels like it's sort of maybe related. Start with the same letter. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, you're my favorite obligation. Um, Kevin, at some point, we'll have to come in and uh, check out some of the comments. There were a few we weren't going to read there. Um, very voluminous commenter. Hopefully, they hit the thumbs up button as well. Uh, it is interesting uh, going to the uh, game on the third. Any recommendations for food before the game? Uh, let's see. What's a good? Uh, well, let's see. What's a good recommendation for food? I guess the question is where. Number one, where in where in town are you staying? Because are you on campus? Are you elsewhere in Columbus? And uh, what what kind of food do you like? Because, you know, I mean, we can we can send you to, uh, you know, Roosters, which is just north of campus. And it's like a f- perfectly fine place to go get lunch uh, after we do interviews or something like that. But, uh, you know, are you interested in, in, in something else? Are you interested in pizza? Would you like recommendations on pizza? Because I have I have campus pizza recommendations. Uh, Tony, you I think everyone the default answer on campus pizza is Adriatico's. I'm going to go. um uh, Hound Dogs Pizza on North Campus, which is, it is a box of regret, but it is delicious. It is, it is the, you know, the, the grease just goes right through the pizza box and, uh, you can get it smoke and Joe style, which is like a spicy sauce and like a garlic butter on the, uh, on the crust. It is delightful. It is fantastic. It is about 8,000 calories for just a regular old pizza. But, uh, yeah, there, I mean, Columbus is a, what, the 10th biggest city in the country or something like that. So depending on what you want, if you want, if you want fancy, there's all sorts of fancy stuff. There's, uh, all sorts of new kind of bistro stuff in the short North. And if you go down to the arena district, there's stuff down there. It's kind of, kind of whatever you want. I don't get to campus enough to just hang out. Mm -hmm. Game days, it's you get there early and you leave late and I don't want to 
don't want to deal with the crowds on a game day. You know, that's that's a, a thing that, you know, that's just one of my hangups. But, yeah, and like what, whatever you need, Columbus has in all facets, in uh, highways, in food, in uh, just two, just those two things. It's, you know, you got some good highways, you got some good food. But, yeah, um, I think Friday night in Columbus is that, that weekend – is going to be a busy place. Downtown will be busy. Campus will be hopping. And if you're just looking to go people watch, mm-hmm. you always got the short north. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, it, there's almost there's a bunch of breweries around um, that are that are great. Land Grant is down kind of in the uh, sort of Franklinton area, sort of west of downtown. That's a good. That's always a good spot to hit. Uh, but you know you can you can find breweries just about anywhere in Columbus at this point. If you're around campus, uh, there are you know campus bars where you're going to go and you're going to feel very old. Uh, you you do need to go to the beer stube at some point. Beer stube is on South Campus, which uh, I just saw something on their Instagram where uh, you know whatever used to be right next to the beer stube and I, can't, I think it was just a little carry out or something uh, is now an enormous condo. So the beer stube is like the um, the story of uh, the little house who, uh, you know, turn, you know, is, is a little house out in the country and then big city gets built up around it. That's kind of the beer stube right now. One of the last places that is exactly the same as it was when I was in school, as it is now uh, on North Campus. There's a few there's some a few choices up there. Uh, Varsity Club is sort of the uh, the classic on North Campus where I feel like you're not going to run into a lot of students. But on a Friday night, it's probably going to be kind of really hopping with uh, alumni and fans and all that kind of stuff. Outer end, probably to where, like, oh, it's mostly yeah. students, but you have to be 21 to get in. But also, us olds have, you know, a, a fondness for that place, and we'll go back to it. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, with the, with the swallows of Capistrano, you know, that sort of thing where it's like, <laughs> or lemmings off of a cliff. Whichever analogy you prefer, whichever su- suits your drinking style best. We we are very much the buzzards to Hinkley. That's we are not the swallows to Capistrano. No, but yes, that is that is uh, the outer end is another good one, and you know it just kind of it depends on what are you what are you looking for because the outer end is loud, the outer end is crowded. Uh, you will get uh, you will but get you have beer outdoor on, on bo- you do both the front yes. and the back. Yes, you do. You will get you will definitely get beer spilled on you there. It's just sort of you know what is it what what exactly type of atmosphere are you looking for? Are you looking for a college bar atmosphere or are you looking for uh, you know a little bit more of a uh, you know a little bit more of a you know sophisticated brew pub type of uh, place? I remember back in back in my day when I was a student at the old Panini's R.I.P. I believe it is no longer there, but doing a, a script Ohio in the bar with like. I don't know, 40 of us uh, to impress the Missouri fans that were on hand. Like, we'll show you what a college town is. Look what we do. We march around a bar and uh, and play some music. Um, good times had by all. Also, plenty of hound dogs back then, too. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Outer end before the game is superb, says Silver Bullet. Land Grant with Ray Ray's Barbecue. That's a good choice. Uh, oh, Sue has work at the Ohio Craft Museum on 5th. Which I assume is East Fifth. It must be East of High. Mm, maybe, uh, maybe not. I'm trying to remember. Um, yes, and uh, yeah, Brewsters and Adriaticos. So, all right. So we are we are very much speaking his language. So that's good. We are we are recommending things very much in his wheelhouse. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, Adriaticos is is a, is a good place. Um, I think it was Dallin Hayden, maybe, or it was. I think recently this week. You know, back in our day, it. it Paying for Adriaticos in college was not something that we really did because it was more of an expensive place, especially when you've got all of the bargain Papa John's, Gumby's, Hound Dog, whatever, for like five or six bucks. But this NIL stuff today, these kids today can pay for whatever pizza they want. And uh, see, the, the, the trip Adriaticos was on Mondays, they had the Buckeye pizza, which was like the size of a coffee table. And it was the thicker crust. It wasn't the New York style. It was kind of a thicker crust, square cut pizza. We used to get those and uh, have on uh, whatever the professional wrestling show du jour was on those mm-hmm. Monday nights. And it was like 16, 18 bucks. Now I'm sure it's like $57. But, you know, back back in the uh, back in the 90s, it was like 16, 18 bucks for like a big pizza that you could basically have half of the half of the dorm floor eat off of. So you just all threw in a couple bucks. And uh, that was uh 
Them's was good eats, as we said in the uh, more learned days of uh, the 1990s. Kevin, can you take us back to a two-shot, please? <laughs> so right now, hit the thumbs up button. Let Kevin know what you think of the show without Kevin. Yeah. Kevin, <laughs> no, please don't. Come back. <laughs> Um, let, let's, let's answer some questions. Um, Tom, here's one from Preston D. Kevin, come on back. Come on back. I have to make a phone call then I'll be right back. <laughs> what does it say he's been doing for the last <laughs> 27 minutes of his five minute break? Oh, now yeah. I have to do something. Yes. I'm back. Oh, I gotta go. Uh, Preston D the most dangerous game on the schedule, not named Notre Dame. Tom, I might also include not named Michigan. Yeah, if you're not if you're not including Notre Dame and you're not including Michigan, you're really talking about uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, Penn State, probably Michigan State. I mean, it's one of those four. I don't know that any of those jump out to me as like extremely dangerous games. If Wisconsin was in Madison, okay, I, I think that would be the answer, but it's not. If uh, you know, if Iowa was in Iowa City. That's a you know you have seen things go go poorly for Ohio State and Iowa City before, but it's not Michigan State. I don't I don't really know what to think about Michigan State this year. They they come in, you know they they lost some of the big player big names from last year, like very obviously did not match up well with Ohio State last year. So maybe the Penn State game if it was a whiteout maybe I just I don't think there's any of those. Outside of the two that you mentioned, I don't think there's anything that I look at as more than like a 25% chance of a loss. So I guess I'll go with, I guess I'll go with uh, Penn State just because it's later in the season and maybe you've had some injuries and, you know, maybe Penn State's figured it out on offense or maybe they've gone to Drew Aller on offense and that's really completely changed things. I, I just... I don't know that I, you know, Michigan State, you're not going up to Michigan State and it, it's going to be the weather that it was when we were up there in 2018 when it was like 20 degrees and freezing, freezing, freezing cold. You're not going to have that kind of weather because that's with what the oh, October 8th or something like that. So I, I guess I'll go with Penn State, but I really, I don't think that any of those individual games are, I, I don't know that I think any of those games are single digit kind of margin of victory games. The Penn State game likely a noon kick, so that it mm-hmm. won't be the whiteout. They already have the whiteout scheduled. I think that takes away some, but does it d- does it take away something for the Buckeyes? Do they look at this? Because I look at this as a much easier game now that it's not going to be at night. If the team looks at it like a much easier game, now it becomes a much harder game, and so they have to be careful. Of uh, I, I know they listen. I know the coaches listen and watch. But like, if, just because the game was going to be a little bit easier doesn't mean it's going to be a whole lot easier, and it doesn't mean you could take it easier. Um, Michigan State, though, I think I think we've decided that that might also be a daytime game, which would make things easier. But as you said, the weather should be okay, barring any rain. That evens. I, I think Michigan State has enough skill to where that's also good for them. They they can move mm-hmm. the ball. I. I don't think that's going to be an easy game, but every time we don't think it's going to be an easy game, uh, Ohio State is leading 42 nothing after like seven minutes left in the, the second quarter. Uh, so maybe that, that, you know, who knows? But then you have like Iowa that I just think just makes things diff- difficult for everybody. That game is at, in Columbus. So there's less concern there, but it's, it's Iowa. So you've got this like, we should be fine. But we better take every better pack everything up. Make sure you're, you're dotting all of your eyes and crossing all of your T's because it's going to be, it, it's going to be tough, not impossible. And uh, you're just playing a, a well. I don't want to say well coached, just well. They do what they do. They know what they're doing basically, and, and they've done it for a long time. And, and that to me is just be wary. But I think the answer is it's Penn State or or obviously. Maybe we're overlooking Wisconsin. I don't know, Kevin. You've you've been listening. Maybe, who's to say? Outside of you gone. Outside, outside of Notre you guys Dame, still there? Yeah, I'm here. You can you hear us? Is this? Uh, well, hey, there we go. Hey, 
Welcome back, Kevin. It's so much better now oh, that you're back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. But I, Tom, I did take Michigan off of that list. Would Michigan mm-hmm. be the answer? Michigan is probably the answer, although I don't, you know, I feel like I, I want to know a lot more about their quarterback situation going into that game and, and see a little bit of their defense because they've lost – you know, they, they didn't lose a ton off of the defense, but they lost the biggest pieces of that defense. So I kind of want to see what's, you know, what's next in line there now that Hutchinson and Najabo and Dax Hill are gone and guys like that. Uh, Odysseus has an interesting one in the uh, in the comments mm-hmm. at Maryland may be tricky. And Maryland is a team that Ohio State has just, outside of the 2018 game, Maryland is a team that Ohio State has just not had any problems with. They have just stomped Maryland pretty much every time they've played them. Even when even when things were not necessarily going great, Ohio State just kind of like taken care of Maryland. So I kind of would need to see it, I think, in order to view that as a real threatening game for Ohio State. But at the same time, you know, we, we were there in 2018, and I don't think you're going to have, you know, T.J. McFarland is running for 9,000 yards on the same basic play because Ohio State can't figure it out. I don't think you're going to have those issues on the defense this year, but, you you know, I mean, it's, it is a, I think that is a more talented uh, Maryland team than it has been in previous years. I think Mike, Mike Loxley is starting to kind of get things spooled up there a little bit. It's just not necessarily to the point where they're a, a threat to Ohio State yet. Yeah, especially the week before the Michigan game. I think I would put Michigan just because, the law, what a loss could mean, uh, you know, losing to Michigan, it's, it's just the cost of it maybe makes it more dangerous than any other game. Kevin, feel free to talk about this for as long as you like while I sit back and Tom probably gets on his phone. Do you even, let me, let me set this up for you. Preston D. Asks, set the scene for me, please. The most dangerous game on the Ohio State schedule, not named. Notre Dame, where do you go? I mean, I go to the Michigan game just because it's the rivalry game. They won the last one. Um, I don't I don't think this Michigan team is built the way that the last one was, but, you know, there's something to be said about having momentum in this series. And, you know, they, you know, they came out and talked about how they were out-toughed Ohio State and so on and so forth, and then, until Ohio State is able to show that you know that it can get out there and play a fully physical 60-minute game against Michigan, who's going to try and and bloody things up and force Ohio State to uh, to run against them. And, I mean, you know, I think there are a lot of issues there in that game. Now, with that being said, I still see the line of that being 12, 13 points, but it was a it was a pretty decent line last year before the snow moved into Ann Arbor and everything else kind of happened at that point, but. You know, I think year in and year out, it's always going to be Michigan just because of what that rivalry means. I mean, Michigan decided to take the, take the game seriously by having whatever its Ohio periods, and Ohio State's always taken the game seriously having its Michigan periods. So it's 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 always going to be the game. I mean, yeah, we can sit there and talk about you know Maryland, or we can talk about Iowa just because the last time Iowa and Ohio State played in Iowa City. Grand, this one's in Columbus. I mean, that one was a a shellacking, but it's it's Michigan. I see a comment here from Roto Cod. Are you live for the second time today? No, we are still live for the first time today. Began at ten. Now rolling up on one p.m. Going live, celebrating the launch of BuckeyeHuddle.com. The full launch. Go check it out. Go become a member. Hang out with us over there as well. And, oh, no, uh, let me see here. Obviously, Tony Gerderman's burner account. Kevin is the best one here. I got concerned. Then his next comment was, sorry, I was hacked. Uh, that was that's a uh, close call. Uh, want to make sure everybody's okay. Uh, please no hacking of accounts, of legitimate <coughs> accounts. <laughs> a couple of people asking for um, our college football playoff picks. I have not really sat down and gone through everything and, and done my picks. I'm just looking. I know a lot of people, Utah is becoming a, a popular mm-hmm. pick. Opening against Florida week one is awesome to me. And they can lose that and still should be okay. And, and then you look at the rest of their schedule, and I'm mainly just looking at road games at Arizona State. They should win that. 
at UCLA will be tough. At Washington State, they should be fine. At Oregon will be tough. At Colorado, I, I can see two losses on that schedule, which would essentially eliminate them because they are not Georgia or Texas A&M or anything like that. But I can, I can tell you – Two that I'm pretty confident in is Ohio State and Alabama. I feel like I've just taken the free spaces on the board, and uh, you know, I just like I said, I, I'll throw to you, Tom. I haven't I haven't really looked at all of the schedules because for me it always comes down to schedule, and I put so much weight into that, and, and I haven't picked all of my games. But um, you know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll share some thoughts and then I'll dip out for a minute. Um, I think. Alabama and Ohio State are very clearly the two the two free spaces on the bingo card. They, those are the two that, unless something crazy goes wrong, those guys are in. I know Georgia's kind of a trendy third pick, and you look at their schedule, I don't think they have a particularly difficult, you know, they get Oregon week one. They should be able to handle a new, you know, new coach Oregon uh, team, Dan Lanning, just taking over at Oregon. You win that, and then the, you go through the SEC schedule. It's like, boy, they really don't have a very difficult schedule for, you know, for a team that's going to get credit for playing an SEC schedule. They don't have a particularly difficult schedule because the East is kind of down. It's like, who's the second best team in the East this year? Kentucky, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe if the Spencer Rattler thing really takes off, maybe it's South Carolina. But you know, the you've got Billy Napier's got a got a, a uphill climb at Florida. They are unranked. I think they had 15 votes in the 15 points in the AP poll. Like they're you know 32nd or 34th or something like that in the AP poll. I, I just I think George is a good bet to get there because if they're 11 and 0 and Alabama's or 12 and 0 and Alabama's 12 and 0, the SEC is going to get their two teams in. And then you know fourth, Clemson maybe. I mean it, it, you, who's coming out of the ACC? It's probably Clemson. If someone's coming out of the ACC, NC State's a possibility. NC State's one of those, like, I would like to see that happen before I put any sort of faith in the fact that the universe, the universe has not typically smiled on NC State teams in big moments. So I kind of want to see that. So, but, you know, Clemson, NC State out of there, out of the Big 12, it feels like Oklahoma's kind of like a big question mark right now because Clemson turned over both coordinators. Oklahoma had a huge staff turnover, lots of... uh, you know, lots of player turnover as well. That just that feels like they're not going to be there this year. I'm not really buying Texas. I don't think Baylor's getting there this year. So, and then you get out to Cal- get to the Pac-12, and it's like Utah, USC. I mean, USC feels like USC feels like they should be a nine-win team because they've they've brought in so much talent there. And again, you're not playing a particularly difficult schedule in the Pac-12 South, so. You know Notre Dame. If Notre Dame, you know, loses to Ohio State week one, but kind of runs the table after that, maybe it's Notre Dame. It just it feels like you've got Ohio State, Alabama, and then probably Georgia's third, and then fourth. It's just kind of like yeah, you could just kind of pick pick a name out of a hat. Utah's Utah's one that I could see a viable path for. Notre Dame, I could potentially see a viable path for. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I guess I'll say. I guess I'll say. I guess I'll say, oh boy, I really I keep trying to say the word Clemson, and I really just can't make my make myself do it. All right, I'm gonna say Utah. I'll say Utah is fourth. What do you got, Kevin? Well, I'm gonna, see you, Tom. I, I'm gonna say goodbye to Tom, whereas we drop him so we can go have some lunch. So, boom, he's gone. Um, yeah, I, uh, Ohio State and Alabama are kind of the free squares at that point. I do agree that as much as we hate the idea. A lot of us hate the idea of two SEC teams in there. Is there, is there, are there two teams that are more deserving to be in there than Georgia? If Georgia is what we think they're going to be, and I, I can't, I can't see it at this point because I agree with what everybody said that, you know, it's kind of we know three, and then we have to decide on kind of the fourth whether or not, you know, it's I don't see anybody necessarily out of the Big 12. I don't really trust uh, Brent Venables in year one. You know, they've you know, they they lost a lot through the portal. They brought some in through the portal. But I just I don't know if I see it there, uh, you know, to get back to somebody kind of joking about Texas being back. No, Texas isn't back. So, you know, cross the Big 12 off, uh, you know, you got the ACC it's really hard to see it with Clemson. I mean, I do think that they have, uh, 
I do think that they're going to have a better start to this year than they did last year, but I don't know if they're a national caliber type of team. Is there anybody else out of the ACC? Miami? You know, people really want to be high on Miami. I don't know. I, they're, they got to show me something before I'm going to buy it uh, because at this point I'm not buying anything that I'm seeing there. So if we take the ACC off of the list, uh, any independence, I mean, Notre Dame, you know, if we all, if what we expect to happen happens in week one and, and Notre Dame is saddled with that loss and they don't have, they don't get a 13th uh, data point with no championship game, they have really little margin for error. So, you know, we could put Notre Dame in the maybe pile. So then we're, then we're to the Pac-12. Uh, and th that just leaves Utah and USC. And it's a matter of, are you a Lincoln Riley believer? Do you think that Lincoln Riley can turn them around? Do you think Utah with Cam Rising and some of the guys that they have there can get it done? I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go out and say that maybe that the, the PAC 12 is ripe for the taking and I'll, and I'll say USC, but I can't say that I'm saying that with a lot of confidence. Yeah. <clears throat> looking at Notre Dame's schedule, like they have that Ohio state game. Then they have Marshall, then Cal, then they're at North Carolina, then BYU at home, then Stanford and UNLV, then they go to Syracuse, then they have Clemson at home, then it's Navy and BC, and then they find they, they end the season at USC, which maybe that's for a playoff spot, you know, depending on what USC does. Um, I'm wondering as it shakes out and we eliminate conferences, you have Georgia and Alabama and Ohio State. And do you have uh, an 11 and one Texas A&M who has only lost to Alabama? And let me make sure that they don't also play Georgia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then, I was going to say math matters. Um, but let me let me look at their schedule here and, and just see. Yeah, no, uh, no Georgia, but they do play at Alabama. And if their their only loss on the season is at Alabama. And they you know, they would have a win over Miami, a win over Arkansas, a win over Ole Miss, Florida. I mean, it's not the most difficult schedule when I'm just when Miami, Arkansas, and Ole Miss are the the three ranked teams on your schedule, other than Alabama, and you open with Sam Houston and Appal Appalachian State. Like this is a schedule that 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 they can run through. They have LSU at home, Florida at home, and. The the most difficult road game is Mississippi State or South Carolina. I've been told that Auburn is awful this year. That's their other road game. So uh, I'm just saying this is – keep an eye on three SEC teams in the playoffs. I'm just going to say it. Uh, that way uh, we can get it out there. And uh, maybe, maybe then the argument becomes an uh, A&M or Georgia, not A&M and Georgia, assuming Alabama wins the SEC, where it's, you know, if Georgia wins the SEC and Alabama's only losses to Georgia and Texas A&M's only losses to Alabama, um, you know, does does A&M still have an argument at that point when Alabama is like the second team in with in, in, in that loss to the SEC championship game? It's very early, but I think if you're eliminating conferences, then you have to look at the conferences that aren't eliminated and pick the teams from there. And uh, is, is it is it a second Big Ten team or a third SEC team as we make a ton of assumptions right now? Yeah, a ton of assumptions. It's I mean, we go into every year and we get into about week 10 and they're like nine undefeated teams and people freak out. It's like, who's going to get left out that's undefeated? It's like, well, the math doesn't work out. I mean, these teams are all going to play each other, but... <sighs> Three SEC teams would be a tough pill to swallow for most of the country, and um, even even if even if you sat there and there were true metrics of where you could just sit there and all things considered and say who are you know who are the top four teams and all right Ohio State's one of them and Alabama's one of them and then you got Georgia and A and M and they're they're head and shoulders above everybody else i mean it, it, it would be difficult to get away from it but i also know that that committee that meets in grapevine texas knows that they would be just destroyed they would get destroyed for it by everybody not named uh 
Paul Feinbaum. Uh, so I, you know, I just think that it would be a difficult ask, but you know, who, who could be a second team coming out of the, you know, out of the big 10? I mean, you know, could, Michigan. you know, could, yeah. I mean, if we're going to sit there and have, you know, it's one thing to have the loser of a conference championship game in there, but having the lose, you know, having somebody who doesn't win their division, not saying, you know, that that's impossible, obviously, but you know, that's, you know, that's a big thing there. I mean, does Michigan get ding because it's schedule so crummy? I mean, do well, I, I think it's the schedule that makes them a viable option and keeps them ranked highly. But I, I think it's going to be asking a lot. You know, they'll be three and zero because they have a horrible non-conference. They have Maryland at home. The then they go to Iowa, which is their fifth game of the season. I think that's a loss. But you win there. You beat Penn State at home. Can they finally beat Michigan State at home? Then you're at Rutgers. Then Nebraska and Illinois at home. If your only loss is at Ohio State, then you have the same exact argument that you have for, say, Texas A&M. And now you're pitting Texas A&M as the third SEC team or Michigan as the second Big Ten team. And I think it's a lot easier pill to swallow to have two and two than one and three. And you kind of avo avoid some of the nightmare. But if all of this is being blown up soon anyway, do they even care? Like, does this allow it to be blown up even quicker? But nobody's going to do it unless ESPN backs off of the the the, the loan contract, you know, the the loan negotiating uh, deal that they have right now at, for the length of this current deal. If, if ESPN would be like, okay, we'll back out, and we can everybody can um, you know bid, the other networks can bid so that we can get this expansion going now. I don't know if they'd be super friendly to that, but I, it feels like it, it, it's a definitely an easier pill to swallow two versus two and two rather than one and three. But what if Texas A&M is clearly a better team than Michigan based on the eye test? And when you're comparing the two, you have to, the committee says we don't look at conferences. They don't look at conferences. Uh, I don't buy that, Kevin. But, um, you know, I, I think that as we tell you everything that's going to happen and project completely wildly, if it comes down to Texas A&M and Michigan, I, I don't um, I don't have the highest amount of confidence that they would go two and two. Yeah, um, I it would. It's a matter of I mean, they're they're charged with picking the four best teams. That's what mm -hmm. it is. It's not about parity. It's not about any of this. If we're about parity. Then we wouldn't we wouldn't be doubling up on conferences and things like that. But you know, I just I wouldn't want to. I mean, I wouldn't want to be around that room and just you know the we, we know that come whatever it is week eight or whenever they start doing CFP rankings and we get the awkward you know the awkward conference commissioner speaking in terms of, or AD talking about what was in their in their their mindset in terms of why the rankings were each week. I just, uh, I don't know. I mean, that just is a big ask. I mean, it, it, I, I, I could really see it being damaging toward the sport. I mean, if that's the case, because there are a lot of people who already feel that the fix is in. And if you do that, I mean, at some point, do you, you know, do you overcorrect in order to try and save, to save the whole situation and be like, well, we know that A and M probably should be the four seed here but we also know that if we do that people are going to lose their ever loving minds and you know we could you know we could we could lose 10 percent of our fan base and as, as things are getting more expensive and things are more complicated and i know nil is not an issue of the cfp but all of these people are are football minds and most of them are active in their in their roles you know i think that they have to they have to think on a 360 degree plane. Well, this is also the playoffs right now are with the SPN. The SEC is going to all ESPN here in, in two years. And this could just look like, well, you're just, you're just starting things early. Basically you are, um, it, it's, as you said, it's a fix like three at three ESPN teams on ESPN's playoffs. 
go figure. Like, oh, what a shock. It's kind of a, it calls into doubt the entire sport, even, even if those three teams should be in it. Jordan Kapler asks, what's a moment in sports history that you got irrationally upset about? And I'll let you think about this, Kevin. I'll give you a couple. Uh, Steve Bartman, as a Cubs fan, That got me irrationally upset, but I thought, you know what? Still early, you know, like they'll be fine. I got more upset about it after the game. Like once the Cubs lost, like once it was, it was over. Then it's like, what have you done to me? Um, But I've forgiven him. I think the, the, the 1998 Michigan state loss in the stands, that game ends and just not being able to move, like just complete, dead inside uh like just sitting there and being upset at my roommate's parents we got them tickets for that game they're going to take us out to dinner we're like no we're not doing anything just very upset coming back from the the 1995 michigan game on the way there i bought an eddie george jersey after the game i i pretty sure i threw the jersey away i've thrown I, I left. Uh, I threw away a hat after that '98 Michigan State game. Like th- those are some of the like the the, the instances that I remember. Because um, as a Chicago fan, like I don't have a lot of um, instances of like being so close to something great and then having it t- taken away. So I just have to go back to my student life at Ohio State for those, and and there were plenty. Well, I know one that a lot of people will say, and I think that will be the uh, the Fiesta Bowl against Clemson when the uh, scoop and oh. score was was overturned. Um, you know, that one was certainly worthy of being on that list. Um, you know, I saw uh, El Suzabo in the uh, in the chat talked about Bill Buckner, which obviously when the ball went through the wicket on there, that one. If I had a rooting interest in that one, I would have been angry. Um, I was a Mets fan at that point. I, you know, I was really upset in '85 when Tom Needenfewer for the Dodgers and the uh, going against the Cardinals gave gave up a home run to Ozzie Smith, who basically went up to bat with like a toothpick and had zero power. And you know, I was 14 years old, probably 13, just based on I hadn't turned 14 quite yet, and teenage angst kind of got the best of me and I, I remember getting sent to my room for unleashing a very colorful diatribe of how much I hated the Cardinals um I'm trying to think I mean there have been a couple of times where I may or may not have lost a bet on a game where uh, you know on a missed field goal or something along those lines one of them involving the Buffalo Bills. I may or may not have broken my hand that day punching, thinking I was going to punch a door and I hit the jam instead and broke a bone in my hand. So not only did I lose the bet, but I also lost money for paying whatever my deductible was on my student insurance. Um, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people who know me just say, I really, I get, I get like irrationally angry too much so uh you know i I, i've calmed down in my old age i really have i tony's known me for a long time i used to i used to run a lot more hot than i than i do now i mean now at 50 i just i I just can't i just can't now you just you're rationally angry yeah yeah more or less uh this one from uh, odysseus 2002 do you know uh do you think Jim Knowles tries to bracket cover a Notre Dame tight end, Michael Mayer. I'm interested to see what they do there because the the bits of practice that I've seen, as I mentioned like three hours ago, the the coverage on Kate Stover that we saw in practice from the safeties has been a bit of a concern for me. So I, I think if you're going to cover double cover anybody in that defense, it, it might be that guy where you just have a safety staying back and, uh, bracketing him you, you'll maybe have um you know tanner McAllister at nickel running with them depending on where every everybody's lined up or um 
but I think he's a guy that you have to focus on. He's leading receiver. He's an all American. He's the, this and that. And, you know, earlier today, Tom was saying like, if, if you are, if the tight end is the one guy who beats you, you're going to win. And I went back and I looked at the, the Iowa game from 2017 where it was two tight ends and they had like nine catches for like 160 yards and four touchdowns. If they get that from Michael Mayer, then, you know, look out. But if there's no second tight end to, to double up and make things even more difficult, they, they should be okay. But I I'm interested to see how they handle him, whether they try not to do anything special at first and then find out, okay, we've got to adjust. And that was something that Tom was talking about earlier as well. Let's see what the adjustments are in that first quarter, second quarter, halftime. Jim Knoll says that he can adjust. He does a good job of adjusting on the fly. You don't necessarily need to wait till the half. And so, you know, prove it, I guess, at this point and, and see how well you do that. Um looking through here we've answered a lot of these starred questions yeah i'm trying to get caught up and dump some of the ones that we've are that i remembered hearing i i even when i was off i had my headset on 95 percent of the time but i'm sure i missed a couple jason fruth um ugh, the 2015 2015 michigan state game ohio state lost to a quarterback without arms that is um pretty accurate where the backup comes in and there's no reason, no reason that game should have been lost, but that's, that's just a microcosm of the 2015 season where nothing was as good as it was supposed to be, except for Braxton Miller and against Virginia tech. That was the only thing that lived up to the hype that year. I'd say Ezekiel Elliott did, but then I could point out that Michigan state game again and say, really? 30 yards rushing on, you know, 13 or whatever carries, not quite living up to the hype. Tyler Shoemaker, the, the Cam Martinez pick six, ruining his underbet in the Tulsa game last year had him pretty fired up. Yeah, um, that's that, that goes back to what you're talking about, Kevin. Losing the bets. That's why I only win my bets. I think if more people did this, if you only win, then it, then it's fun. And uh, I saw Ohio getting sports betting here pretty soon. Uh, will be available at Kroger and uh, many other Giant Eagle. I um, is that a good idea, Kevin? What having sports betting at like Kroger? Probably yeah, not. <laughs> Probably. right next to the liquor store. No, um, you know it's a situation of where. I have a little bit of an addictive personality, so it's it's fine when we go to you know Nebraska and you go across the river to Council Bluffs, Iowa, and you you know you put down a couple bets and you your Tony you cash all of them it seems and you know everything else. Uh, Tom, if you're ready to jump back in, give me a thumbs up. I see you in the green room. All right, uh, or you know you're on your way to Penn State and you stop at Wheeling Island for the only reason to stop in Wheeling Island and that's to go hit the casino and put a couple bets down and you know i've had you know mixed success there but when it becomes something that i can go to wherever i mean you know i don't know how many how many kiosk licenses they're going to be in terms of how it's going to work here i think the less i know about it is the better um i i'm not I'm, I'm i don't have a ton of disposable income to give to the gaming commission or whatever that's going to be and we know that the house generally always wins but uh, I'm excited for all my friends who do that. And if anybody's got, you know, lock of the century type of things, I mean, better they better hit because, I you know, I, I might be putting the electric bill on it. All right. I will I will take a break. I'm going to have to jump on with Mark Rogers at 1.30. So I'm going to be gone for uh, like an hour or so. So can I trust you two? No. <laughs> If you haven't figured that out yet by now, I mean, but but you're going to do it anyway, so. Yeah. I'm, All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving anyway. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you guys in a bit. Right. As, yeah. as if that wasn't exciting enough, we're supposed to have a uh, exciting mystery guest coming in uh, probably 10 minutes or so, last I heard. So we uh, will probably pick, pick things up there. Uh, yeah, the idea of 
sports betting at Kroger is, I don't know, it just, it seems a little, uh, I don't know what the word is. I guess I guess it's interesting because you you people have had it on their phones for a while and you've been able to do offshore stuff from home. So just putting it in a Kroger just sort of puts it right in front of people, which it's not necessary. I'm not, you know, necessarily anti, uh, you know, sports betting, whatever. And, and as Tony and Kevin have said, like we will upon occasion stop off at a sports book somewhere uh, while we're on the road to uh, put down a few bucks on something or other. But it does it does feel like you know, the shopping list of, uh, you know, cake mix, wheat bread, Coca-Cola, and, uh, you know, Michigan State uh, minus seven is just kind of, a, it's it's just going to be a little weird, a little different. But that sort of is the trend right now. And, you know, you went, I went to Wrigley Field with my son a couple weeks ago, and it's like, oh, there's a sports book, like, right, right there. Like, and that's just, it's just sort of a part of the landscape now. So uh, I don't know. We're living in the Biff Tannen future, I guess. I'm not sure. We're, I guess we're on. I guess we're in that timeline right now. Well, then somebody give me the dang sports almanac because um, you, you know we know that that movie didn't hold up because that wouldn't be printed anyway. I mean, it would be on some sort of you know, laser disc or something like that. But uh, yeah, I need I need winners. I, I I don't I don't need situations of where. I'm waiting and, you know, I need an under to come through, you know, not to, not to put fun <laughs> at Tyler. I, you know, I just, I don't, I don't need that. I mean, you know, I've got lots of friends who are very much into the whole scene with all of that and have action on a lot of games and some of them do very well. I mean, mm -hmm. they do very well. And I'm like, well, the reason you do well is because I'm not involved because I don't, if I didn't have bad luck, I'd have, have no <laughs> luck at all. I, I Tyler saw so Tyler's comment. Love this. I'm way too classy to sports bet at Kroger. I'm in the South, so I will do it at Publix. Yes, that is uh, chicken finger sub and uh, you know the, the uh, Florida State money line. That's that's a winning combination for sure. Do you need to have Tyler? Tyler and I have talked about the fact that I need to have him on the morning show to talk about how he does, how he puts his whole system together. I find that all fascinating. He's got team ratings and all that kind of stuff. We'll get Tyler on the uh, Buckeyes tomorrow morning, sooner rather than later. Now that we're now that we have the site launched and all that. Have you talked about uh, Have you talked about the site, Kevin? Have we talked about the site in a little while? We talked about while well, you were gone, but that was. It's. I, I don't remember it when you had, had broken uh, away for lunch. Unfortunately yes. for me, when I broke away for quote unquote lunch, I I was on the computer the whole time. I didn't even get to refill <laughs> my water. But yeah, I heard that there's a brand new site out there in the market, and it's fantastic. It, you know that is actually true, and it's so kind of you to say. Uh, yes, BuckeyeHuddle.com. The site is now live. We have uh, had a ton of members join already. It is. Uh, Twelve ninety nine a month, one hundred and twenty four ninety nine for a uh, for the year. It is uh, you know when you think about think about all the dumb stuff you spent twelve ninety nine on uh, in, in the last month. You've probably done that at uh, Starbucks or Papa John's or uh, you know McDonald's if you've got kids in the back of the car. And uh, you know for for that twelve ninety nine instead you'll get uh, a fantastic access to a fantastic team of uh, recruiting analysts and team coverage and X's and O's coverage just great message board we have we kind of test drove it a little bit over the last couple of weeks and had a really really fun community already starting to build before we even launched so you can find that all at buckeyehuddle.com sign up today just if you've never been a part of a, com a, a site like that give it a try give it a month and that first month is going to include the notre dame game and all the lead up to the season and you're gonna you're gonna be you know think about the think about what the week before the first game of the season is like for you every year you're probably sitting in your office going I wish it was Saturday. I wish I had someone to talk about guys with. And well, now you will have you will have a uh, fantastic community to do that at BuckeyeHuddle.com. So uh, go ahead and go ahead and give that a try. If you're not sure, just try it for a month. See if you like it. If you don't, that's fine. It's not. It doesn't have to be for everyone. But uh, I think it might be for you. If you're the type of person sitting listening to uh, people talk about Ohio State football on YouTube in the middle of the day on a Wednesday afternoon, well, you might enjoy being on uh, on the uh, the Huddle board at BuckeyeHuddle.com and talking f Buckeye football with a whole bunch of other folks as well. So, um, Sue, 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 I have to question Sue's dedication. She's only been here for three and a half hours and now she has to leave. Come on, Sue, get it together. I thought you, I thought you enjoyed these shows. Um, uh, oh yes, David, boy, here, here, that's a fun, that's a fun comment. All I, I just picked up the comment, uh, without any context. All I know is I thought we had them when Ted Jr. ran back the opening kickoff. Boy, Kevin, I, I without even seeing the context, I bet I know which game he's talking about, and I bet oh, I know yeah. how it turned out. 
Oh yeah. Um, that was my first year back on the beat after I had gone and worked for Fox for a while and then worked at rivals headquarters. And then I wasn't even credentialed for the game. I kind of covered it from afar, but I did go out there. I worked a deal with a travel company and I was in the stands. So it was a very different type of experience, something, you know, that I've not done. I hadn't done in a long time and I haven't done since of, of, of sitting in the stands for a game and, just the amount of fights that were in my section or whatever. I, I'll say that I sat in a, in a section that was probably 50-50, if not maybe 60-40 Ohio State, and uh, it got pretty raucous. And uh, <laughs> everything that the Ohio State fans threw at the Florida fans came back 20-fold in the other direction. And um, I actually ended up getting beer poured on me at some point. I didn't say anything. I bas Well, basically, as the story goes, um, somebody started like messing with people sitting right in front of me. And I said, dude, what's your problem? And then he's like, it's like threw beer at me. He's like, well, now you've got a problem. I'm like, I, I don't have time for this. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Yeah, that is, it's been quite a while since I've, I go to baseball games now, but uh, as just, you know, as a fan, I have not been to a college football game as a, you know, in a, you know, non-professional capacity for quite a while. We go to, go to Ohio university game every once in a while. Those are slightly less intense than national championship games, though. So, those are uh, that's always fun. I, I will recommend. I feel like I give this speech this time every year. It is very easy when you're looking at college football to get so you know sucked into the college football playoff and everything centers around the college football playoff. And it's just that is the dumbest way to consume the sport. And I recognize that we end up talking about the college football playoff a lot because we're covering Ohio State and that's part of the conversation around Ohio State, but. If you're in consuming, this is this is an ESPN thing, that, and you know some of the a lot of the national places, but ESPN is one of the one of the worst offenders of this. Is the entire sport the entire conversation about the sport centers around the college football playoff, and from almost day one of the season, and you know then you get to the college football playoffs and it's two boring semifinal games because there you know because there's a huge talent gap between the two teams. And then there's a national championship game, and then the season's over, and then you got to wait nine more months. It's like don't focus just around the uh, around the college football playoff. Take some time, enjoy all the other great stuff that the sport has to offer. Watch like stay up late, watch a Hawaii game some uh, some Saturday night on a dodgy internet stream. Go find a game like if you're in Ohio, if you're in Northeast Ohio, go check out a Kent State game. Like Kent State is actually going to be. Sean Lewis has that program kind of rocking and rolling a little bit right now. Go see a Kent State game. If you're in Southeast Ohio, go to a Bobcats game. Go to an OU game. Go to a Miami game. Go to a Toledo game or a Bowling Green game. Like, go, to, and if you don't do that, go see a D3 game. We have uh, Denison in town where I live, but, you know, Otterbein and Capital. Like, go see another game at a different level and appreciate the sport for what it is and uh, try and enjoy some of the other games because it is the longest off season in major North American sports. So uh, while the season's here, you should, uh, you know, as the, as the Native Americans used to do, use every part of the Buffalo, like enjoy every part of the college football season because it takes a long time to come around, does not last very long. And uh, watching every game through the lens of what does this mean for the college football playoff means you're missing out on a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I, every every year with the open week and the rare years that there are two open weeks, I'm like, well, I'm going to go to a game. I never go to a game. I, I'm tired. I just don't want to do it. I mean, it's look. I'm, I I I admit it. I'm not out there building buildings or digging ditches or doing you know honest hard working work with my hands or anything like that. But it gets to be a bit of a grind at at, at points, and you know, I just want to sit there and sit on the sofa and, and watch college football. And, and as to Tom's point of watching it through a kind of a CFP lens and what that means, yeah, I do watch the top line games. I do, but I also will watch games all night. I mean, my wife has already asked me, when is the open week? All right, I just, I'm going to go do something with my friends on that day because you're not going to want to. I'm like, but I don't want to be alone. And it's like, well, it's not a case of being alone. It's, I just want to watch football. And, I'll, I'll dovetail on this as I've just seen Alex Gleitman show up in the green room. It looks like he's finishing up lunch, so I'll give him a minute. But uh, I just got a thumbs up from him. You know, so it, it, it's great getting out there to some of these, you know, other schools. And, you know, it's, it's 
you're not going to be able to sit lower bowl inside the 20s at Ohio State all the time. You go to some of these other places. What time's the game start? When can you get here? So you go. From, <laughs> so you kind of go from there. Uh, somebody was saying I'm frozen, but I, I'm not seeing anything. So maybe, maybe I'm bogging down. But let's bring Alex in, and then you guys can talk while I figure out if I'm getting frozen. <laughs> All right, the great Alex Gleitman joins us. Alex Gleitman, recruiting analyst for BuckeyeHuddle.com. He is, uh, we've talked a bunch about the site, and, you know, Kevin and Tony and I are on the team coverage. We've got Ross and Justin uh, on the uh, X's and O's coverage, and we've got Alex and we've got Mark Givler covering recruiting for us. So all those recruiting questions you've been uh, saving up for us and asking us that we kind of go, hmm, let me check with someone. Here's Someone is here. He is Alex Gleitman. So if you have questions about uh, recruiting, throw those in the chat, and we'll uh, go through some of those right now. He uh, also dress dropped a new edition of his ADEC column, uh, which is now uh, behind the paywall at uh, BuckeyeHuddle.com. Lots of good information about a couple defensive linemen who are uh, set to commit later on this month. But Alex, uh, thanks for hopping on for a little while. Yeah, guys, this, this is this is fun. I've been watching a little bit during the day. Uh, doing a little work for the day job and, and had you guys up in the background. I'm glad Tony's off because now the show's <laughs> that much better. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Really excited for the launch of the site. Um, I think we kind of, I, I honestly kind of like this better than, than just kind of going full go. Like I liked having that little, like building that board community up a little bit and now, now having the full site to go. And yeah, I dropped that a deck today. Uh, you could say that might've been intentional with the timing of it this week, but, uh, if you're not a member of Buckeye Huddle, now's a good time. Definitely, uh, definitely some good stuff in there. I think uh, regarding the latest in recruiting. So, yeah, the, the recruiting piece of the of the business, I think, is is sort of where a lot of the pay sites sort of started. That that you know you, you would get the recruiting analysis and and you know find out like who the who the guys were. And this has been you know this has been 15, 20 years now in some in some forms or another. But that, I think, is, is something that is a big driver of folks who are interested in, in being members of the site, because it's just it's something that you can't really do halfway. Like you've either really got to be doing it or you can't you're, you're not going to be up to date on all the different moving pieces right now, because there's a, you know, recruiting recruiting can be a wild business. A lot of change. A lot of things change very quickly. And you can have, uh, you know, the difference between offers and offers and all of the all of the fun different stuff that goes on with recruiting. But I guess let people know a little bit if they if they don't know you particularly well uh, or, um, you know, let people know a little bit about when you got started in uh, the recruiting business and how, uh, you know, how you've kind of come along in, in that over the last, uh, I mean, what, almost decade, right? Uh, I think even longer than that now. So I was uh, I was in school call it the first decade of the 2000s at Ohio State and we had uh me and like three buddies we we were just like super into Ohio State football obviously it's it's hard not to be and we started we decided let's start our own little blog and I was I was like into recruiting the most out of anyone followed it the most and I was going to be the recruiting guy and we had someone focused on basketball and football and whatever else and we started a a little blog called dotting the I doc I think it was maybe 2007 2008 was the back end of my college college years and um you know we actually got like a lot of traction it was pretty good but then summer hit my friends decided that they would like to go out drinking and have fun more than keeping up with a a blog that had gotten some traction so i kind of kept it going by myself for a bit and then um you know i was fortunate enough The guys at 11 Warriors, they were still in their infancy as well, pretty much at the time. They came to me, brought me on as one of the, I'd say I was maybe like fourth man in or so. I was there before Ramsey, actually. So I think it was uh, Jason, Chris, and Corey uh, at the time. And they brought me in as kind of the fourth and was with 11 Warriors from about 2008 to 2013, uh, covering recruiting as the primary recruiting analyst on that site. <clears throat> got the opportunity to go over to Buck Nuts and and twenty four seven sports for about five more years after that, and then uh, was with Kevin and and Mark at Buckeye Grove, and that obviously resulted in us heading all and meeting all at Buckeye Scoop, and now here we are at Buckeye Huddle. So now this is uh, I don't know almost fifteen years going about this, and it's it's been awesome. I mean, there's I cover Rutgers as well uh, right now, and have when I was at twenty four seven. 
uh, being out here on the East Coast, I, I got a chance to help cover some other, um, you know, for some other teams. And I'll say, I mean, I've never really covered Alabama or Georgia necessarily, but I mean, I, I can't imagine there being a better market than Ohio State. I mean, just there was the conversation on uh, Twitter or whatever the other day. I saw Dave Biddle put it out that, like, this is the largest beat mm-hmm. by far of, of any team, like college, pro, anything. And it's just – it's amazing uh, how much appetite there is for Ohio State football from a media perspective. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I, th- I think there's always the question, like, how many sites can you, you know, the market possibly support? And it's like, well, we haven't hit that number yet, apparently, because it is uh, – I mean, there are – you know, a lot of times 40, sometimes even 50 people there covering just midweek press conferences. You'll be there in March covering spring ball. And it's like, why are there 45 people here at 8 a.m. on a Wednesday? Like, what is going on? It is, yeah, it is a very unique market, a very unique team. But it's also, you know, you look historically and it is a team that has just functionally not been bad for the last 50 years. You've had, you know, the little little blips in the late late 80s, early 90s. You know, two bad years, three bad years, and the end of the tress, you know, Cooper early Trestle year years, and then the one year in 2011. And outside of that, it's like, all right, that's it. That's the only time it's been bad in, you know, the last 50 years. So you get that. You get the only uh, the only major team, sorry Cincinnati, the only major Power Five team uh, in a state that is as big and as football crazy as Ohio. It's like, yeah, well, turn, turns out breaking news: there are a lot of Ohio State football fans. Who knew? So in the last 15 years of covering recruiting, things have obviously changed a lot. I mean, 15 years ago, social media was kind of just basically in its infancy. So what is the biggest thing that's changed in recruiting in the time that you've been covering the, you know, covering the business? Oh, man, that's that's a good question. I mean, honestly, I think right now with what you're seeing with NIL and how it's the wild, wild west of recruiting and the NCA has no handle on it whatsoever. Um, and even if they did, I'm not sure how much they can even enforce things. I it's, this is probably the craziest thing I've seen. Now that said, I'll say with Ohio state, the biggest difference for me has been seeing the transition from starting to cover this team, a Jim Trestle coach team. And they, uh, I guess the best way I've ever heard it described was they worked inside out. They started with Ohio and the Midwest region, and they filled in the needs outside of that with Florida, with California, with Texas, wherever they could pull guys from. But most of those classes were were stemmed in Ohio and then, you know, stemmed in like that Midwest region, the Pittsburghs, the, the Indianas, the Illinois, et cetera. Now, I think, and, and, you know, social media probably has changed things so much as well with the ability to communicate constantly and stay on top of things. But you know, Urban Meyer really brought Ohio State into the national recruiting scene. And it's not at this point, it's get the 25 best players you can. It doesn't really matter where they're from. I mean, I know a lot of traditionalists may not want to hear that, but I, you know, if you want to win national championships, you got to go go out and get the 25 best players every single year, no matter where they're from, Ohio, Hawaii, Alaska, wherever that may be. So. Ohio State's done that, not not Alaska, but but Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, Enoch Vamahi, <laughs> offensive lineman from uh, from Hawaii on the team right now. He's the first Buckeye from Hawaii since Scott Turner, who was a punter in the kind of early to mid '90s. I do, I do a uh, sort of recurring feature every year on the most recent Buckeyes from each state. Never had one from Alaska, Vermont. Uh, I don't think they've ever had one. A scholarship player from New Hampshire. Ironically, though, they do have a head coach from New Hampshire right now, which is uh, a little weird. So this year's class, I mean, I think there's there's a lot going on right now, and it, it, it felt like, you know, they're, what, top, they're number two in the country right now, something like that for the 2023 class, give or take, depending on who you want to go to. But there was a period in, like, late July, early August, where it felt like the world was falling apart, and they were missing on guys, and they had some guys decommit, and it was, you know, everyone was, you know, running around, and their pets' heads were falling off. And then you look and it's like, well, they're still number two and they just got another good commitment this week. And, you know, where have have they sort of, you know, not not that it was even necessarily a crisis, but have they sort of like stemmed the tide there? Is is the class now, you know, are they at a point where they feel like this class is fairly stable and kind of in the neighborhood of where they need it to be right now in this point of the process? Yeah, I mean, I think they're in a great spot. And and like one thing I've learned over the years is the highs are never as high as you think they are and the lows are never as low as you think they are. And I know 
as fans, I mean, look, we're making a business off of <laughs> off of uh, Ohio State fans freaking out or, or you know, getting too too cocky, too confident. So I, I probably should stop here. But, you know, you know like it, at the end of the day, they'll figure it out. It will it will all work out. And it's not always about the guys you miss on. It's about who you get becoming good players, developing. And I think Ohio State right now has a really strong class together. Um, there, there are some, you know, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like there are some positions that I think that they still have to fill the void on. I mean, I think defensive line is a, you look at who they're going to lose this year, you know, maybe next year, especially if, if JT, uh, to him, and Jack Sawyer are, are what they think we are. Like, I think that they need to reload that room a, a little bit more, um, you know, linebacker. That's, I think that they do have a lot of young talent on the roster, but with the portal and, you know, everything that goes on in today's college football, they don't really have a true linebacker in this class. Offensive line, you would love for them to get kind of one more surefire type of uh, prospect. I think the four that they have can and will be pretty good, but I would love to see them get one solidified surefire guy like Olasa Linen that they that they felt pretty good about. Um, I'm not seeing them do anything much right now, Samson, Oak, and Lola, but someone like that would be, you know, your ideal add to this class. So I do think that they, that they do have some, some, some gaps to fill with, with the remaining spots that they have. But, you know, I think right now you're in a position where you've got most of your class together. We feel pretty good about most of those guys sticking. And now you could kind of go five-star chasing the rest of the way, which is a really nice position to be in you know, heading into the season where a lot of your focus as a coaching staff is going to be on getting ready for the games each and every week. Well, the first one of those games is Notre Dame. We've obviously been talking about that quite a bit on this show for the last three hours and 40 minutes. But, you know, from a recruiting perspective, that's a real big game as well, because that is we talked about that on a edition of uh, Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning earlier this week. That is a loaded recruiting weekend. They're bringing in a lot of guys. You've got some current commits. You got a lot of targets for 23 You've got a bunch of official visits that weekend. You've got, uh, but you've got 24 guys, 25 guys. So you're sort of starting to build the groundwork at least a little bit with some of those guys. I guess, first of all, explain pe- to people the difference between a an official visit who come, you know, for a guy who comes in on a weekend in June versus an official visit who comes in, for a guy who comes in for a game weekend. What? Wh- how different are those experiences? Because, you know, the coaches are obviously <laughs> busy with a little bit of extra stuff during the fall weekends but you also get to go to a game. So there's a little bit of a, like a give and take there. It feels like. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think they're both can be very effective. I think seeing the game atmosphere, understanding what it's like to be a player on game day and a game weekend. I, I think that that's a really valuable experience for one of these recruits to get. So when you come in in the summer, I mean, all the focus is on recruiting. Like it's not that the red carpet isn't laid out in the fall, but I mean, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed at night, you are the whole agenda is catered toward you as a recruit and focused on making your experience in Columbus amazing. And, you know, it's everything from the the academic side to the campus tour to the facility tour to trying to show you what a day in the life looks like to the nutritionist, to the strength and conditioning coach, to spending time with the players, to going out to dinner, to doing some sort of fun activity like it, it. it's it's like what a sum, a fun summer weekend should be like all expenses paid in Columbus Ohio now game weekend i think you do get a lot of those things i mean the all the things you know the academics the campus tours the facility tours etc you may not have a coach with you at all times you may have someone like a mark pantoni or an aaron dunstan you know come some of that support staff kind of taking the dorm tours with you instead of jim knowles taking that with you because he's got to get ready for the game but you know to my point earlier you're getting to see a whole side of what it's like to be an Ohio State football player, going to class, you know, that Friday walkthrough, the dinner the night before, game day morning, school session, you know, being on the field before the game, being in the locker room after the game, hopefully celebrating a win after the game, and then, you know, um, and just kind of being part of that whole experience. So it is a little different. I mean, you definitely don't get as much time, face time with the coaches, but a game like Notre Dame where that's a night game, I mean, you're going to have an opportunity Friday. The staff's going to get to spend a good amount of time with you. Saturday throughout the day, like they're just sitting around waiting. I mean, they're, they're going to be able to get to have some meetings and, and spend some good time with you. And then hopefully Sunday, you know, after they win, you're going to have some really good time before you fly out 
or drive out, depending on where you live. But it's it's a unique experience. Um, I, I think being able to experience the horseshoe at night, season opener, top five matchup, I don't know if you replicate it or replace in the summer. So it, it, there's pros and cons of both, but I think Ohio State's going to have a lot of success um, with that first weekend. And they got, what, 40-plus 40, 40 guys already who are four stars mm-hmm. or better uh, attending that weekend. So it's it's going to be a big one. All right, we got a great question on the uh, on the screen right there. We'll I want to get to that in a minute. I did want to talk about some of those forty guys who are coming uh, sure the week of that Notre Dame game. That's about Keon Keeley. They want to know that name yeah. for sure. Yeah. So can you just kind of run through? We don't need the full name, the full list of forty guys, but who are maybe you know the three to five names that are the people who are you know we we talk about guys who are top of the board. Who are who are the guys who are maybe uncommitted <laughs> towards the top of the board? who are going to be there for that Notre Dame game that people should know. Yeah, I'm going to go with two 2023 guys. Kevin already called them out. Keon Keeley, five-star, currently committed to Notre Dame, although by the time that game rolls around, he may not be committed to Notre Dame. Uh, Damon Wilson, defensive end, another defensive end out of Florida. We talked about that position, you know, being a big one that Ohio State needs to close on for the rest of this class. So those are two five-stars or high four-stars at minimum in Damon Wilson's case that uh, if, if they show up as planned – that weekend that that's going to be really important. And then 2024, honestly, it is loaded. Like I'll say Jeremiah Smith, because I think that they've got a great shot to land him wide receiver out of South Florida, five-star type of player, but Sammy Brown's like a top five player on some sites at linebacker. And I, I think Clemson or Georgia are going to be really tough to beat there for him, but he was at Ohio state last year, had a great time. He's supposed to be there. Kingston Valamuasa from St. John Bosco, another linebacker, potential five-star kid is really high on Ohio state and same with the safety Peyton Woodyard. Um, I, I would, I think Ohio state's maybe the team to beat there for him. Um, so, you know, those are just a few guys, but you know, the, the list is, as I said, 40, 50 deep between 23, 24 and 25. And they're all four-star kids or higher. So. You mentioned a name earlier, and it was not a player name. It was a staff member name, Mark Pantone. I think people probably have at least heard the name and have some idea what Mar- you know who Mark Pantone is, and he's somehow related to Ohio State's recruiting uh, efforts and you know sort of sort of running those in general. But I don't know if people really know what Mark Pantone does and why he's such a big part of the Ohio State football program on the whole. You know, can you sort of explain? what his role is on the team and why is he someone, you know, when you talk about it's, it's Ryan Day and then, you, you know, when they talk about other people who are in the program who are sort of staff people who are the most important in the program, you hear Mickey Mirati's name mentioned pretty quickly and you hear Mark Pantone's name mentioned pretty quickly. So why, what does Mark Pantone actually do behind the scenes to, you know, with relation to the recruiting end of things? I would almost ask you, what doesn't he do <laughs> as probably an easier question to answer, but, um, yeah, I mean, he he literally does everything. So he's he's now, I believe, I think his title got elevated this past offseason to general manager. Uh, he was previously director of player personnel. So he's overseeing the whole recruiting department. And that's just not the director of player personnel, assistant director of player personnel, the on-campus recruiting staff. That's also like the creative services team. So um, the video guys, the, the social media guys, the graphic designers, all – of everything that is going toward efforts of hyping up the program and getting that material in front of recruiting uh, recruits, whether that be, you know, as I said, on the creative side or the actual like recruiting visit efforts, evaluation side of things, he is overseeing all of that. So a lot of people are like, well, he's just an, he's just an administrator. Or he's just, you know, a guy who's very organized or can talk to recruits on social media but he actually spends probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours watching film. And ultimately he and his group are basically the first line of defense when it comes to evaluations on players. So whether that's in person, but mostly on film, like they are going through thousands of hours of film watching pretty much every single player that they possibly can um, to kind of fill out Ohio State's recruiting boards. And then they're managing that. They are then creating the boards, going over it with each position coach and Ryan Day, and managing the recruitments of all the players on those boards. So everything from planning recruits' visits 
to planning the materials that get in front of recruits in the mail, on social media, whatever that may be, to actually evaluating players and being active participants in recruiting those players alongside the coaching staff. I mean, that's all in his purview. So at the end of the day, when every signing day, I mean, everyone always looks to the head coach or the position coaches or whatever. I think Mark Pantone feels that that's a reflection of the work that his team did that past recruiting cycle, which is not only a year, it's two, three, four years potentially in the making. Yeah. I mean, we I were talking about, go ahead. I was going to say, jump in with a question. Uh, Tom brought up Mark Pantone and his role. I want to bring up somebody who's not one of the 10 assistant coaches, but constantly gets mentioned uh, with Keenan Bailey. Just, I mean, just how important has Keenan Bailey been to the whole uh, process? <clears throat> yeah, first of all, it's incredible that they've been able to hold on to him because he's a guy for now five years or so, four or five years. I've been hearing this kid, this guy is going to be a future star in this industry, or he is a future star in this industry. He's going to be a star. And I think, you know, when the NCAA approves expanding the coaching staff and no limits, I won't be shocked if the first promotion that Ohio State announces is, is Keenan Bailey. Um, he's just been on the field whether it's been quarterbacks or receivers, whatever he's been helping with. I mean, the players sing his praises. And then, I mean, Kevin, I mean, you know, you do the Southern swing and you talk to recruits and I, you know, me and Mark talk to recruits, especially in those, you know, he's from South Florida. Um, I believe he went to Notre Dame, but he's from that South Florida area. And uh, especially any time where he's involved in a recruitment, whether it's position wise or that region, they're not just talking about Brian Hartline. They're talking about Keenan Bailey as well. Um, sometimes even first out of their mouth. Like my relationship with Coach Key is, you know, better than with any other coach. And it's just it's been unbelievable what what he's been able to bring. And I think I think some of the guys that they brought on this offseason are going to bring some more of that. Macarary, um, guys like that. I, I, you're starting to see them more and more involved. And I think if and when they expand the coaching staff sizes and allow guys maybe like a Mark Pantone to go on the road as well to evaluate and visit kids. I think Ohio State is going to be really well positioned because they've, they've done a great job not only building out their, their 10 coaching staff uh, roster, but, but beyond that as well. And I know, Alex, you got to get going in a few minutes. We appreciate you stopping by, but let people know you are obviously part of the team at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Let people know what they can sort of expect from you moving forward. You have been killing it the last couple of weeks with a lot of coverage and a lot of breaking breaking some news on some recruitments and all that all that kind of fun stuff. Let people know kind of what they can expect from you in terms of as members of BuckeyeHuddle.com. What are they going to see from you over the next you know next month or next year, depending on how they uh, sign up? Yeah, for sure. Before I get into that, I did see a question from FW Buckeye. I'm going to make your day, Tom. Oh, his I question, saw that. Sorry, I forgot about that question one. was, who's going to make it further in the playoffs, the Mets or the Yankees? Tom's a Mets fan. I'm a Yankees fan. I'm actually going to the game tonight. That's why I'm wearing this. I wasn't trying to be obnoxious to Tom. Um, but I'm going to say the Mets, I think they're just better positioned to make a run right now with the team that they have versus the Yankees, who are an absolute dumpster fire. At the moment, if you thought Ohio State recruiting was bad, <laughs> take that level, lower it like 30 notches, and that's the level the Yankees are playing at right now. Um, I'm hoping Kevin's Dodgers can beat the Mets so that I don't have to deal with the Mets being in the World Series this year. But with Walker Bueller out, and I don't know what else is going on with Kershaw and things like that. They're getting May back on Saturday. All right, all right, that's big. But all right, anyway, back to your question, Tom. So, um, you know, I, you know, a deck every single week. So that's my, for those of you who aren't familiar, that's my kind of like insider column, mostly focused on recruiting, but could touch on some team stuff when I have it. Um, I'm also going to be doing a second written piece, kind of like a VIP type piece every single week. It's not necessarily going to be the same every week. Like, for example, I just spoke to someone earlier, got some great stuff on the team now that we're a little bit more in the camp. I'll probably put that on the site for, for our paying subscribers uh, tomorrow. So that's an example of that. Um, you know, during the season, I, I, I used to do like a Gleitman's, uh, Gleitman's game day guide thing with some of my betting picks and um, some other insights, thoughts on the college football playoff, who to root for, who not to root for. So we'll be rotating that. And then, you know, I'm, I am going to have a, a podcast. It won't be every week like it was on the last site, but I think it's going to be semi-regular. And I think I want to get, you know, me and Mark together as much as possible to talk about 
the big recruiting stories, obviously things like the Notre Dame recruiting weekend, or when we have a commitment that, you know, comes on board, like Jaden Bonsu being able to, to, to kind of do that. So um, I think that's what you can expect on a regular basis. And then obviously I, I heard Mark on your show this morning, talk about, you know, we're going to have the stories when the kids visit, we're going to recap their visits, all that stuff. But our goal for the paying members of the site is, you know, anyone could get, anyone could call up a kid or message a kid on social and get some of those quotes what's really going on in the recruitment, what's really going on with the team. And that's the type of stuff that I want to try to provide on a weekly basis for our subscribers. And maybe my favorite feature of the whole year is at the end of the class, when uh, everyone is sort of signed, sealed and delivered, then you do kind of like, here's the inside story. Here's what actually happened uh, that we couldn't, you know, the stories we couldn't necessarily tell you earlier in the cycle that always comes out kind of, you know, February, March ish, and is always one of the most popular features of the year. Uh, we, and you know, you will have, you will hear Alex on the morning show, you know, probably once a week, give or take throughout the, uh, throughout the course of the year. We always, we will talk about some of the stuff. There's always stuff that is, we don't talk about on the shows that is behind the paywall. So if you want the full story on all, if you want the full story on the full story on everything on inside the team, recruiting, the real stories behind all that stuff, got to become a member at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Well, Alex, Really appreciate you hopping on for us. Uh, you know, when Tony disappears, it's like, what are we going to do? Who, if Tony's not here to hold everything together, what will we possibly do? So we appreciate you uh, hopping on to uh, to uh, help us uh, bridge bridge that gap before he comes back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure, guys. Uh, I'll try to jump on maybe one more time if I'm able to before heading out to the, to the Bronx. But uh, yeah, definitely, definitely appreciate the time. Appreciate everyone who's been watching and listening and looking forward to seeing everyone at Buckeye Huddle. All right. All right. Thanks, Alex. Then drop off the show. There we go. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So, so that was Alex. And, you know, let's talk a little recruiting because you, you, I was talking to Mark on the morning show today about recruiting and how Alex and, and uh, he are doing all the recruiting. It's like, well, don't forget Kevin. Kevin covers recruiting too. It's like, that's true. Kevin does cover recruiting. You mentioned in just sort of in passing, you mentioned the Southern swing there when, when we were uh, talking to Alex. For people who don't know, what is the Southern Swing? We're not in Southern Swing season right now, but what is the Southern Swing? Uh, and, you know, why, why has that turned into an annual tradition for you and Mark? Absolutely. And, you know, I'll kind of go through, um, you know, the, the genesis of it. We were working for one of the networks, and um, it's difficult being a national regional recruiting guy. You are out there covering states, lots of states, and there's lots of, Lots of prospects, and these prospects have 8, 10, 15, 20 schools that they're looking at. And, you know, they, they were getting in front of these kids, and, you know, they would talk to somebody, and he would have a list of eight, and they would ask him about five schools. And Ohio State wouldn't get mentioned. And you can imagine that that didn't jive very well with us. And we are like, I mean, we get it that your job's difficult, but we've got thousands of members that need to know what's going on with Ohio State. So... We decided to do it ourselves, and that was many years ago, and the first trip was a week, and I think we just hit the state of Georgia. I think it was just the state of Georgia. You know, Going back into the Jim Trestle era, the state of Georgia has always been a priority for Ohio State, and that hasn't changed since Urban Meyer and now into Ryan Day. And with each year, I mean, we've expanded the territory a little bit, uh, I mean, I, it took a couple of years, but we start we dipped as far down into like Jacksonville. And then we said, well, now we're going to dip all the way down. We would go all the way down to like St. Thomas Aquinas, where uh, the Bosa brothers came out of in Fort Lauderdale. One week turned into two weeks. We would do uh, we would do like our Georgia, Florida swing, and then we would do a Texas swing. We had one year where we would we went out to Arizona when they were recruiting uh, Lathan Ransom and some other players as well, B. John Robinson, who obviously not end up going to Ohio State. But what is Southern Swing? It is a chance for Mark and myself to be able to get out during spring football, high school spring football, something we don't have in Ohio. So if we're not able to get it here, we'll go elsewhere. We get to see these kids in practice. And it's not always – we don't get to see all of them in practice because of the fact of – we're trying to hit two, three, four schools in a day sometimes. So we're getting kids before school. We're getting kids at lunch. We're getting kids in study hall. And then maybe we'll get somebody at practice. But we get a chance to have a more casual, more informal 
you do an interview like in a, like after a game, it's going to be about a three minute interview. During Southern Swing, we can talk to a kid for twelve minutes if if warranted. Uh, this this past year, we talked to linebacker uh, Raul Popo Aguirre. I think I think the original interview went twenty one minutes. I cut one down to a shorter version. And, you know, and then I, I put the unedited version up there. He ultimately ended up committing to Miami of Florida. And we should have known that when he talked about Miami for about nine minutes of the 21 minutes. But, you know, it's 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 a chance and it's something that, you know, we're seeing other people starting to do more of. But, you know, I don't I don't like playing that we're first, but we were first to get out there and do this. And and it's important because not only. Not only do we get to know we get to know the kids a little bit better. Not only do we get to tell some stories that maybe you're not going to get on a phone call. When these kids are getting sick and tired, you know, when you're a sophomore and you're in recruiting, it's like, oh, I can't wait to have all these followers on Twitter and Insta and everything else. By the time we get to senior, they're sick and tired of it. So who are they going to pick up the phone for? For Mark, who you know came out to their school and we did a 15 minute interview with them. Or, you know, some other guy who they don't know from Adam. So Southern Swing is so important. You know, so so many people have helped us out along the way. We've met so many great kids. I go through just the archives of, of some of the stuff I have from Southern Swing. A lot of guys who are in the league right now, which is it's just crazy. It's 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 a lot of work, but it's really one of my favorite events of the year. Well, I mean, you, I think you hit on a very important point at the end there, and this is why like this is this is why you pay to be a member of a site that has a you know a couple full-time significant focused recruiting analysts like Alex, like Mark, you know Kevin obviously involved in that process too, but you you have to what is recruiting about? When you talk to any recruiting guy, talk to any coach when they say what what is the important piece of a recruitment and it's comfort and relationships. That's that's the thing. And that's true of coaches. That's true of programs. That's true of high school. You know, the, the players themselves. It's also true of covering these guys. If, you know, to your point, if you've gone and you've met these guys and you've spent time with them and you know their coaches and you've met, you know, maybe met their parents. I mean, yeah, that you're going to guess what? You're going to get better information. And even when people to your, you know, to your Raul Aguirre story, even when people are trying not to, uh, you know, tip their hands on stuff, sometimes you talk to people enough you can kind of figure out what they're thinking, even if they don't want you to know what you're thinking and you end up having better information that way. That's the information that that's what you're paying for. That's one of the things you're paying for at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Uh, one of the big benefits of being a member is you get access to all of that insight, all of those relationships. Uh, and, you know, all Mark, Mark has been doing this and Alex has been doing this for a long, long time. They have uh, they have a lot of contacts with a lot of colleges, a lot of high schools, lots of players. That is that is one of the big benefits. So if you want to know, like if you want to know before the news actually breaks, that's that's how you do it. Uh, the banner right there on the screen. We did launch today, BuckeyeHuddle.com. If you want to become a member, you can sign up today. We have uh, monthly memberships for twelve ninety nine a month, annual memberships for one hundred and twenty four dollars and ninety nine cents a month uh, a year. And you know, if you're not sure, if you've never been a member of a site like this, and you're like, I, I don't know, maybe like you know, might might be willing to give it a try. Try it for a month. See if you like it. If you don't, that's fine. We we get it. But uh, yeah, that first month will include the Notre Dame game and the lead up to the Notre Dame game, and which should be a very very exciting and interesting time for this uh, for this program. So, and there's lots of uh, lots of stuff to uh, lots of stuff to talk about right now with with current program, with recruiting, with X's and O's, all that stuff. Lots of people suggesting Gaze in the Glight podcast as a name for uh, for Alex and uh, Mark's podcast. I, I'm excited for that one. That's always, I, I always, I always enjoy listening to guys talk about recruiting because they really know what they're talking about. And like, like we've said on the show before, sometimes you guys ask us recruiting questions and Tony and I kind of go, mm, let me think about what Mark or Alex has told me in the past. And then that will, we will relay that information. So uh, that's, they, they, they are the experts that we turn to. They are the experts that you should turn to as well. Uh, FW Buckeye wants to know, did Tony go to Golden Corral for lunch? Tony is uh, actually doing another show right now. Uh, he will be back probably. I'm guessing he'll be back around two thirty, so uh, we'll have we'll have Tony back again after that. Yeah, we didn't uh, how long we're going to go tonight? I mean, you know, I know we've we've thrown various numbers out there. I'm looking. We've just crossed the four hour threshold. I'm I'm holding out well, but you know, I I don't know if we're going to make it right <laughs> to five. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, we're. Uh, 
we have not, yeah, we have not set a uh, set an end time. We have definitely broken our record for longest live stream so far. Tony and I did like three three and a half hours uh, the day after the Rose Bowl uh, at a hotel out of LAX. We were just killing time and didn't have anything else to do. Over four hours right now. That's the new high score. Uh, Parker Seymour says we're being an Ohio State site. Not a lot of Ohio MLB teams being supported here. Yes, Alex is based out of New Jersey. I grew up in the Northeast, so he is a Yankees fan. I'm, I'm a Mets fan. Kevin. Lived in L.A., so he is a, yeah, he's a Dodgers fan. Tony grew up in Northwest Ohio as a Cubs fan. That's just because he's a bad person. So uh, he's the only one who really doesn't uh, doesn't have an excuse. Uh, yeah, everyone else, everyone else is not necessarily from uh, not necessarily from Ohio. Go Blue Jackets, though. All all in on the Blue Jackets. So uh, we'll Be sure we're, uh, Tony the... in pods at Big Tony sixty nine at Netscape dot net. <laughs> Um, Ozzy says, I know we're currently talking about recruiting, but curious if the interior rushing attack is struggling again this year. And, you know, that feels like that's at least one of the concerns that to me, to you, Kevin, is that kind of schematically or just in terms of like an area of the offense is the interior offensive line and that interior running game. Is that the biggest concern you would have right now for the team on the offensive side anyway? You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see. I mean, I just think offensive line in general, since they made the move to Justin Fry and what's going to happen there, they're going, you know, we're not four tackles in the center now. They're much more traditional. I, I, I totally, I'm totally supportive of what Luke Whipler, what Matt Jones, what Donovan Jackson are going to be able to do. But, you know, we, we sat there and we did talk to Kevin Wilson and he did say that, you know, if it was third and short, he's not exactly confident in what they would be able to do at this point. So that's something that they've got to get better at. Um, you know, we've got a lot of time. Today is only the 17th. I think we talked to Kevin Wilson on the 15th. So they got they got several more practices to get there. Plus two, they're always going to undersell. They're always going to undersell what it is that they're seeing at that point. I mean, if they come out and it's like, we're perfect, we're going to just sit there and, and just booty blast everybody that goes around. That's not going to, that's, you're, you're, you're setting a very high bar at that point. So, um, you, you know, I, I do think that there are some concerns in terms of what they're going to get there because it's the unknown, and we don't know. I mean, Donovan Jackson was a reserve last year. I mean, we certainly saw Matt Jones. We certainly saw uh, Whipler, uh, but we didn't, you know, we haven't seen what this iteration of the line is going to look like. Uh, you know, I've talked to some people around the team who who are, you know, are cautiously optimistic that the running game is going to be much more consistent this year. Uh, I hadn't really heard the, the the short yardage issues, but again, that doesn't surprise me at this point. Plus two, you know, not. I think I'm going back about two hours on the show, so if a lot of you haven't heard this, I can understand. You're you're not taking everybody to the ground at this point. You're having to sit there and do a lot of things in practice of where you're doing thud and things like that. So you don't know what you don't know, and you know every time that you do have somebody go to the ground, you hold your breath because. You know, injuries are a very real part of the game, and, you know, Ohio State has not been immune from it either. So, um, yes, Ozzy, I, I, I agree with you. I would say that is a concern. But, um, you know, what I would like to see in terms of some of that interior running attack is uh, feed chop. Yeah, Mayan Williams could be a solution there. And here's the other thing. This time of year, you know that the interior running game is not getting a great push. They're, you know, potentially they're getting pushed back and a little bit during some of the practices we've gotten to watch. That can mean one of two things. That can mean there's an issue with the interior of the offensive line, or it can mean, boy, the Ohio State defensive line could be real, real, real good this year. This is the the spring game problem where every completion is a pass, you know, is a pass that your defense gave up, and every interception that your your defense, you know, picks off is, whoa, boy, that was a terrible throw by the quarterback. It can be good news. It can be bad news. It can be somewhere in between, and you kind of you kind of won't know until you know they, they put the pads on for real on September third and they they go play Notre Dame. I, you know, I, I think it's you know as far as concerns go, it's a you know I, I think it's at least something to to keep an eye on, something to you know something to monitor. I don't know that it's something that Ohio State fans need to be losing sleep over right now, but it, it, you know as far as as far as concerns go to me. You know, outside of like the backup offensive line, which I think is the one of the other concerns there, that that's probably the biggest thing to kind of keep an eye on right now. Uh, Jonathan Moody, and now we're now we're in Kevin's wheelhouse. 
Kevin, what is your rib cooking method? Kevin, if you have not seen Kevin's uh, Twitter uh, profile, his uh, Twitter banner or whatever the background thing is called is uh, you with two guys who uh, I was reliably informed are uh, like Food Network people or something like that, like they're famous they're, famous barbecue people. Yeah, they're they're, they're competition barbecue guys uh, from Rectech who makes my uh, my smoker. Uh, not to get too long winded on this, Johnny Trigg, who is legendary in the uh, in the in the space, has like a three to one method, and I use a modified version of that. And basically, what that is is you go three hours uncovered on the smoker, you wrap it in tin foil uh, with but on the top of the ribs and a little on the bottom too. You use honey, brown sugar. And, you know, I put some barbecue sauce in there and you fold it up. And the, per, the reason behind that is, is after three hours, you've gotten all the smoke that you really want into the ribs. You've gotten the color that you want into the ribs. So you wrap it up tight in the foil and then it kind of almost like braises in there. So that's the two. And then after that, you pull it out, you take them off, you take them out of the tin foil, you put them back on sauced if you're a sauced person and you do that for an hour. In the three-hour point, though, about every 30, 45 minutes, I spray it with uh, a mixture of apple cider vinegar, water, and apple, uh, apple juice. But I've cut the times down. I'm more about like a two-and-a-half, one-and-a-half, 45, because I was finding that they were getting too done and that the bones were falling out of the ribs when I would take them off the final time. And I want to have a little bit more chew on my rib. All right, so two and a half, one and a half, and 45. That's four hours and 45 minutes. So you're telling me that if you had started making ribs when we started doing this, we could be eating ribs in like half an hour. We got we to gotta change our game plan for the next time we do one of these. I don't know the next time we're going to do a uh, four-hour-plus uh, live stream, but uh, you know, the next time we do it, I'm going to expect some ribs at the end. Jonathan Moody jumping in says he has a 700 and a bullseye. I have the same configuration. My bullseye is messed up. I had some wet pellets in it and the augers jam. So basically I don't have a bullseye right now, but the 700 is my main unit. Um, I, I love using it. Unfortunately, you know, hashtag stick to sports meats gotten really expensive. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing as much stuff out there right now, but it's, uh, it, it, it's great. They say that once you reach a certain age, you either get into smoking meats or world war two history. I enjoy both. I enjoy both. So I must be really cool or really old. Go out there with a uh, hardcore history episode on your headphones and just spend six hours listening to Dan Carlin talk about the war in the Pacific and uh, grill some meats. That sounds that sounds pretty good. Uh, all right, so next one. Uh, first of all, uh, Media Shed says they play baseball in Ohio, which is only funny if you know that he uh, is down in South Florida with the Marlins, which is, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, a AAA team uh, somehow playing in the NL East. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh yeah, Odysseus says the defensive line may just be that good, and that's that's the tricky thing this time of year is you just don't know. You can we are not getting to watch enough practice to really be able to discern is this dominant defensive line or shaky offensive line. We got to watch a little bit, you know, enough to see that this was you know potentially a developing situation, but not enough to really be able to evaluate like, hey, this is the defensive line just being incredible versus the offensive line you know, having issues or, you know, it's, it's one or the other, or it's both. We'll, we'll all find out together on September 3rd. Feels like it's kind of the answer right now. Uh, but you know, it's something certainly keep an eye on. Um, Peace Clan wants to know, glad you brought up the offensive line. What are the differences in skill sets required for guard and tackle? I never understood that. You want to, you want to tackle that one or you want me to? Um, you know, I think one of the things they say about guards, guards have big butts. I mean, you know, it's kind of, there's a little bit of a physical thing. You generally don't want your guards to be overly tall, but we've certainly seen, you know, Brandon Bowen, when he was playing guard was, you know, he, he, he's no short guy or whatever. Um, I think a lot of it too, is just your ability and your, you know, in your lateral movement. I mean, it just, Having never played the position, I don't know if Tom did. I mean, you know, I'm bigger than Tom in terms of that, but I, I, I never played the position. I just kind of know when I'm looking at when I'm looking on the recruiting trail of what I look for, and it's like, okay, that kid's a guard, that kid's a tackle, that kid's a tweener, or whatever. But in terms of actual execution, I'm going to defer. Yeah, I mean, you've got the the size is one piece. You don't want you know six foot nine guards because then that's 
those are people on the interior of the offensive line your quarterback has to throw over, which that is not an easy thing to do necessarily. But the difference between guards and tackles to me, generally, you know, most tackles can be guards. Not all guards can be tackles. It's a little like safeties and corners. Like most corners can play safety. Not every safety can play corner. And with tackles, you're looking a lot for feet. You know, how quick are the feet? Are they, you know, are they, do they move their feet? Are they reaching? Are they, you know, that's, that's a big thing. But, you know, quick feet, long arms. Those are, that's, those are a couple of things that you're really looking for just in terms of physical. Now, being tall often leads to long arms. So you can have shorter guys with longer arms. I think Jamarco Jones, if I remember right, Jamarco Jones was not particularly tall, but had pretty long arms. And that made him a pretty good tackle at the college level. Guards, a lot of times they're a little shorter, so instead of being the six five, six six guys, you get the six two, six three guys on the in on the interior of the offensive line. A lot more squat, uh, you know, not necessarily as much, uh, you know, not necessarily being asked to get out and and work in space as much as the tackles are. You you're not going up against those super quick edge rushers where you got to really get outside quick or really dip inside quick. Uh, it's more. I, I just always think of guard as more of a run blocking position and tackle as more of a pass blocking position. But you know, in general, that's sort of sort of the skill set you're looking for. Guard is just, you know, you gotta be able to get low. You still want to have quick feet, but it's just that's more of just like a strength position, whereas tackle is kind of more of a combination of strength and uh and quickness. Um related question, K Simon, wish Harry Miller would have stayed. Do hope he's doing well though. He uh, Harry Miller is still around the program. He was in the team picture this year. We've seen him out at the Woody quite a bit. Um and you know, first of all, he looks fantastic. He looks like he's dropped a lot of weight. He's he's, you know, running now. I think he said he was running like 6-minute miles now, which, you know, I don't know that you necessarily could have done at 310 pounds or whatever he was a year or two ago. But yeah, he he is by all accounts doing very well. Still involved with the program, you know that is that is a story that I think Ohio State fans have have been following with a, a great deal of interest and concern, uh, and it you know by all accounts seems like Harry's doing uh, Harry's doing pretty well. Uh, Tony dipping into the, I traded messages with his mom on social this mm-hmm. just in the last day or two. I mean because she saw the picture on him on the team picture or whatever, and I said I, I'm not speaking alone. We're so happy that Harry's doing well and everything and. You know, I, I don't I don't know what everybody's view is in terms of spirituality, but, you know, we kind of was like, you know, it's it, it's obvious that, you know, he's meant for, you know, for bigger things and everything. So, I mean, you know, according to mom, he's doing well. Spirits are high and, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's great to see. And it, it does bring up a very, you know, very, you know, not to move on to a somber note. I know we're going to be on the show for at least another hour and a half to, to pick it up, but. You know, there's such a stigma about mental illness. I mean, if you're, you know, if you have, if you're having trouble or whatever, don't be afraid to ask somebody. It's, it, I mean, there's, it's, it's not a sign, of, <clears throat> excuse me, a sign of weakness. You know, just, you know, in the stigma, you know, get help if you see somebody who's in trouble. You know, be there. You know, be there, be supportive because, you know, we, lose, losing one more person to it is one too many. Yeah, that, that is something that for sure, you know, mental, I think mental health is something that for, for you know, there, there's lots of stuff you can say, boy, this is not going as well as it used to be. I feel like the conversation around mental health is going a lot better than it used to be. I think there's a lot more openness and a lot more willingness to talk about it and, uh, you know, address it head on and not just sort of, you know, get, get told to toughen up buttercup. That's not, you know, that is not always, the, that might be the answer sometimes in some circumstances, but there are definitely circumstances in which that is not the answer. And uh, yeah, that is definitely, you know, Harry, Harry's story, I think, is, is an inspiring one and someone who's, you know, done, doing the things he needs to do to, to continue to succeed and thrive in life. And uh, yeah, destined, destined for bigger things for sure. Anytime you talk to Harry, you come away very impressed, I think. So yeah, all the, all the best to him and really, really glad to see him still around the program. Uh, Odysseus with a couple interesting ones here. Aren't defenses usually ahead of offenses at this point of fall camp? And the answer is a lot of cases, yes. Uh, I think you, you know, with an offensive line that has been together and really not switched since the spring, you would expect them to have gelled maybe a little better than they have in a largely veteran offensive line at this point outside of Donovan Jackson, really. And then, uh, you know, the defense, there's a lot of changes there. You know, you know, he brings up the defensive line coaching continuity with Larry Johnson while the offensive line is learning a new blocking scheme from Justin Fry, which is all true. But then the rest of the defense is all entirely new. 
So, and then Larry Johnson has sort of been adapting to uh, what Jim Knowles is trying to do on the defense, and, and you can talk about that in a minute, but you know, the, yes, it's a new offensive line under uh, coach for Justin Fry, but the rest of the offensive staff, there's has been 100% continuity, continuity. There's been a lot more turnover on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, uh, Larry Johnson talked this week about what, you know, he, he has been a just four down guy for basically as long as you can remember. And now he's not, you know, Jim Knowles is asking him to do some different stuff. And, you know, that for someone who has been doing this as long as, as you, uh, you know, as Larry Johnson has, there's the old old dog new tricks saying and you know a lot of times there's something you know there's something to that but it sounds like Larry Johnson is maybe you know impressed enough with Jim Knowles that it's like all right I'll I may be willing to learn a new trick here wrestling the cat who just jumped into my lap because she's shocked that I've been up here this long um yeah I mean I think that's one of the big things is that you know Larry First of all, everybody's ready to put Larry out to retirement. Is this the year? I mean, one year deals or whatever. And he came out during his interview and said, I'm going to do this as long as I'm having fun. And, you know, I've also talked to him at other points where he's like, I'm going to do this as long as my wife tells me it's okay to do this. And, you know, bringing home a substantial paycheck, keep working, keep working. But, uh, you know, I, you, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And, you know, it's certainly, you know, Jim Knowles comes in as the head coach of the defense. And, while I'm sure he's not there to run roughshod over everybody, he, he's going to kind of get what he wants, and Larry's going to have to adapt. And to Larry's credit, he's been adapting with what what it is that they're going to do there. So um, it, I think one of the biggest things, too, is that, you know, at this point, there, we've not seen any, you know, major changes in terms of personnel. Everybody that they're planning on having, they have. Uh, you look at, you know, you look at some of these, you know, young guys who didn't have a senior season. They've had a, you know, they've had a whole off season to work with Coach Mick, you know, to play football, to to be able to get ready. So Larry's, you know, Larry's continuity. He's familiar with all these, all this personnel. And I know we talked about this again. You know, we're going to repeat some stuff four hours ago about, you know, how many starters do you have? You know, ten, twelve. I mean, you know, it's it. We've, we've seen it. I mean, we've used uh, pro football focus before in terms of their snap counts. And, you know, you're going to have some guys who are going to get 40 and some guys that are going to get 31 and some guys that are going to get 28. But all these guys are going to be out there. And, I, you know, I credit a lot of that in terms of his continuity because, you know, with his longevity within the program, because you bring somebody else in and they might be doing something different. Yeah, and, and I think having Larry Johnson there, they turned over the entire defensive staff last year to keep Larry Johnson while you're turning over the entire rest of the defensive staff, to me, I think is is indicative of, one, the respect that he garners within the program. There is a reason that he was the guy who was uh, the interim coach when Ryan Day had COVID for the Michigan State game in 2020. Like, he he is a guy who has pretty much universal respect in that program. And number two, I mean, the recruiting at his in his position group, Alex mentioned that as a spot where they're still trying to add a couple more guys for 2020, 2023. But it also is that's not a spot where I don't think there's a huge concern right now because it's just kind of like, well, well, Larry Johnson will bring in another great class because Larry Johnson always brings in a great class. And that's just kind of how it is. And he's already got uh, Jason Moore, who's a top 50 player. And uh, they're in on uh, several other five star type guys there as well. And, you know, you add one one or two more of those and boy, you got another great Larry Johnson class. How about that? Um Oh, Zell, Sue says Zach Herbstreet just lost his black stripe. He is a walk on tight end number 89. Uh, he's someone who I don't know what to expect. I don't know if he's someone who you know, he, he's probably he, they talked about four tight ends who were kind of ready or almost game ready. He was not one of them this week, but uh, still, that is very cool for him. Uh, he, uh, of course, Kirk Herbstreet's son and uh, had twin older brothers who both played at Clemson. So uh, now he is playing at Ohio State. And then they have a younger brother who is a 2025 quarterback who we saw at a camp at one point over the summer. You know, we'll, I'm not, you know, we'll see. It's still quite a ways to go for him uh, to see where he ends up in college. But uh, yes, the Herb Street family, still uh, still a big name around uh, Ohio State football. Uh, Sue also wants to know, will we see a physical fight on the field this year between Ohio State and Michigan? And boy, Kevin, I, you know, if you told me there was a fight on the field during, you know, before one of the games, we have seen plenty of years where the blood gets boiling beforehand and there's at least some pushing or shoving or stare down. And, you know, you see the, the intro for that game every year on, uh, you know, when they put the montage of, of footage together of past games and them tearing down the banner at Michigan Stadium in 1973 and all that. 
there's always lots of pushing and shoving, lots of, uh, you know, lots of stare downs, lots of teams having to be separated at the 50 yard line. What do you think? Do you see a fight on the field this year before or during the Ohio State Michigan game? I'm going to say no, and here's why. It's not because there isn't the hatred. It's not because the blood is boiling. But I think that oh, that Ryan Day is going to have his guys so well conditioned going into that game not to take the bait. There have been some times, and I, I don't want it to be, you know, Ohio State host accuses Michigan of being – cheap shot artists or whatever but it seems that under current administration that i think that they that part of the 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 psyops there are to see if they can push ohio state's buttons and get them out of their uh routine a little bit and i think that ohio state has to be you know too smart for that because you sit there and you let emotion overrule everything else and then and and then it becomes a little bit more of a great equalizer at that point when you sit there and you take, you know, how you've been coached and everything else out of the equation and it just becomes much more instinctual. And, yes, you want to sit there. We talk all the time about, well, they simplified the defense so I didn't have to overthink it and I can act on instinct. Well, that's different than so-and-so grabbed me in the pile or something like that or some, something else along those lines. And and we we know we know that the second hit is the one that's always seen. It's not the first one. It's the retaliation. So I, I would hope for Ohio State's sake that they don't take the bait there. I mean, we certainly have seen, you know, the Marcus Hall double bird, you know, Grant Schwartz nearly getting into it in the tunnel. I mean, we, we, we've seen things in the past. But one nice thing, too, is that with the game being at Ohio Stadium, they have separate ways to come in and out of the facility you're not going up the same tunnel, which just leads to trouble. Yeah, you're not going up and down the same tunnel, but you are at Ohio Stadium crossing the field. You you kind of, Ohio State comes in from the southeast corner and then has to go to the west sideline. Michigan comes in from the southwest corner, has to go to the east sideline. So you do potentially cross. I remember the 1996 game. I think Michigan came out and almost ran over. I think, I think it was Greg Belisari was the person for doing senior day. And uh, the Michigan team like almost ran over Greg Belisari's parents and, you know, the Marcus Hall incident in 2013, you mentioned the uh, famous uh, salute to the number 11. I think I, if I'm remembering right, I haven't gone back and watched that game in ages, but if I remember correctly, that was sort of predicated on like a kick return and there was like a fight uh, on a kick return or, you know, or the Michigan players all surrounded. Uh, and I'm not, now I'm not remembering where the kick returner was in 2013, but, uh, you know, surrounded Dontre Wilson, maybe uh, surrounded Dontre Wilson or whoever the kick returner was. And then they kind of got started into a fight. And I think that was sort of what led into the Marcus Hall situation. So oh, it was all yeah. part of that. The helmet was thrown. And mm -hmm. I think everybody at first thought, oh, no, it was Bradley Roby, but it was Dontre Wilson that got bounced. And the Marcus Hall was bounced as well. And Michigan had a, a backup linebacker that was bounced in that game. But, you, I mean, even leading up to that, you could see the cauldron bubbling. You, know, you could tell that something was going to was going to happen. Here, yeah, uh, Shed has got in here. Uh, <laughs> a face mask. Uh, Dontrell Willis. Yes, the, our, our, Mar our favorite Marlins fan mentioned game-checking Dontrell Willis. Not quite. Almost. There, uh, there you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Hutchinson, uh, Hutchinson stealing J.K. Dobbins' shoe in 2019. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and, yeah. And that's oh, yeah. A, yeah, that is. You can't take the bait. You can't take the bait. And, you know, these teams, you know, they've got dietitians, they've got sports psychologists or whatever. You just mm -hmm. can't, uh, you can't allow that. So you can't allow that to happen because honestly, it's it's like the, you know, oh, we're just going to go to a team's best player and, you know, we have some scrub who gets bounced but takes them out with them or whatever, then great. I mean, you just, and I'm not saying anybody's doing that, but I do think that, again, I think there's some psychological warfare going on there. I mean, it's fine. All is fair in love and war in terms of this, but you know, you can't don't, don't swing back. Don't swing back. All right. You had a good one from Jordan Kapler up on the screen earlier. What's a sports moment or victory that you were just absolutely giddy about? It's recent, but for me, it was a payback win against Clemson. I would guess from having done a post game show with Tony Gerdeman after that game, I'm going to guess that's the answer for a lot of Ohio state fans. I know 2018, the Michigan win, when Michigan was, I think, came in favored and it was the revenge tour year and all that kind of stuff. And Ohio State just completely blew them up with 62 points. That I know was a very popular one with Ohio State fans. 
you uh, you have just recently watched your baseball team win a, win a World Series. I'm going to guess that's probably near the top of the list for you. That's near the top of the list. When the Blackhawks won the Stanley Cup in uh, in 2010, that being because I'd never seen any real success from the Blackhawks before. I mean, they had you know they had the team in the in the early mid 90s that just couldn't quite get there. But I mean, they hadn't won one since like the 60s or something. So I was thrilled there. It's it's weird because here's here's something, and y'all have heard us talk about this before, but we have to sit there in order to do the job properly. You have to kind of divorce yourself from, you know, where you went to school, or, you know, the team that maybe you grew up rooting for or whatever. So there are times that I leave a game and I'm done writing. Well, I'm done writing for that moment. I know there's more writing to be done. There's never done. Uh, and you sit there like, wow. That really was a moment that, you know, I walked out of and it wasn't a case of me being giddy, but just recognizing the, the uniqueness of the situation, the 2014 Big Ten championship game against Wisconsin, 59 nothing with Cardale Jones, a quarterback. I mean, that was just something of where I was walking out with Tim May of uh, then of the Columbus Dispatch. And he's like, and I'm not going to try and pretend to do his voice because I, I can't <laughs> do voices. Um, I'll never be able to work on a cartoon. Uh, he's just like, Kevin, I've covered this team for a long time, and I've never seen anything like that before. And I'm like, you're right. I and mean, I probably never will. Yeah, that, so, that, that is was- a sh- – yeah. That's as shocked as I can remember being after a game, I think. I mean, outside of – you know, I mean, the Purdue 2018 game, that was shocking. The 2017 Iowa game was shocking. There aren't that many positive shocks for Ohio State fans. That 2014 Big Ten Championship game, I, I remember thinking beforehand – I could see just about anything happening. You had Cardale Jones was essentially just the guy with the one tweet, and that's about all anyone knew about him at that point. And so you're throwing this guy in, and you're going against a Wisconsin team that had Melvin Gordon in it. You know, that was a good Wisconsin team, and uh, for Ohio State to come in, you know, I, I remember thinking, yeah, I, nothing would surprise me in this game except for a blowout Ohio State win. Like I, I could see Ohio State getting blown out. I could see Ohio State winning. Cl- Ohio State getting winning close. I could see Ohio State losing close. And then you got, you know, then it's what, 38 nothing or whatever at halftime. It was like, what is going on? <laughs> what, what is happening here? That was, that's about as surprised as I can remember ever being uh, watching an Ohio State game. As far as my, uh, let's see, sports moments or victories, I was absolutely giddy about. Well, the Mets won the World Series when I was in third grade. That was pretty great. Um, I, uh, I can remember uh, when they won the pennant in 2015, the Mets uh, swept the Cubs in four games. That was pretty great. Uh, and uh, the Rangers winning the Stanley Cup in 1994, the first time since 1940. Haven't won it since then. Only time since 1940 that they have uh, won the Stanley Cup. That was uh, pretty great. Still a little salty. I had a uh, like a chemistry final or something in uh, whatever sophomore year of high school or yeah sophomore year of high school. So I couldn't uh, couldn't go to the Rangers parade in New York. Uh, not that I'm not that I'm still bad about that at all. I'm sure how I'll get over that, it very how much of that chemistry have you used in your everyday life? Um, in the lot, none actually. Well, not not none. I have I don't have kids getting about to that age. No, it's important. You need to pay attention. It's you got to learn. Education's very important. It's all very practical. Uh, 2015 Sugar Bowl beating an SEC team in Tama is greatest Ohio State memory. That's from Odysseus. That that's another one where that that game was. I mean, that game was 21 to six, and it was like, boy, that you know, you you, you had people crowing on Twitter about how you know, oh boy. Another dominating SEC win, and then that game just swung. That was twenty-one-six, and all of a sudden, boom! Ohio State is. What did they run off? Twenty-eight straight points, something like that. It, it was that was as that was about as big a momentum swing as you can remember in a game. Uh, you know where it wasn't just like one fluky play. It was you know Alabama had very much set the tone, and Ohio State's kicking field goals, and it's like that's not going to work. You're not going to win the game with field goals. And then the whole thing swings, and you get the uh, the famous Evan Spencer pass to Michael Thomas, and then the 85 yard Ezekiel Elliott run for the, you know, what seemed like Heart a capping foul. touchdown. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and that was a game where it felt like Ohio State had it won, and then Alabama somehow ends up with the ball down what six points, and like throwing the ball towards the end zone at the end of the game, and and it's get like, down, Tyvis, get down. Yes, <laughs> Tyvis Powell picks it off. 
Yeah, that was that was one where it felt at one point like it was over and Alabama had it won, and then it felt like it was definitely over and Ohio State had it won, and then somehow Alabama's throwing a Hail Mary into the end zone to win the game at the end, and it was like, what? How, how did this happen? Our uh, One of our resident Notre Dame fans, Michael Campbell, who <laughs> he's – He's, he's unique. I'll say that. I like Michael. He, he's unique. But the Appalachian State over Michigan, I actually, when I, I, true story, we were in the post-game room at Ohio Stadium after Ohio State played whoever. and uh, Youngstown had, State. Yeah, and they had the game on the TV. And generally about two minutes before head coach comes up, they turn the TVs off. So we're just like, we're like, oh, my God. So we're all trying to, like, keep track of it on our phones. I mean, you know, this we're not that far back in history that we didn't have the benefit of of smartphones, and then you know we're I mean, Trestle comes out there, and then we hear uh, we hear the roar from like the concourses, and we're like, oh boy, and you know <laughs> we're all kind of like looking at our phones. It's like holy cow, I can't believe that happened. And then when I went and I watched the highlight, even though I knew the outcome. I have to admit, there was a little bit of giddiness there just because you kind of like the underdog sometimes when they're going against, you know, quote unquote, the rival. <laughs> yeah, that that was a good one. I was in the car driving back from uh, Virginia Tech. I was covering something down in Virginia Tech that weekend and I uh, was driving back and was in the middle of nowhere and kind of got this text message. Like, in the early days of text messaging, it was like, that can't be right. That not not possible. A uh, couple uh, Steve Buckholz says the Blue Jackets will be a playoff team at least this year. I mean, got Johnny Hockey. It's going to be an interesting team for sure. Uh, if you were, by the way, if you were looking to go to a Blue Jackets game, if you were, you know, those those are not cheap tickets. Always go find a, one of the in, one of the exhibition games. Those are uh, those are very very uh, reasonably priced tickets. You can get them on the secondary market for almost nothing. And you know, it's not going to be. It, you go to one of the midweek games. We have tickets for the Wednesday game against the Sabers, and. Uh, you know, it's a you'll have five thousand, six thousand people there, and uh, still get to go see a good hockey game relatively inexpensively. Get good seats; those are a lot of fun. There's a little there's a little life hack for you from uh, someone who's gone to more than a few Blue Jackets games over the years. Um, Michael also mentions uh, Texas A&M beating Alabama last year. Yes, I had I gave my son a very condescending lecture about how he was wasting his time, and there's no way that Texas A&M was going to beat Alabama, so he should watch the other you know whatever other game was on at that time. And, uh, yes, he, he has brought that up as recently as this week. So, um, so yes, kids are the best. Speaking of the best, Tony Gerderman is back. How about that? Not in the middle anymore. Are you hot shot? Uh, Kevin, can you take us to a two? Just me and you. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good. It's good to be back. Uh, what have you guys been talking about? Anything that I, that I've missed that I should chime we've in on? Would be about, a- we've talked about barbecue. We've talked about, uh, well, ribs in particular, we've talked about um, like a sports moment that just made you giddy. Uh, we were just kind of going through that and we kind of dovetailed into shocking, uh, you know, to kind of get back to an earlier point. You know, Ohio State's favored in so many games that, you know, there's just not a lot of opportunity for it to be just a shocking outcome on the positive side. I mean, there's certainly been the ones that have been the, the, the great letdowns. Um, we certainly have talked about this new website. Have you heard of it? It's called Buckeye Huddle, and it's fantastic, and you should probably sign up right now. Hmm. I, I saw someone earlier saying that the uh, yeah, membership is continuing to explode. Nice work, gentlemen, and thanks for doing this marathon show. Because, yes, these are these are folks who are, uh, if you're on our board, you can, you know, get a sense for how many people are actually signed up and being a part of it, of site right now. It sounds like, sounds like it's going pretty well. Tur- turns out there's an interest in Ohio State football. Uh, uh, what, the... Before you go, Tom, uh, Kevin, can you ban Jonathan Moody? Who has said stop, stop talking about Tony? This is the kind of stuff we do not need here. No, Jonathan Moody. I think Jonathan Moody was the one who was asking me about ribs, if I remember right. I, I, I'm about ready to nominate him for Poster of the Week. You also, Tony. You also missed our, our good buddy Alex Lightman. Stop by for a while. He said, "When is Tony not going to be here?" And we said, "One thirty. He said, "Great, I'll be there." So had a great conversation with Alex. Talked some recruiting. Talked uh, sort of the inside uh, the inside stuff on how the recruiting business all works and uh, who, who actually does what with the Ohio state program and all that kind of stuff too. Good, good. Is Keon Keeley going to be a Buckeye or what? Well, I think we're just going to have to wait and see if I see it. As Alex said, you know, he, he's not sure if he'll be committed to Notre Dame by the time that the Notre Dame game's there. I mean, I guess we'll have to kind of wait and see. And then he's got to visit on the third and 
you know, Ohio State and Alabama are hot on the heels. And, uh, you know, I think Ohio State has a decent shot there. But you never know. You know, with top kids, I mean, you're, you're recruiting against the best. Oh, yeah. Moody, Jonathan Moody also got you about the ketchup on the steak. Mm-hmm. And he used the correct spelling when I talk about Tony and ketchup. Ketchup. I'm glad I was missed. <laughs> and you are? Just scrolling through, uh, scrolling through some of these comments. Uh, Lewis Lee, 10, 15, 10, 14, Do you think Knowles takes a similar approach to stop a mobile Buckner as he did against Caleb Williams last year? Do, did you did you watch Bedlam last year, Tony? No, but that's a that's a good idea to go back and and check that out. Because um, what did I I've seen? No, I've seen some of it. Um, but you know what? I, I probably wasn't watching for that. Um, let's see. What did he do last year in that game? In, against Oklahoma State, he threw for – he's 20 of 39, 252 yards, three touchdowns. I think that's – you're completing 51% of your passes. He's doing a pretty good job of being contained there. 19 rushes, 36 yards. That's that's the big one right there to me where um, – yeah, that's that's interesting. I I will uh, put that on my list. I have I had a YouTube list of, of games that I've been watching this summer. Um, maybe I wasn't. I don't know if I was able to even find that one because some of these games, you know, it's annoying. Like um, the the networks are like, hey, that's copyright infringement. That's our game, and so they get they get taken down. And so um, then then it's just like, well, here's a six minute highlight package, and you can't really get as much from that. But that's a good idea. Bedlam. YouTube. And and uh, I, I'm yeah. going to text Ross Fulton that exact question right now. And uh, maybe we'll see if we get Ross on. Uh, I'm not sure if Ross is around today, but we'll see if, I'm we'll here. See if Ross can. <laughs> anyway, so I'll text Ross Fulton and see if he has any thoughts on that. And this is, you know, when we, when we talk about, uh, when we go talk to smart people, we're not talking about Tony. We're, we're talking about people like Ross. Oh, Ross is smart. I mean, yes, we're, yeah, Ross, Alex, Mark. I mean, these these types of people. This is who. This is noon. This is <laughs> anyway. So yes, the, we're talking about people who are not on this call right now. That's that's who we're talking. Oh. Not not you. Not you, the listener, of course. The people. Yeah, the, the people. Yeah. You know who are the smartest people? The people who signed up for Buckeye Huddle. There you go. Same you know. Call. You know what? Uh, what I'm doing this week? At some point this week, I'm deleting all of last year's games from my DVR. It's time to make room. It's time to start uh, scrolling through and setting up recordings. And it's like it's it's like redecorating a room. It's like, oh, this is completely different. I have so much so much more room for activities and so much more room for recording games that um, will be too busy at games to watch. But then then come back home and it's like, do I do I want to watch that on a random Tuesday? And the answer is yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> Well, I like I, like Florida, Utah. Like we're not going to be able to see that, but no, I want to no. see it. I've I've got the whole first couple three seasons of Yellowstone on my DVR that I have to decide if I'm going to watch or not watch because they had a marathon and I never got into it and I I need to have the room. I only ha- I think I only have three games on the DVR right now. I have the Rose Bowl, I have Michigan State. And I don't know what the third one is. I'm, I don't. I don't remember. But I have, I have them all on a hard drive as well too. Well, look at you, fancy with your computers and everything. Um, anything? Uh, what else? Come on, run in the show. Run the show, Kevin. Run the show, Tom. Well, I mean, got people. It's not so easy, is it? People have been <laughs> on here for a long time. Steve Buckles, who is a recent sign up for. Uh, for the site, giving us a chance, signed up for a month. So love it. Uh, says he was 60 when the show started. Now he's 62. So you know what? We're, we, and, and we've been asked how long the show is going to go. And I said, it'll go until it goes. I mean, I still have a hundred people on here. I'm not, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are very few of them have been here since minute one. If, you, if you've been here for the whole show, please let me know in the comments so I can sit there and, and, and applaud you. Or, you know, at least for having a job that allows you to be on the computer for almost five hours. Uh, here's here. We were talking about g- games that made people giddy earlier. Jonathan mm-hmm. Moody brings up a good one. This is one Tony and I experienced together on the field at Ohio State. Tony, you're transparent, apparently. Uh, your shirt. 
<laughs> with your green screen. That's funny. All right. Uh, yes, it, Jonathan, he's mentioned the 2017 Penn State game. Thought for sure we were losing that one. That was one where I, I was in the elevator. I stayed on the field to go get the team running out of the tunnel, and I was in the elevator up on the way to the press box and heard this roar, and it was like, I wonder what just happened there. I was like, oh, well, they, you remember when they said they shouldn't kick it to the um, Saquon Barkley? Yeah, well, guess what they just did? They just kicked it to Saquon Barkley, and it's 7 nothing. Um, and that was a game where it was just Ohio State was just behind the whole time, and it felt like they got, there were a couple bad calls that went against them, and the crowd is really surly. And then just out of nowhere, JT Barrett just went supernova. That was, that was one where... I will, uh, I will always, you know, we're on the field at the end of all of those games, you know, but that was one that I feel like I will always remember the, the mood on the field in that fourth, that fourth quarter of that game. Yeah, that was, he would not be denied. He was making such precise throws in the final, like six minutes of that game. It was amazing to watch. I, I remember following up and like writing a, now you've got to put JT Barrett in the Heisman hunt and he, he may just be, you know, leading the thing by the end of the season. He was 33 of 39 in that game for 328 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions. What did he rush for? I don't know if he rushed for a ton. Oh, 17 for 95. This was a legit, like, Heisman moment type of game, Heisman moments, and they could not be stopped. And then and then the record scratched, and they go to, you know, the Iowa game happened, and once he, you know – Start off with a was that a was that start off with a pick six in that one? And, yeah, and the Iowa. Just, yes, the first the first throw of the next game. Yes, yeah, four interceptions in that game. Four uh, to the following game against Michigan State. Uh, yeah, that was um, the highs and lows. That that was basically I'd say that was JT Barrett in a nutshell. Those two games, except. That's unfair because he was never really that bad as he was against Iowa in that game, that inexplicable game, where you just how did how did this even happen? And uh, I think we're still asking ourselves that every day. And, and Tom, as you said three and a half hours ago, well, you can't fear a team if if they only have a tight end. What's the worst that can happen? Iowa had two, and the worst absolutely <laughs> happened. Ooh, yeah. Wayne Taylor has a good one. All right, Wayne Taylor wants to know, are you guys going to create any Buckeye, Buckeye Heddle gear for the fans, hats, shirts, etc.? Yes, the answer is yes, uh, as long as you don't have a follow-up question that involves the word when. Uh, it will at some point happen. We actually are gonna, we're trying to figure out Buckeye Huddle gear for ourselves because the uh, game is in 17 days, the first game we're going to be covering. So ask me how I know that. Uh, they have... Uh, oh, when it, is the second game? Uh, 100... 203 days we're getting we're getting close there uh the um the uh, gear is on the list of stuff to do right now it is not the number one list number one thing on the list of things to do but we are uh, trying to figure that out but yes the goal is to have uh, an assortment of you know hats and shirts and uh, quarter zips and all the all the fun stuff that you want to wear we will uh, eventually have that for you don't worry we'll let you know we will uh, we will not we will not keep that a secret when it, when we do have that temporary tattoos there's a picture of there's a picture of Ryan Day at uh, I think I saw it at a hanging on the wall at Roosters where it's a picture and he's like he's got the whistle in his mouth and he's got a little bit of uh, beard growth and he's clapping or something like that and someone has photoshopped a you know one of those like temporary Ohio State tattoos in his cheek I'm like I don't think that was on the original version of this photograph I don't remember Ryan Day coming out with a uh, you know like one of the cheerleader temporary tattoos on his cheek for a game. I don't think that's a good look. Darn it, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I thought um, I thought the question that was in question or the comment was Wayne Taylor asking when is the bold prediction show for the ND game? That will be a week from two weeks from today, actually. That's a Wednesday show, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, well, maybe maybe if we all want to throw a bold prediction out there, we can. I will. Which would be better? A coach wearing like a Buckeye sticker, of of whatever, or they have to wear a football uniform on the sidelines. Like what? Which is which is worse? Which would you rather do? Like have sticker cheek stickers, or be dressed in football pants and in the jersey? You don't have to wear pads. It's encouraged. 
but you know, you're like a major, major league manager. You have to be out there in a, in a football uniform or just do spirit stickers. Spirit stickers I, versus eye black. I mean, it's it's not the the eye black tape or whatever, I'm because black. there's I think that there's a there's a there's a street cred difference between the two in terms of what's there. Jackie Hill comment right there. I'm gonna pause right here. <laughs> Yep, been here for the entire duration. I just mute when Tony comes on. That's a discerning viewer is what I'm what I'm <laughs> gathering there. Let's That's figure it out. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. And I, I don't know how that, that got punched up there even. Um, you know, I don't know who put that up there. Probably just by chance. Um, I just hit but I don't want to take comment. over your show. I wasn't paying it. I was I wasn't paying attention. I don't know how that one got there. Nate asking, Tony, who talks more? Tom, Kevin, or I'm assuming on the Mark Rogers show, Steve Hellwagon. <laughs> yeah, Wag- Wagon is not canon on this show, so I'm not sure he's a, he can be an acceptable answer. Yeah, and in terms of who, who, who put that last one up there, it was just a, a young staffer or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you almost got the spit take. <clears throat> I don't. I don't even know why. That's funny. Um. <laughs> That's good. Here's stuff. a question from Temper that uh, Tony and. I'm... Go ahead. Here's a question. Here's a question from Temper that Tony and Kevin will probably not have a lot of input on. Uh, what about Buckeye hockey? They any good this year? Uh, let me tell you, the women's hockey team going to be pretty good again this year. They, uh, of course, the defending national champions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Coach Moserol will have a uh, have a probably a very good team. I'm planning on trying to cover a little more of them this year because they are that is a fantastic program. She's a really really interesting person, um, and it's just that it, that is a sport that does not get as much coverage as it should. So we'll uh, we'll be covering a lot of women's hockey. Uh, I saw that the men were I don't believe in the top. They released a uh, preseason top sixteen. I don't believe the men's hockey team was in the top sixteen this year. So we'll uh, we'll have to see. I have not. I have. I will. I will tell you. I have not. Uh, done any kind of a deep dive on uh, men and the uh, men's hockey team yet this year but we'll uh, we'll be I'll be covering those games as well I'm sure from time to time I uh, I do enjoy hockey and uh, have a son who really enjoys hockey so we'll uh, we will undoubtedly make it to several Ohio State hockey games this year in in some kind of a work capacity or or not yeah on campus athletics um, hockey games in person are great combine those two and it's uh, it's fun stuff. Willie brings up a good point. Uh, good luck with the channel. I've already joined it. Do you have a regular schedule of shows? Tom, you have a regular schedule. I Kevin, do. Mine's not so yeah. regular. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, try fiber. Um, my show, I do the Buckeyes tomorrow morning show. Uh, that is, it releases in the evening. If we get the show recorded during the afternoon, it'll usually go up about 7.30. Sometimes the, you know, due to event schedules or just people schedules, that gets re- uh, sc- uh, released later on in the evening. Like last night, I read, co- co- read record with Mark. I had to do it pretty late, so it didn't come out till like 10 or so at night. But generally, you know, the evening before it will come up, it will come out, you know, Monday to, you know, I guess Sunday evening to uh, Thursday evening. And then once the season starts, it'll end up probably being a seven-day-a-week show again. Uh, and then Tony and I do Buckeye Weekly. Tony, when does that happen? More than more than once a week, I understand. Well, this is the difficult part of the schedule because it, it's we record sometimes after interviews um, at, at the at the WAC, and then but it, in terms of days, like probably every day pretty soon here. But when it gets released, depends on the day and and how quickly I can get back from we can get back from the woody to upload everything and so uh just just that's why it's good hit the bell you'll get notified but there's going to be stuff you know probably three things a day at least on average and sometimes 10 things a day based on interviews and streams and you know we're going to try to probably go live what one day a week at least and may, maybe more and maybe do a lot more uh, just because it's something that we want to do and maybe not maybe not 6 or 8 hours all the time three times to- three times a maybe. week max maybe yeah right uh but but Kevin what 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 kind of schedule are you thinking of for well, for big me kickoff i i actually was going to record one 
for launch today. And then I said, I'm going to be on for six hours or seven hours with these guys. I don't know if I have enough to say, but I am, I'm efforting. That's a good television word right there. I'm efforting three days a week, um, probably Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I may do my big or uh, my best, best noon sports show period on my personal channel once a week, just to keep that channel active. As Tom and Tony know, it is best to keep YouTube channels active at all times. So, uh, you know, that'll be there. But Big Me Kickoff will be my Ohio State-centric show looking Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, which means I will get all day Thursday to rest my voice. And then I'll probably record something Thursday night to have up for Friday morning. Uh, but you can catch all of that, you know, that all the great shows here on this channel. Be sure to subscribe. Hit that bell. Don't miss a single thing. Tea with honey. Try some of that. Keep your voice uh, fresh, and, and you'll be just fine. Michael um, asked an interesting question. Any new food items at Ohio State for the 2022 season? And starting with the Notre Dame game, Kevin replied in the comments, we have not seen an email yet. Normally they will put out an email with all of the new concession options out there and i have not been over to the stadium in a little while i was over there pretty re frequently while they were putting in the new turf and then you can sort of see like hey they're putting up new stands and then this hey this time it's like hey there's a there's there was like a lobster roll place a couple of years ago and i was like that is definitely new uh but i have not not seen anything official on that but th that is generally i mean that's, that's got to be like this week next week it is they generally will put that out a week or two before the season, and uh, we are we are just a week or two before the season, so getting getting close. Those lobsters straight out of the Olentangy. You can't get any fresher than that. Um, no. I, I do you think you can get this a will have a bread bowl. There you go, perfect. Uh, do you think this will have any impact on the Ohio Stadium press box food? No, that's a, that's the correct answer. Good job. <laughs> I mean, I'm not I, complaining. I I choose not to eat the press box food, but that's I like having that choice to not do that. Um, it just depends on the game or whatever. Like morning food is, uh, <laughs> we're gonna just do that as we're having a stream issue right there. <laughs> um, morning food is, uh, you know, we get like eggs and sausage and like home home fries or whatever. And then generally we, we might get some hot dogs for lunch. I think the three thirty and the night games are a little bit of a stronger meal, but I have a better chance of going through a drive through at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but my usual, my usual move on like a morning game will be to go hit like McDonald's on the way in and have uh, an egg McMuffin meal with a large Coke. Not a big fan of the, uh, the Ohio stadium eggs and potatoes and, sausage and then hot dog at lunchtime hmm. interesting interesting well i generally um, have four or five of those mcdonald's like fruit slushy things or whatever <laughs> yes tom's face was frozen like that too um that's why i was that's why, enjoying that's why it so much <laughs> started to lose it he is in the process of re-logging in Unfortunately, I'll let you in on a little of the secret of how this television works is that it all goes off of my internet connection and there is a certain internet provider here in Columbus that is inconsistent and I happen to be a subscriber of theirs. I am going to need to figure something out here soon. They're either going to need to fix it or I'm going to need to find something else because I will be hosting a lot of these things and my internet needs to work. Yeah, because right now I see you frozen now. Um, okay, oh, Simon, yeah, I thought he was he was having a deep thought. Uh, yeah, you're frozen to me. Um, yeah. As well, Steve says Steve you say that I'm, frozen. I'm looking no, at my back. speed. Back. They're horrible. They're, my speeds are horrible right now, and all I can do is wait it out. They came out to repair it a couple weeks ago, and they said, do you know in your internet relay out like in the backyard, you have yellow jackets? I said, no, it sounds like you have yellow jackets. I'm not going out there. Uh, apparently they took care of that. They gave me a new modem and within a day I was having the same issues. I just, I, I can only fight so many battles at a time. Dealing with their call center is very low on my list of what I want to do, but it needs to be much higher on my list of what I need to do. I love talking to customer service. Um, Steve Buckholz, if Tony's all we got left and he's leaving, 
under I understand that. Like, it, it, trust me, if I was the last one here, I'm leaving. Like, I'm we've a full day of work has been put in. So, um, but yes, we are all back now. Tom, I think, is just not being allowed in by Kevin right now, which is totally fine. Okay He's not in that. the green room. I'm telling you, I'm looking. I don't think you actually have to look. It just pops up. No, here he comes. Here he comes. Uh Let's see if he's he's moving. Give me a thumbs up if you're here so I can see if you're not frozen. All right. (laughs) Now who's in the middle? (laughs) My my webcam just stopped working, so that was good. That was that was a fun uh, a fun result that I was not expecting here. Apparently, it might it might have gotten tired after five hours. I don't know. I've never obviously never, my uh, internet the webcam too. <laughs> it's Tony's fault. It was all working fine before Tony came back. I just want to point that out. Was it? <laughs> um. What now? Well, here's a. Uh, <laughs> Sue, the answer to the your question is yes. Uh, Yakov, did you guys answer the Schottenstein Center question and what happens no, with the shot? That's a, that's an interesting one from Yakov. Would you would you guys rate the Schottenstein Center Arena as a C minus at best? Do you see OSU building a new one in the next ten years? That's a really interesting question because I think the Schottenstein Center. I was in college when that was built, and that was going to be this like groundbreaking, incredible new thing and state of the art. And it's like, yeah, okay, that was now twenty. Four years ago, I think 1998 was when it when it opened, and I think the biggest complaint that I would have about the Schottenstein Center is it's it's kind of like the the basketball and hockey version of like Riverfront Stadium or Three Rivers Stadium, where it was like, well, we built it so you can do all of these different things, and that means that it doesn't do any of them very well. It just kind of it does everything at like a it is like a solid C in just about everything. And the best thing they could do, and I, you know, I don't know where they're going to, where they would do this, but man, do they need a 6,000 seat hockey arena? Like put in, build a new hockey arena somewhere. The women's hockey team currently plays in the old OSU ice rink. Like if you played OSU intramurals or just went like free skating on a Saturday, that's, that's that rink. That's the rink where they, and they've, they've upgraded it a little bit. They've dressed it up a little bit. I was just in there last weekend for something. And you know, it's, it's nicer than it was. But this is a national championship team. That is a team that should have its own 6,000-seat rink. You go down to, like, Miami University, Gaga Nice Arena down at Miami is just incredible. Top of the top of the line, you know, and that was an arena that was built, I think that opened in 2006, maybe, 2005, something like that. So only, like, seven, eight years after the shot. It still looks, you know, incredible, pristine, new. The shot is just, like, it just, it looks like an arena that is... Uh, you know, the shot is uh, kind of like uh, Comiskey Park, like the new Comiskey Park, where it was like, well, it was built. It was the last park built right before Camden Yards changed everything. Like, well, now you've learned some new lessons since then. You definitely you want a new hockey arena for sure. And just, you know, it doesn't have to be an 18,000 seat hockey arena. You, you put a 6,000 seat arena in there and you're going to have a much better atmosphere. You've seen that kind of in a bunch of like Penn State has a great hockey arena. Like you need to you need to build a place like that. That that would be kind of at the top of my list in terms of facility stuff for Ohio State. And then if you do that, I don't know what you do with the shot. I mean, you maybe you can do more with it if if it's a uh, basketball only kind of thing. Um, but it, it just it feels like it doesn't it kind of does a bunch of stuff and it doesn't do anything particularly well. I like what you said about the Camden Yard. It's like people realized or re- re- remembered at that point, you can build places with personality. Mm hmm. And it's like, well, if you look back through the history of uh, time, like all of the great stadiums had personality, like go to the, the Roman Coliseum, but like Wrigley and Fenway and, you know, Tiger Stadium, Detroit, uh, like these all these places all had like personality. And then, like you said, Riverfront, Three Rivers, like all of these just circular footprint stadiums. And it's like well, they last 30 or 40 years and they're terrible. And yeah, it's... Uh, uh, part of the problem, like I don't think they can get rid of it because it's you just built a new practice gym as well. So you got both basketball teams practice there. I do think you could build a separate hockey place and it could be the same kind of footprint as the Cavelli Center, which is mm-hmm. it, it's it's a really nice little arena that can be loud as heck. Now, the shot can be 
as loud as any stadium, any arena in the nation, but you need everybody there and you need uh, an important game to watch. I thought it was interesting. I saw this last week or so. The average attendance at the shot last year for men's basketball was 13,276, which is the exact number of a sellout at St. John. But uh, I wish we got to cover more games at St. John. I wish they would play there a couple times a year. Like, you know, they, they used to have like one game a year there because that place, it's it's awesome, but it's it's very um, dated. It, it's dated and cozy, uh, uh, hot. Like, it's not for recruiting. It's like mm-hmm. if you want to recruit old timers to come talk about the 19 Dickety 2 or whatever, yes, take them to the shot. But it's where like, you came out my belt, as was the fashion yeah. of the time. You, you bring in a 15 or 16 year old basketball phenom and they're going to look at this place and it's like, you know. It, I mean, Bronny's not going to be about it. John has a uh, great, great comment in the uh, in the uh, comments. If you uh, build a 6,000 seat arena, it could even host an NHL team in Arizona. If you're not familiar, the uh, Phoenix Coyotes are uh, currently, they had a little arena dispute with their arena out in Glendale and are now going to be just be playing at uh, Arizona State's ice rink for uh, the next couple of years as they build a new arena downtown Phoenix. It is, I forget, I think that arena is like six, 8,000 people or something like that. So uh, Arizona Coyotes tickets are like outrageously expensive this year because there's like half as many as there used to be. So even though they're not going to be very good, there's just so few seats that uh, it's, you know, it's a little like the COVID year where it was super, you know, super hard to get Blue Jackets tickets because they were only seating people in like every other row or whatever it was. So, yeah, that's uh, the uh, hockey arenas. Uh, hockey arenas are, uh, you know, you can you can uh, have a much bigger tenant than you might anticipate with a nice uh, college hockey arena. Let me I'm tweeting. Up. You guys go ahead. <laughs> Yakov, Riverfront, Three Rivers, The Vet, Atlanta, Fulton mm-hmm. County were all nearly the same multi purpose facilities. Yeah, they were. I got to see games at Riverfront and Three Rivers and Fulton County. Um, you know, I, I never really, we never saw many top down shots of Fulton County. I mean, it really was very utilitarian. But now in Atlanta, they just build a new stadium every couple of years. I mean that's just uh, that's just kind of the way there. I I, I don't understand it. It's like yep. the TVs anymore. You, you just you, you buy a cheap one for a couple of years and you get a new another cheap one in a couple of years. That's stadiums now. Bush Stadium in in uh, St. Louis, not the current Bush Stadium, but the old Bush Stadium was on that list as well. I was never at a vet for, at the vet for a baseball game, but I went to an Army Navy game at the vet in 1999. So yes, that. Uh, and and three rivers and riverfront was at all of those and yes they was it was amazing where it was like well uh, unless uh, you know unless you can see the Liberty Bell uh, you're really you know and and you know okay this must be the vet then uh, you could you know if you get dropped in one of those uh, mm-hmm. get handcuffed you know blindfolded and dropped in one of those stadiums and you know took the blindfold off I was like yeah I don't I could be any of like four places right now same artificial turf at every single place too. Mm-hmm. Jay Moore, been here, just had to change from iPad to phone. I'm smoking a pork butt. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, time and temp, you know, uh, that's kind of what we're supposed to ask on there. And how long are you going to rest it? That's Those are my big questions. Silver Bullet, who's been a big supporter for us, Red Premium members all over the board, and people signing up left and right. Your lips to God's ears. I mean, once again, everybody, be sure to sign up for uh, Buckeye Huddle. Uh, you know, we got yearly and monthly. If you're, you haven't done a premium site before, give us give us a look. Do the monthly. Just check it out. You know, we got a lot of great content. I mean, obviously, the three of us are there. Uh, those of you who've been with us for a while, had a chance to talk to Alex Lightman, who handles recruiting. We got Mark Gibbler as well, Ross Fulton, Justin Whitlatch, Devin Ratcliffe. Uh, you know, we got you know we've got just a great ro- roster of of talent here, and it's going to be a fantastic ride. So. Absolutely, give us give us a shot. I you won't be disappointed. Fort Wayne Buckeye just gave us a shout out on the insider board. Uh, if you haven't tuned in yet or perhaps had to leave, Kevin, Tom, and Tony are still going strong. Coming up on five hours, great work, gentlemen. Yes, it is. Uh, it is. Uh, we've had several people pop in the comments. Wait, you guys are still going? What? <laughs> is this a we've repeat? No. So my Nest thermostat turned off, and I'm sweating because like it's like 78 in the house right now. I'm that's what I was doing on my phone was turning the air conditioner back on. Uh, Let's see. Hmm. Just 
kind of. I've not. I've yet. I've, I've yet to hear back from uh, Ross on. Uh, I'm on not the, surprised. Uh, on the that, game. that has been my experience with that guy. That that, that jerk with his day <laughs> job, being responsible. <laughs> Troy, <laughs> I've been to Riverfront Three Rivers, but never to Philly. I have a white beard and I'm fat, and they would and they booed Santa. Yes, the. the I don't. Did they have a jail in the? I know at 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 uh, what at the link or whatever it's called. They have a jail in the bowels of that stadium. But I, I wonder if they had a jail in the bowels of the vet because Philly fans are uh, intense. They're intense. It's one word for it. Well, I just don't want to. I don't want to steer anybody away from Philadelphia that might want to sign up. Um. Here we go, um, Ahmad Taylor. Love the reporting, guys. God bless you. God bless you, Ahmad. You know, this is we're really enjoying this as we are now at yeah. about almost five hours and ten minutes. Well, I think we're going for some sort of record, even though. And I'm not going to scroll up to the comment. Sue wants us to go for 24 hours before the Notre Dame game, and then just in a purely punitive measure said, "How about 48?" And then somebody else said it could just be like the Truman Show. Uh, yeah, Ross has been very active on the board. Uh, Huddle up, S actually knows of any. So yes, Ross is so that's what Ross is. Ross is working on the board, like a jerk for our members. The worst, the worst that guy. Uh, so a question about what they're going to do with St. John Arena, and uh, you know it feels like the answer is they don't. They're not doing anything with St. John Arena because it's still there. They're still doing what, what all they do when they do volleyball and uh, gymnastics in there, and obviously sh uh, skull sessions. I'm trying to think of him forgetting anything, anything else. else but... They don't do it like at Cavelli or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So right now they're not doing anything with St. John. They still have some administration offices and stuff in there. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it feels like if they were, is that a historical building? Is that like a you know, national historic site? That's what I was just site? looking to see. Yeah. It feels, it feels like it might be, which would prevent, you know, prevent you from knocking it down and doing something else with it. Cause you know, women's volleyball has turned into a pretty significant sport in the big 10. Like they just had a volleyball media day. The big 10 did. So, you know, if that can turn, there are places, Nebraska and Wisconsin, where the, uh, the women's volleyball team is, you know, like almost a revenue sport. It, it's, it, you know, they'll sell the games out and that kind of stuff. You know, if you could turn the Ohio state women's volleyball program into that, then that you know does then you then you do still want to be playing in a thirteen thousand seat arena and not in the you know how big is the Cavalli Center a couple thousand I mean it's not it's not particularly big, um, but they um, you know it, it I, I I don't know I mean he, his question is could you refurbish it and make it a college hoops mecca I just I think that in the past they, they that was sort of talked about and I think the the point that they made at the time was it would take so much rehab and so much retrofitting to get it up to the standard of a modern arena that you're it's like easier and cheaper to build a new one rather than do it with an old one and you know there, there are no suites in st john arena there's no anything so that's uh you know i, I think i think they that was something that they considered and, and decided against yeah 3700 is what the cavelli center holds mm -hmm. and uh, they have played basketball there um they, that was during the COVID year, and I think attendance was limited. But um, it's it's a neat little place. They play TBT there. I got to see a couple yeah. games of the TBT there. Yeah. A Florida Buckeye. Any word on Parker Lewis and the USC transfer gauntlet? Still not showing on the official roster. I mean, last time we talked to Ryan Day, I mean, they, he made it sound like they were hoping to hear something soon. But, you know, we also, you know, Ohio State kind of had to wait forever on Palaie na ote ote. But, we, you know, we don't know, you know, we don't know if this, it's this similar situation, nearly similar, completely different. But, you know, we've all kind of joked that, you know, these Etsy transfers are just haven't haven't been smooth so far in terms of the of the process. Yeah, and we don't talk to Ryan Day again until next week. And I'm sure he will be asked about it. And if he's still not on the roster, he'll say hoping it's soon. But But the good thing with kickers is, like, the bulk of their work is done away from the team essentially anyway. Like they're, they're doing their practice away from the team. So there's nothing that keeps Parker Lewis from kicking and practicing. And he was, you know, one of the reasons he left USC was because 
Like they didn't really have a dedicated special teams coach and they were just overworking the kickers. So he does not have that fear at Ohio State right now because you know what? You're not on the team. So don't worry about being overworked. If anybody's going to overwork you, it's going to be you doing it yourself by going to the local park or I'm sure he's allowed inside the whack, I, I guess. I mean, but like he can keep up with his work. It's not like he has to learn a defense or an offense. So I think th- he, he could be able to step in and be the kickoff guy essentially, you know, with with about what, three days notice maybe? Like, is, is that enough? Like, he is your last line of defense on kickoffs. So, you know, but uh, as long as you're kicking touchbacks all the time, I don't think it's a concern. Yeah, I mean, if the if the goal for the kicker is kick the ball through the uprights, then it's probably not a big concern. If they're trying to do the, in, you know, inside the five-yard line, outside the numbers thing again, that's going to require a lot more practice. But, yeah, I mean, if, it, if it's just be the big leg guy who kicks it through the end zone, which, you know, given the risk-reward on kickoffs right now, it seems like you would be wise to just kick it through the back of the end zone. You know, you're you're risking giving up a big play. They gave up a kick return for a touchdown in the Rose Bowl. You're risking that for the potential gain of eight yards of field position. Like, that just doesn't seem like that great a trade-off. When, you know, doing that, you're also running the risk of kicking it out of bounds. And then, you know, it's just as easy for the person to fair catch it. And so you they get the ball in the 25 anyway. So just kick it through the back of the end zone. It seems like that. It has seemed to me for several years like that is the very obvious answer to this, and they have not done that for whatever reason. Let me ask you guys a question. Nebraska is favored by 12.5 points over Northwestern. Doesn't doesn't it feel like a lot? It shouldn't be. But doesn't it feel like a lot? I don't know what would make you have so much confidence in like, you know what, you know what? I, I have tremendous faith in the Nebraska football program, getting on an airplane, flying across the ocean and then playing game um, against the team. They should be like, absolutely. Nebraska should beat Northwestern by a couple touchdowns. Northwestern is probably going to be pretty bad this year. And I think Nebraska should be good to pretty good but man i i would like to have a higher level of confidence before i put some uh, hard-earned money on a team uh, than i do with nebraska getting on an airplane and flying from the middle of america over to ireland like it just seems like there's a lot of different spots where you could hit of a have a failure point there you don't need to put hard-earned money just put some ill-gotten money on it <laughs> Kevin, what about you and your ill-gotten money? Oh, it's all ill-gotten. Um, you know, yeah, you look at the programs and, you know, Nebraska should just handle that one easily, you know, regardless of playing at a different time and, you know, certainly, you know, having to drive on the wrong side of the street and you know, Tony wanting to go and hit all of the pubs and everything else. But with that being said, and I think, we still got you, Tom. All right, we do. I just saw him blank because it, 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 it was getting a little soft right there uh, in terms of the web. Um, I, I sat there, and as I'm working on a series of pieces called Best of the Big Ten that I just started dropping today on uh, Buckeye Huddle, this brand new website, um, you know, I went through, and there were not a lot of Northwestern players that made the list. Their running back, Evan Hall, did. Their tackle, Peter Skorowski, um, something along those lines. Uh, he did maybe one other. I mean, this is just not going to be a very good Northwestern team. So Nebraska should win it by two scores, I would think. But I'm not going to put any of Tom's ill-begotten money on that line. I'm just not going to do what, it. I have too much if, respect for him and his family. What if those two scores are a pair of field goals? Illinois, two, 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 two seven point touchdown and point afters. So, but I won't call that four scores. And seven years ago, <laughs> Illinois. As we continue to just to look at a couple of these week zero games, Illinois minus ten over Wyoming. I feel pretty good about Illinois, which concerns me, and I wonder. I might need to check urgent care or something about that because that does not feel right. Like. um 
But Illinois minus 10, I can see that, uh, especially, you know, Illinois, we know, season opener, you never know what you're going to get, especially if they get to play like Nebraska. Uh, Illinois can, can be pretty good. I, I, I think, uh, you know, minus 10, is that is that too much to um, already have that much faith in in Brett Bielema when Wyoming is, is no pushover and, and they're pretty, like, even keeled? Yeah, I think this sh- this is not supposed to be a particularly good Wyoming team, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and I mean, Wyoming, a lot of Wyoming's uh, Wyoming can be a pain in the butt to play because uh, here's a fun trivia fact. Uh, Wyoming's War Memorial Stadium is actually the highest altitude of any uh, FBS stadium. They are, it, their stadium is at like 7,000 feet of altitude. So, you know, you hear about people going to Colorado or Colorado State or Utah and having trouble with the altitude. It's like, that's great. Wyoming's like 2,000 feet higher than that. And uh, also, Laramie, Wyoming is whatever you think of as remote. White Laramie, where Wyoming is way more remote than just about anything outside of like Washington State in the, uh, you know, in the FBS. So, yeah, it is. It's kind of a pain in the butt to get to, and you know they have sort of a home field advantage from that, and from you know weather stuff that will. It, it starts snowing in Wyoming a lot earlier than it is does in a lot of places. Getting Wyoming at home, yeah, I don't. I don't think Wyoming's going to be particularly great, and you know, I, I, there are people who are are really pushing the idea that this is you know this Illinois team is going to be better. It's going to be better, and I think Illinois exceeded my expectations last year enough that. That would be that would be pretty surprising if Illinois dumped that one, but again, like I mean, Illinois, like you want you want to put money on Illinois not only winning but also, like this this Illinois team is going to perform very consistently in a very predictable and well you know good salt like mm, there are just there are teams that I just don't really buy into as uh, you know team, teams that are worth supporting with my wallet and that's Illinois falls into that bucket as well. I just want to stop so, things down for a second and say that Brett Baloney is my all-time now favorite nickname for Brett Bielema, and I probably will never be able to unsee that again, and I will probably call him Brett Baloney, maybe even to his face. So thank you for planting that seed in my mind. Um, I will send my unemployment paperwork to you when I call him Brett Baloney to his face. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm uh, picturing Jim Everett and Jim Rome now, and that I would I'm, I'm gonna have to I, guys. I got to go work out some Photoshop stuff. I'll be right back. <laughs> um, but uh, Adam Vandahar, what is Kate Stover looking to yield on average for corn this year? A farm question, Tom. You live out in the country. The rest of us live in cities. Um, what is what is corn, Tom? What is yield? <laughs> this is when we need to have Marcus Hartman on the show from the Dayton Daily News. He would really, really be able to uh, handle this stuff a lot better than I do. But yes, he's, I, I, he's, I he's got a beef farm. Cade Stover does. Cade Stover yes. grows. Uh, That's yes, what I'm saying. Cal- like... Yes, beef and beef and alfalfa. I think he said is what they're doing this year. Yes, uh, I, I live in a corn adjacent place in that I can walk my dog past a cornfield. Um, but yes, I am not up to speed on the current price per bushel. Um, but, uh, yes, it is, uh, corn, corn, Tony is a vegetable. It comes in a husk. You, you want to peel the green part off, cook it. You can actually cook it on the grill, uh, in the husk. That's a, the uh, green that's part, a, the green, but you can keep the whole thing. The way you get it from the, uh, the way you get it from the farmer's market or grocery store, throw that whole bad boy on the grill and, uh, it will kind of seal in the moisture, steam it up real nice for you. And then when the outside, when you get a char on the outside and you kind of turn it a couple times, you get, get a nice even char on the outside uh, then uh, the corn is probably done on the inside. That is a great way to do corn that involves, uh, and you know, once it steams, it gets easier to remove the silk. There's a little pro tip for you. And they see, Kevin, Kevin, you're not the only one to tell people how to grill stuff. Yeah. So you just yeah. you just put the can right on the grill, and then the, <laughs> what, until the label blackens. <laughs> yes, yes. You want to put the uh, yes, put the beans, put the put the uh, can of beans right on the grill, cut up your hot dogs right in there. Yes, that is uh, that is those are some tasty vittles. But where do I put my tamale? If I, I mean, if there's actual <laughs> corn in the corn husk, I, I mean, where where do I keep my tamale? Here's one from Yakov twenty two regarding fan noise and atmosphere. Where do you think Michigan ranks in the Big Ten? 
it should rank in the top three, mm-hmm. and it doesn't. Um, the the stadium, the way it is built, does not necessarily allow mm-hmm. for the sound to stay there. A lot of stadiums are built up, and the sound goes up, and it just basically falls back down. This stadium, it, it just spreads out so far that the sound can just go wherever. Um, it, it can be loud, but it, it's it's definitely not an intimidating place to play. Um, like Iowa was crazy that game, and even Purdue got loud, but it depends on the opponent. It depends on the situation. And, you know, we only go – mainly only go to Ohio State road games, so a lot of those games don't turn out to the point where – crowds can be loud you know other than the ohio state fans that are there but i, I don't think anything nothing tops a wide out in my experience and i you know michigan michigan stadium it's it, go there go to a game there and experience it but like don't expect to be blown away just just go there so you can you know take it off the bucket list or whatever yeah and i feel like we're not probably um, it, it would be probably more instructive had we been at the game last year to be able to answer that because, you know, the last couple times Tony and I have been in in Ann Arbor watching a game, uh, it hasn't gone great for the home team. So uh, that, you know, probably impacts, you know, the atmosphere. But even even pregame, it's just it's not that crazy there. I would put, yeah, Penn State ahead of that, of uh, Michigan. I would put... Uh, Wisconsin ahead of Michigan for, you know, for a big game. And this is, this is just kind of when Ohio state's in town, I, you know, when Wisconsin's playing UNLV or what, you know, Penn state's playing Eastern Michigan, like whatever the atmosphere stinks everywhere when you're playing a bad game. But when you're playing, you know, when there's a big game, primetime game, Ohio state's in town, probably Penn state, Wisconsin, I'd probably put Iowa third and maybe Michigan fourth, something like that. Is that, I mean, Am I missing anyone? Like we were at Minnesota last year and it was fine. It was a good, you know, it's a nice, it's a really nice stadium. It just isn't, you know, a huge stadium or a crazy stadium. Ne- oh, Nebraska, Nebraska, I have to put up there somewhere too. Nebraska is not an intimidating yeah. atmosphere, but it's just, it's awesome. And we've said a million times that is my favorite road trip. I think that's Tony's favorite road trip. That might be Kevin's favorite road trip. Ne- Nebraska is just an awesome, awesome place to see a game. You should go see a game in Nebraska at some point. I'm just kind of thinking through the rest of them, like Indiana, meh. Purdue's whatever, um, Illinois. I have not seen a game there, but I have been led to believe I'm not missing anything. Uh, Rutgers, Maryland. I mean, it just it, it feels like Michigan's probably fifth, sixth, something like that in the Big Ten. And I'm I'm kind of removing Ohio State from these uh, from this calculation because we have been at Ohio State when Ohio Ohio Stadium went so many times that you know you you could have games at Ohio Stadium that were like number one on the list. You could have games at Ohio Stadium that were like, yeah, they could be number 10. It just kind of depends on the on the week. So uh, a little bit of breaking news. Ohio State freshman wide receiver Caleb Brown was uh, had his black stripe removed. You guys already talked about Zach Herbstreit, who I saw have a fantastic catch uh, in, in practice last week. Caleb Brown, who also had some big plays in the practice that we saw. Freshman receiver out of Chicago. A guy that I have been trying to hype up. Mm-hmm. Kevin and Tom, when I do this, or they they cannot stand to hear about it. They have no time for it. Here I am, have been vindicated and proven correct and justified in my actions in speaking of a true freshman receiver at Ohio State at a position that rarely does anything at Ohio State. And here I am touting this receiver that he could be something good eventually down the line and you guys try to say no no he can't but here he is losing his black stripe a versatile receiver in the mold of some something that ohio state has tried to have but has never worked has has not necessarily ever worked out a guy that can you know can do some of that running now i don't think they're going to be running him into between the tackles unless he ends up being that fourth back but a smaller slot guy that they've tried with you know Tyjon Lindsay with uh, Mookie Cooper, you know, not being able to get Rondale Moore, Wandale Robinson, these guys that now Caleb Brown may be in that mold. But uh, anybody want to uh, congratulate me or him? Uh, do you have a full list of people who have lost their black stripes this year? Because I just saw CJ Hicks lost one a couple days ago. Mm-hmm. 
Do you have Do you have a full list? Because I I wanted to. I will get it for you. Okay. Well, I just I pulled up our list from our black stripe draft that we did earlier mm-hmm. in the year, and um, Kayla Brown, who I have just been poor mouthing constantly all year, saying never, you know, never even right. heard of the guy. You'll never believe who picked him in the black stripe draft. Tony, it was me. It was in fact me. Um, which pick? Uh, pick number fifteen, which means you passed over him seven times. So. Uh, it's yeah, called I mean, motivation time. Mm-hmm. That's and and frankly, I don't want to say that's the only reason why he lost his black stripe, but I a large part of the reason. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Certainly, uh, I know C.J. Hicks lost his black stripe. Mm-hmm. Caden Curry lost his. Kai Stokes, Jair Brown. Is there anyone else among the true freshmen? Because nope. okay, you got so all. so the, the well, five and, of and, them. and that's not true, Tony, because there are five of them. But I don't have them all. I only have four of the first five guys to have lost their black stripes in this black stripe draft. I mean, is that is that good? It seems. I mean, it seems like a lot. Uh, who lost theirs first? Was it was it Caden Curry or, or uh, Kai, Kai Stokes. Stokes? Kai Stokes did. So let's see. So I have fifty uh, plus uh, nineteen, so sixty nine plus eighteen uh, is uh, seventy seven plus seventeen is one. Uh, no, sorry, 87. I'm going to uh, hurt himself, patting himself on the back here. Anyway, I've got more than 100 points. You've got 25. It's fine. It doesn't matter. We're not, I mean, yes, we're technically keeping score here. And yes, I'm technically completely annihilating you in the Black Stripe draft. But that's okay. That's not what we're here to talk about. Sorry, go on. T- tell us more about how much you love Caleb Brown. It's good. Go ahead. Tony, you'll sleep on a cot tonight. Sleep on a cot. I still, I still don't, I don't remember setting up a scoring system. Yes, the first person got 30, the second person got 25, and then 20, 19, 18, 17 after that. I, I have been doing this show for five and a half hours, so now my brain has stopped working, so I'm going to use my calculator to actually do the math here. But uh, 19 plus 18 plus, no, that's not right. You can't, you can't even work a calculator. While he's doing the math, Florida Buckeye, any chance we see the huddle training table at Schmitz and Thurman's living in Florida, I would really like to see those places again. 104 to 25. That's the score right now, just in case. We've moved on. I, I'm, I'm winning. Just to, you're, Tony's losing. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a really good one because there's not a, there's not a road game until October 8th, right? So, so maybe we need to do a, uh, you know, home. Uh, we don't have a. I'm, don't I'm, have all, a... I'm all for Thurman because I think that, I think that's better quote unquote television there trying to tackle those burgers. I don't think anybody needs to try and expense a Terminator. I think that the regular burgers on their own are are solid. I I don't think we will ever have a take like one Tom Orr eating a juicy Lucy in Minneapolis where it all spilled out and I just happened to catch it on on the camera or whatever. And uh, Mark Gibbler still loves that uh that image there of that one. But uh I think Thurman might be a, a good call here for, you know, at some point, you know, we could figure that one out, uh, get the company credit card, go out, have a couple burgers, a couple laughs, and kind of go from there. I've never been. Really? All in right. fact, I've only been to Schmitz once, and that's just to walk in and then walk out. See, I think the, the thing to do is we all go to Schmitz, hit the buffet at Schmitz, load up on the sauerkraut, and then we sit down and try and do a five and a half hour live stream. Who says no? No, I say I say no. <laughs> so no for me, dog. I, the thing is, is that you know, not to take this back to food, but since you guys started it, uh, there's so much better German food than Schmitz in town. I mean, Schmitz is kind of a, you know, it's it, it's it's a little touristy. I mean, the cream puffs are fantastic. I mean, I, there's nothing like a like a grilled Bahama Mama outside of the stadium and one of the one of the street meat carts or whatever, but uh, Schmitz on the whole is not generally somewhere that I take out of towners or whatnot, but Thurman, Thurman, if if people ask, I'll go. It's probably been three or four years since I've been to Thurman. Thank you for ruining uh, our chances at a sponsorship from Schmitz. That's a great job uh, on your part there, Kevin. Appreciate that. Um, Now I'm going to make new plans on a German place to sponsor our shows. Opera House. Mm. Okay, settled, done. 
Uh, my daughter has suggested a couple names for the uh, the dining oh. segment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hun hungry with the huddle. Okay. Okay. Buckeye huddle halftime hunger. So, hmm, that's not bad. She's in alliteration. It. I don't hate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like so the if first we want either of those, we. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna have so to? Are we, we gonna have a license it from your daughter? You, yeah, I mean, we'll have to work out some kind of a deal, but uh, I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can. She's I, I, well. I was gonna say she. You know, if her mother's representing her, it will be a difficult negotiation, but I think we can make it happen. So yes, we'll, we'll figure it out. Difficult, huh? <laughs> hmm. Challenging. That's all. <laughs> I think people are starting to get a little flop happy around here. Well, I mean, it is five and a half hours. It is. Um, Yak off of Amazon starts streaming the Big Ten Friday night Big Ten games. Perhaps they perhaps they can get Kirk Herb Street. He's already calling Thursday night games for twelve mil a season. Hey, just while he's there at, at Amazon Studios, just have him stay overnight and do the Friday night games. That dude's schedule is is ridiculous. Doing the Thursday. And then going to game day and then going to whatever game he's doing. There will probably be weeks where he's going from the West Coast or com coming from, I think they're living in Cincinnati now. So say he leaves Cincinnati on a Wednesday to go out to California for a Thursday night game, then goes back to somewhere in the SEC for Saturday morning game day and then has to go out West for whatever game he's calling Saturday night. Is there a level above Marriott Titanium? Is there like unobtainium? Yes. It's um, there's Cobalt, and then there's one more that, like, well, there's there's a couple. I think Cobalt's the top one, and there's another one where you have to hit a spending threshold to get to it. And then Cobalt, you only get basically if you're invited by like the CEO of Marriott or something like that. I mean, but it's so it's a popularity yeah. contest. It, it kind of is. I mean, you have to you have to sit there and like save his life or something like that. See, we have Tony and I have been at a uh, Marriott with a Titanium member and have seen yeah. the uh, the front desk folks jump to, uh, you know, we, we think we were being told that our they they did not have a room for us, and then he very very nicely, very politely said, "Would it help if I told you I was a Titanium member?" And it was just like here take my house it's fine you can it's cool like so that the fact that there's a level above that i'm a little concerned about what what level of service is being provided if you are higher than titanium it's like if if you go and you walk up to some like secret service people and say i am the president they're like oh geez you know like <laughs> we better protect you better keep you safe uh so it, it was impressive i it was that day where i learned that i enjoyed seeing people in fear and really terrified for their job and now i like live every day to try to relive that and to capture that feeling again unsuccessfully stephen hensler says i'd love to see you guys sit under the red lights for a local eat show at hound dogs pizza on north high street one of those one of these days it's my favorite c bus pizza since undergrad yes we had a uh had a conversation about hound dogs pizza i don't know probably three hours ago at this point i'm shocked you don't remember I haven't been haven't been watching the whole five and a half hours. Mm. Not sure what's wrong I don't, with you. I don't remember. <laughs> yes, Hound Dog Hound Dog's Pizza is uh, was my one of my favorites in undergrad, and uh, haven't been there in several years. But uh, yes, yeah, still a uh, um, it, it is a delicious and memorable pizza. I'm okay doing like one Columbus thing, one campus thing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, or you know what? four four Columbus things, six campus things. I'm okay with like. I think we well, do need to do that, though, with no road games until winter. Well, NCC1411 says it's Huddle Premium where we finally see Tony in a nice steak shot. Now, Well, and that's the other thing. There and here, here's, here's the thing. I kind of have my thoughts on this. I would really like to involve Mark Gibbler in terms of the steak, the steak dinner situation. Let's, let's bring the boss man with us or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm all, I'm all for that. And again, we don't need to go to, I mean, I'd love to go to Jeff Ruby, but I don't, I, I would be, I would be embarrassed when Tony orders at medium or, or full well and gets ketchup, even if it's that fancy 
housemaid ketchup. I just I just don't know. So we we might have, but I don't want to go to something that's like on the bottom of the chain either. And since I've already been told that I've ruined one potential sponsorship, I won't I won't call out other places. But you know, we have to find something kind of middle of the road. I mean, Tom, Tony, and myself, we just didn't have the camera with us. Did go to the world's most popular? What was it? A, was it a Longhorn or whatever in Bloomington? No, we didn't go to a steak place there. We went to a. Uh, we went when to we a. Sat, no, when we sat at the bar. Uh, in oh, Texas yes. Roadhouse. Yes, yes. Yeah, it was a Texas yeah, Roadhouse was, or what? Yeah, that's where we watched the uh, watched Kansas almost beat Oklahoma last year before the uh, Indiana game. I thought I thought you meant the place where we actually did do the scoop eats there. Yes, that was. Uh, I, I do like that you're in wait, wait, fear of the order like a burger. Yeah, get a burger at a. At a Texas Roadhouse. That's what you do. I, I like that you you are you guys are fear me, fear what I will do, not fear me, fear my actions at a steak place. Like I'm just gonna be there, like you know, like banging my fork and knife, saying like Tony want catchy, Tony want catchy. Like I'm not, like county. <laughs> so I'm not gonna do that. I don't have to ask for ketchup. Okay, I, I bring my own. I've never seen I'm classy. With, I've never seen anyone with a ketchup holster on their hip before. It's that's new. <laughs> Yes. Um, Pull it out, spin it around on your finger. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's uh, do a little whistle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we have to. Yeah, we'll have to find a good a, a good dining spot soon because we should we should get started on that. Um, Especially since we keep talking about it now, I'm hungry, and it is getting to be dinner time. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah. What is what is everybody have, having for dinner? There's there, there's a question. I'm thawing out some leftover chili, and we will be having chili here in this household. Yeah. yeah, Yakov wants to know if some Central Ohio or even other parts of Ohio breweries would sponsor your podcast. Have you drank their beer during the show? That's that's for years. I've said with these shows constantly threatening to careen off the rails. That's what these shows need. Absolutely, it seems like a great way for them to advertise. Like, mm, are, you guys think, it... are we the, are we the spokespeople that you think they want representing their product? Eh. Hardy Gins uh, brings up Philippe's, think... which is Kevin's choice, and in, in, uh, that was a good that was a good dining one. In, uh, that was Atlanta. good. Mm-hmm. But to get where was to, that? Uh, was that Philippe's? Was that where LA? was that? Rose... LA, okay, Rose yeah, that was good. They had the best potato salad because again, it was like it was like hash browned potatoes. That's how they they cut it, and then they, they instead of uh, then they just made it potato salad instead, and it was it was really good, good sandwiches there. Any football talk? <laughs> I'm just I'm scrolling, and it's just all food. Well, it's almost. I mean, we're getting close to dinner time now at this point. So, uh, what did you guys have for lunch today? I had a, um, a quick uh, breakfast burrito that I nuked in between shows. I had a glass had of it. water. Mm. Sounds delicious. Well, I that's a, what I had. I mean, it's, yeah. Ran, ran upstairs, made a quick sandwich. Yeah, I didn't have yeah. time. I yeah. had eighty-six seconds mm-hmm. exactly, and then I had to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hardy Jens wants us a fixed game day. I think we're probably going to be here until uh, maybe, maybe we'll aim for the six, six hour mark, something like that, uh, in terms of when we're going to wrap this up, which would be another 20 minutes or so. I don't think we can fix game day in 20 minutes. What would you do to fix game day? Kevin, you are a TV producer. What would you do to fix game day? Half as many people, uh, not as much laughing and, and carrying on, and maybe a little bit more football. I understand that you're trying to make this show for everybody and you're not going to make it really not going to make anybody happy with it, but it has gotten so far off the rails with just inside jokes and tomfoolery that, uh, you know, I don't know how anybody that is not a football fan is going to be like, that's, that's the football I like. And anybody who is a football is going to be like, that's the football I like. So that, and probably, you know, again, about half the people on the stage, I'm not saying that you have to get rid of anybody, but there's just way too much crosstalk with there's just too much going on. Do you need to shorten the show? Cause I think the, the Fox noon, the, the big, the, the kickoff show that they had with urban, we've talked about this before. That was, it's a two hour show. There's more football talk. There's more analysis and, and teaching, I guess is one way to put it. I think you can do three hours of it, but ESPN it's, it's just too much Desmond. It's too much. You're, you're not getting enough out of all of the people you have. You need to get more out of the good people. And I guess first you got to figure out who those good people are. And then what ESPN also does 
really, really well is all of their packages, you know, the stories that, you know, oh, here's Tom Rinaldi again, making everybody cry about this person or that person. You know, that is all good. I just, the their level of analysis is just very poor um, depending on the person. It goes up and down, which gives you an idea that it's it's not all that great because it does fluctuate, I think. But, but now it's like Lee Corso is going to be there until he can't be. I don't know that – I don't not, – and I'm not even talking about him, but what do you have to do to get fired from that show? Whatever Mickey uh, James did. I mean, and he actually – He left. Yeah. Like he went to, to the NFL, and, and, and we know what he did. But, uh, you know, he took the money and went to the CBS um, NFL. But, like – I like w- – Go ahead. I, I was just gonna say I like the fact that your two criticisms have been like it's too it's not focused enough, and uh, it's kind of wandering you know wanders all over the place not enough football talk and Tony's like it's too long it's too it's three hours long it's like mm, we may be projecting a little yeah, bit here no, on both of no. these fronts. <laughs> well, they should talk about food more on game day, and then just ramble and have complete silence for a while. That's what the people want. There They're always go. trying to fill the air with the talking and cackling, and it's just, it's not what people want. I I don't mind David Pollock either. Um, as mentioned there, I think I, I don't know that more of him goes any further. Like, yeah, and you've got enough David Pollock. Um, too much Desmond. Mm. That is correct. You know, I, I have seen a lot of pushback. We we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the uh, Ohio, the change over and ESPN not being a part of the Big Ten TV package moving forward and what that was going to mean in terms of the tone of the coverage of the Big Ten on ESPN and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's sort of an object lesson in what that can mean in terms of what happened to the coverage of hockey on uh, Sports Center after the NHL contract went away from ESPN in the what early to mid two thousands I think, and the amount of hockey coverage on Sports Center went you know dropped some huge number, and I've heard some pushback from you know national college football people about don't be ridiculous it, you know it's it's not like ESPN is going to be com- able to completely ignore Ohio State on game day, you know, and they're, they're never, you know, the, the idea that the ESPN is never going to talk about Ohio State again is ridiculous. It's like, I don't think anyone's actually saying that. Hmm. But go back the last 10 years. How many times has game day been in Columbus or Ann Arbor or State College the last 10 years? Add those all up. Now, the 10 years after, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess the number is probably 18, say, something like that. 18 for, for those... Uh, those schools over a 10-year period, 15 to 18. How many times after the Big Ten contract goes away from ESPN, how many times in the next 10 years do you think College Game Day is going to be in Columbus and State College and Ann Arbor? Because I think the answer is probably about four. So, you know, I, I, think, I think that's high. It, it, it might be high, honestly, because their job is to, yeah, I mean, they want to be at the game of the week, but it's like, yeah, I mean, there's other games going on. There is very rarely only one interesting game going on in a week. And, you know, if it is number one Ohio State versus number two Michigan, like, okay, yeah, sure, they will they'll they will be there for the 2016, or 2006 Ohio State-Michigan game, whatever the future equivalent of that is. But they're never coming to the Big Ten Championship game again. They're never coming to, uh, you know, they're never coming to, uh, you know, a run-of-the-mill Ohio State, uh, you know, they... You know, the Ohio State-Notre Dame game. I'm sure they're going to be here for the Ohio State-Notre Dame game because that's an ABC game. If if Ohio State-Notre Dame is on NBC next year, you think they're going to note to South Bend for that? No, they're not. No. So it'll be very interesting to me to see how much this does impact their coverage on ESPN. And then how much does that really matter? Because, you know, we talk about ESPN driving the narrative around the sport. Well, if ESPN's just constantly talking up the SEC and not talking about the Big Ten, how much does that impact the conversation around the college football playoff and all of that? Yeah, I'll be interested to see, uh, and maybe like Awful Announcing can track the the number of highlights on like a Sports Center of SEC teams compared to like the top Big Ten teams and maybe all the Big Ten teams because I, I feel like, or even if you're just tracking Ohio, Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State. Like the number of highlights that they show from each of those, where it's like they spend the, the first block talking about Alabama and Georgia, 
and then Ohio State gets a mention while they talk about the rest of the nation or something like that, where it's like, uh, oh, by the way, then this. But I, I think people would be crazy to think that the the amount of focus on the Big Ten will be the same that it was. And it's already been diminished over the years from from where it, it was before things got so um, just polarized. And, and I don't know, Kevin, you're the TV person. You, they, they still have hours to fill. So it's like they've got a they're, they're not going to ignore the Big Ten. But no, like as Tom said, nobody's saying they are. Well, and I think like on college football final, which they're mm, interesting. <laughs> I haven't thought about that. It's like hearing the most boring story from Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Poochie died on his way back to his home planet. R.I.P. Kevin. Mourn you till we join you. And the first, the first day of the new site at Buckeye Huddle, Tony. I mean, the saddest possible time for it to happen. Um, so anyway, R.I.P. Kevin. Uh, but do make sure you join us at BuckeyeHuddle.com. There is, uh, if you're wondering, if you're wondering, why have these idiots been talking for close to six hours on YouTube today? Well, turns out we launched a new website. Uh, it is at BuckeyeHuddle.com. It has a fantastic team of insiders. Tony and Kevin and I, well... Pour, pour one out for Kevin. But uh, Tony and Kevin and I covering the team. We have uh, Mark Givler, Alex Gleitman covering recruiting. We have uh, Ross Fulton. We have Justin Whitlatch. We've got Devin Ratcliffe covering uh, the X's and O's piece of things. Kind of have a very well-rounded staff. Eight members on staff. Lots of uh, lots of coverage. That means pretty much all the time someone's on the board. Guess what? The three of us have been talking. We had Alex on the show earlier. There have also been people on the board talking to members on the board all day long. When, when we're not doing six hours of live video during the course of a day, which is most days, some might say all days up until this exact one, uh, we, uh, you know, we are going to be on the board talking to you, answering your questions. Um, <laughs> that was exciting. We saw Kevin twice, then we saw Kevin once, then we didn't see Kevin well, at I'm, all. I'm, those, apparently but... up here, I'm apparently up here twice, so yeah, okay. yeah, we should probably shoot to end this in 10 minutes before the Yellow Jackets really attack my <laughs> attack my internet. Tom was shooting to end this right now. No, I was, I was, oh, it was rapid. Okay. We, we need to hit, we need to hit six okay. hours. We'll right. get there. Don't worry. But uh, yes, make sure you check out BuckeyeHuddle.com. It is $12.99 a month, $124.99 for the year. If you've not, you know, if you've been a member of an insider site, you know the value that's brought there in terms of just the insight, the analysis. We talked earlier with Alex about what goes into actually building the relationships and recruiting to be able to actually get the inside information that no one else can get. He does all that stuff incredibly well. Mark does all that stuff incredibly well. They've been doing this for a long time. They are among the best in the business at what they do. You can find them at Buckeye Huddle. Tony, Kevin, and I, we have all been covering the team for a long, long time. Uh, I know you guys, Tony goes back to the Trestle era. I covered uh, I covered a John Cooper team, believe it or not. Uh, Kevin, I know, goes back to uh, Cooper era as well. So, yes, we have been around the Ohio State program for a long, long time. We know a thing or two every once in a while uh, and uh, have uh, written coverage and podcasts and videos and photos and all that fun stuff. And, uh, of course, the X's and O's coverage that we talked about earlier, Devin Radcliffe and Justin Whitlatch and Ross Fulton, those three guys are incredible. They're going to be doing some fun stuff as well. I know every time I have Ross on the morning show, people will want to know, why don't you have Ross on the morning show more? It's like, I should, because he's really good and people love hearing from him. And now we got three of those guys. So that should be a lot of fun as well. So check that all out at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Yeah, at the at the message board there, there is a, a thread of just X's and O's, X's and O's talk of people throwing in their questions, people trying to learn more, people who can already talk it, and all three of those guys, Justin, Devin, and Ross, can, can meet you on your level. And so it's really cool to, like, what 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 do you what should you expect from Jim Knowles in this game, and what what has he done in the past? And, what is different about what the defensive line will be doing this year compared to years past where, you know, years past under Larry Johnson, they're just trying to get up field this year. They're going to try to like muddy up the, uh, the line of scrimmage and the offensive line, be more physical with those people so that everybody else can clean up around them. So 
differences like that that they'll get into coverages, all sorts of different things, make you a, a smarter football person. That alone is, is worth the price of admission, in my opinion, uh, especially for like you know. Um, anyway, uh, that's just that's my pitch. Tom, you threw in your pitch. Kevin has thrown in his pitch, and again, we are there all the time talking Buckeyes and, and whatever else. Um, but, uh, yeah, come hang out, come join us. Uh, you know, six hours here, six hours there, 12 hour days. Uh, what more, what more could you possibly want? Um, Tom, go ahead. Well, well, we are, uh, now that we're uh, five hours and 53 minutes and, you know, I think if people have uh, stuck with us this long, they're probably the type of people who are going to be interested in our pre and post game shows as well. We have, uh, we're, well, now that we've got the site launch, we've got to have uh, got to have our staff meeting on exactly how we're going to do those and how we're you know what we're going to do. And Kevin and I sp- have uh, spent a, a good bit of time already talking through some of the technical. How are we going to do this? And how do we want to do this? And who should be running this? And who's going to be where? And all that kind of stuff. But we do have some very exciting stuff planned for you uh, moving forward and doing doing shows like this, but doing stuff. You know, we'll be out at the stadium pre and post game, you know, live streaming interviews, all that kind of stuff. We've been we've been doing that already. Uh, this month, and we're going to be doing a lot more of it. And then, uh, one, you know, boy, got to tell you, looking forward to being back out at uh, football games. That's uh, that is a thing that uh, I do typically enjoy watching football games from time to time, and uh, being out there and covering them, and being uh, being a part of the scene and uh, letting people know. Going to probably do some of those behind the scenes videos. We got a lot. Of, we got really good feedback mm-hmm. on those last year. Just kind of all the all the stuff you don't get to see. Um, I have already have one that I had, you know, sort of started shooting last fall that I'm pretty excited about that will uh, get get put together at some point and uh, some more more behind the scenes stuff. Um, I really really exciting stuff coming and uh, that's all at BuckeyeHuddle.com and uh, obviously if you're watching on YouTube hit the thumbs up, leave us a comment, uh, make sure you're subscribed, hit that bell, subscribe to the channel. That way you get notified when we're doing all these pre and post game shows because. You know, I got to tell you, just the three of us, I don't think we would have made up only carry six hours uh, today together. So, yeah, having having you guys here is what makes this fun. It's why we're doing it. So uh, we appreciate everyone who's been here and, uh, you know, keep keep uh, keep showing up. And that makes it uh, makes it a lot more fun and a lot more feasible for us to do these. Now, I will just, just to let you know, Tom, you, you guys, you said you and Kevin have been having like talking about the tech, technical stuff like I you maybe have forgotten to like CC me on some of that stuff. So I just to let you know, like well, you I, weren't in the car on the way back from big 10 media days. We I, talked about it at length there and, and we stopped at Culver's in Greenfield, Indiana, and I bought billion dollar mega million tickets and hit zero numbers. So that's why I'm still here. You didn't hit a single number. What an no. idiot. I know. Stupid. <laughs> Like you have all of these numbers that you could get right, you didn't get any of them right. I need to start playing Keno and doing the one where you hit no numbers or whatever because I seem to be really good at that one. And then I need to have like a side bet where I play the numbers again that I'm going to hit them and then see kind of what happens. I think you have a yes, problem. We, we just want, we want your money. Give us your money, please. We're being honest. I hope you appreciate it. Just for for the comment right there about. One of us needs to be honest and say it. But no, honestly, we just really are thrilled with this product. You know, a lot of years of experience here in terms of not just the three of us, but everybody involved in the team. You know, we just, we all really like working together. I think that we can put out just a fantastic product. We're only, you know, we need you guys there to be there as as subscribers. That helps everything out. And, you know, because again, if not, we would be talking to each other for six hours and somebody would have already left in tears by now. It's like it's just like driving to Maryland, where it's just the three of us talking for six hours, but eventually the talking stops after about twenty minutes, and everybody just puts their own earbuds in, and it doesn't make for the best podcast. But it, I haven't tried listening to it, you know, personally. Like that's something, Tom, you could listen to on like three x speed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to the drive to Maryland, and then maybe we stop and uh, whatever the architecture equivalent of a uh, scoop or a you know huddle huddle eats is. Except we do the architectural version, and we do it like Falling Water, the Frank Lloyd Wright House in the middle of uh, the middle of nowhere in southern Pennsylvania, very close to the uh, Maryland border. We drive past there every time, and I'm like, oh, we should stop there sometime. Well, 
if we can turn it into content, boom, there you go. Still I was actually architectural huddle. Yes, yeah, still better than Burger King. Mm. Mm. That's that's your opinion. It depends on what you get. I was trying to find falling water, like just like looking over the area, and it's it's all wooded. It's very difficult. It's very difficult on Google Maps. Um, it's better to to have the actual address, in my opinion, for future reference. If you're trying to figure that out, and I am not watching the clock. But we got like two minutes left. I saw a question <laughs> that uh, NCC141. I'm trying to think like the only name that came to mind immediately is like Nick Goings, like not a favorite or anything, but like in terms of uh, Buckeyes who transferred and then had success um, or that, you know, I don't even know that I followed him. But like, you know, it was good to see Sam Aldonado have a little bit of success at Maryland. I don't know, any, any of you guys, uh, any of you guys got any names? When they transfer, they're gone. I mean, generally, I mean, Burrow and, and Jamison were kind of two different situations. I mean, I, Mookie Cooper, I've kind of kept an eye on just because mm -hmm. I covered his recruitment. Jalen Gill. You know, going, J mm -hmm. Yes, Boston I College, would see Jalen Gill. I really, you know, I love his family. I mean, you know, I've, I remember a quick story here is we're getting close to the six-hour mark. Every football dad is so proud of their their kid when you know they're at a camp. I mean, Jalen was just getting ready to go into high school. His dad's name's Rod. Rod Gill didn't know who he was. Came up, he's like, "Oh, so you're 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 with Rivals?" When I was with Rivals, I'm like, yeah. And he's like, "Well, my son Jalen." I was like, "Oh, really? You know, I, I'm not aware of him." He's like, "Oh, he's going into high school." And of course, at that point, I was ready to just check out. He's like, "No, I know what you're thinking, but it this this is real." <laughs> By the end of the camp, I'm like, all right, yeah, this this is real. Unfortunately, it didn't necessarily – Ohio State wasn't able to figure out what to do with him, but, you know, I was happy to see him have some success at BC. Yeah, looking for a good year from him this year. Tom, you got any? I, I think of all the uh, the walk-on quarterbacks and, the you know, some of the walk-ons that have been here over the years who then a lot of times go to a lower-level program mm -hmm. and end up, you know, playing um, – uh, I know uh, J.P. Andrade just went down to Jackson State just last year. He's uh, so he's down there playing for uh, Deion Sanders. I'm not sure how he's how he's doing, but you know Danny Clark, he was a decommit, not a transfer, but uh, you know he he played in a bunch of different places. Um, Corey, Corey Curtis. Curtis, Corey Curtis went to Bryant and then went and now I'm blank and he's somewhere else now. But you know a lot of those guys who you know those are guys who don't necessarily get a lot of attention and a lot of uh, focus on the uh, you know from the general fan base but who are extremely invested, generally very nice, very intelligent kids, super fun to talk to. And, uh, you know, you, you like to see those guys getting a chance to shine as well because, you know, you come to Ohio State and you probably get a Rose Bowl ring or a Big Ten championship ring or a national championship ring if you're, you're there at the right time. And then, uh, you know, getting a chance to then go somewhere else and, you know, show it on the field too, that's, that's pretty cool. Hardy Jens. Didn't Reggie Germany end up at Stanford? Um, that, that's kind of funny. But uh, Reggie Germany now a successful businessman. Uh, one last thing, because it's a good question, and we I don't know if we've talked about this, from Tavian Tyree. What freshman do you see having the biggest impact on defense? We talked about this a little bit on Mark Rogers' show like six hours ago. Uh, I, I, I think right now maybe uh, Jair Brown, with, because of the, the depth chart and the, the injuries mm -hmm. at corner. And he's been playing with the twos and has been playing well. There could be a situation. You know, we, we were there in the WAC yesterday. See what Cameron Brown, Jordan Hancock, and Denzel Burke walking in before everybody else, meaning they're banged up in some sort of way. They're all dressed. They're, you know, nothing long term. But that's that's there's concerns there. So maybe Jair Brown is a guy who steps up early and ends up having the biggest impact on defense. That's who I'm going with. That's that's who I took in the draft uh, just now. First overall, anybody else? Uh, Kevin, I'll let you go, and uh, Tom will get third pick and brag about doing something. Um, yeah, I'm going to take – you know, I, I go to the point of Kai Stokes being the first guy to, like, lose his black stripe, but he's in a crowded room in terms of safety. But if there's – if they have to do some rotation to get, you know, to, to make the corner numbers work, because I can't take uh, because I can't take the guy that Tony took. I'll just take Kai Stokes because I just am a big believer there. You should have taken Sonny Styles. 
Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know they, they like Sunny Styles a lot. I know they like CJ Hicks a lot. I just, I go back to, you know, we, we had a question seven hours ago about, uh, you know, is, is Larry Johnson really going to rotate 10, 12 guys? And the answer is, yeah, maybe, quite possibly. And I feel like one of those guys might be Caden Curry. And I don't, you know, I don't know he's if he's going to be a... You know, I don't expect him to start a game this year, but it, you know, it feels like you, he might be someone who you see partway through the season. It's like, oh, he's getting more snaps than he did at the beginning of the year. He might be, you know, one of those guys who's in that conversation as well. I like as we're trying to end the show, then more questions come in. <laughs> um, I was going to say my internet's only going to last for so long. <laughs> okay, okay, no, no, that, that's the answer. Um, uh, we, let's thank everybody for being here. Like if you were here for 15 minutes or, or seven hours or six hours or four hours or even just one hour, thank you all for stopping by. Thank you for the interaction. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the support. Thank you for checking out BuckeyeHuddle.com for a launch today. Thank you for becoming a member. If you've become a member, if not try it for a month, as Tom says, I really, really appreciate it. Um, this has been the, the fastest six hours of my waking life. Um, and it's, it's been pretty good. I, I assume, I hope it's been, I hope it's not everybody else is like, this has been the longest six hours, you know, <laughs> like, and it's like, these are people who've only been watching for an hour, but uh, I, I will, I will say thanks. Any, anything you guys want to add before we go have at it. I just, it just occurred to me that I need to figure out a morning show for tomorrow. So finally I'll get to do a podcast. That'll be fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm busy. Just take 20 minutes from this show somewhere. 20 good minutes. Five, if you can piece up like six different things of 20 good minutes. There you go. <laughs> Boom. Not the worst idea you've ever had. No, it's not. I've, I've got some ideas. Go through, but we do not have the time. And just find little clips throughout the whole six hours because that, that'll take you no time. Just, oh, I like this little part and this little part. and you know, You've got shows for the rest of the week then, Tom. <laughs> But uh, that will do it, and I'll just say thanks on, on behalf of uh, everybody here. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for joining us. Um, please go uh, go spend time with your families now. <laughs>